Uh, I think we're live. <laughs> well, everyone, welcome to SEO in Mass number 61, and more importantly, the second annual 24 Hours of SEO charity event uh, for St. Jude <laughs> Children's Hospitals. I think might have a little bit of a reverb there. I forgot to mute the uh, video. That was but... me. I, I, I oh. just fixed it. Okay. Um, anyways, uh, yeah. Second annual 24 Hours of SEO uh, charity event for St. Jude's Children's Hospitals. Um, it's February 28th today. Extremely happy to have you guys all with us. I'm Garrett Groff. I'm Vin Deletta. Steve Brownlee. And a uh, special thanks to Vin this time. Um, Word Agents are actually the event's platinum sponsor. Um, <laughs> Blew away all of the other uh, extremely generous, I must say, sponsors, though. But uh, Word Agents uh, ponied up a substantial chunk. Um, well, let's be honest about why, though. <laughs> well, no, I thought we'd explain that later once we'd said some <laughs> nice things about Word Agents. So if you need some great copy for your, um, your SEO clients or just for your own sites, um, check out wordagents.com. Um, and if enough of you buy content, he'll donate even more next year. So, yep, yep. I'm hoping the kids. <laughs> that's the way it goes. All right. So, I'm just going to uh, share our link around some social channels here. And I think uh, what we, we're starting off the day with um, our normal show, right? Yeah, yeah uh, indeed. I put the tentative schedule in the video description. So, um, Granted, we don't have any emergencies or anything. Uh, should follow that pretty closely. I believe every six hours or so, Hangouts will cut us off. So the, sec the, the entire show will probably be broken into four segments while we're streaming live. I'll just have to restart it. And then uh, eventually we'll cut all the presenters into their own videos. So nice. easier to digest in little pieces. Cool. Um, also, if you haven't signed up at the 24hoursofseo.com, 24hoursofseo.com, that will be the way to get emailed the slides and the decks from the presenters. Um, there's a link in there for buying merchandise, like this uh, sweatshirt that I still have from last year, <laughs> um, and all sorts of stuff, coffee mugs, all that kind of stuff. All the money goes straight to St. Jude's, all the... Straight through Teespring, I believe. So Teespring just takes their cut, and the profit goes to the charity. Uh, the link, the donation link, is in the video description as well. Probably paste that every once in a while in the chat. Uh, anything else? Hashtag twenty four SEO. Not sure. If yeah. I, I will be monitoring that on Twitter shortly. Um, I'm just trying to get YouTube to let me actually view the show so that I can look in the chat there. But once that's working, we'll be all good to go. Well, we're good to go anyway. So I'll hand over to someone else while I'm messing around. Cool. So Mr. G, why don't you, uh, you want to take us through some of the news items here while we uh, get going on social media? Yeah, 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 sure. Um, first up on the news today, I'll uh, post it in the chat here. See, so found an article from over at Zero Hedge. Um, the FTC is kind of making plans to maybe breaking up some big tech companies. Um, Trump is saying that uh, you know, behemoths like Amazon, Google, whoever, you know, they're, they're extremely large companies, um, kind of anti-competitive because, yeah, you know, personally, I'm split between. Uh, you know, they, they've grown these companies so big, they, they kind of have the right to do whatever. But at the same time, how do you inspire competition? I mean, where do you even start if you wanted to compete with Amazon? Like, good luck. Yeah, and we spoke about it. We spoke about it before, um, specifically where it pertains to, to Facebook. They can't become the next MySpace because they just by the next Instagram that comes along, the next, you know, anyone that, and then when they couldn't buy someone else, like say Snapchat, Snapchat launched their stories feature. I'm not a heavy Snapchat user, so I can't really say how similar the Instagram one was, but a lot of social media types have said um, publicly that it's very, very similar. So 
they can just create an immediate sort of destruction of the equivalent thing being provided by everyone else. So it's really hard for them to become the next MySpace because they've got so big and they've got such big financial reserves. They can either buy or clone anything similar that comes along. So it, they are they are in a position where it is almost anti-competitive. But you can't blame the founders for taking the billion dollars. Like if you've made Instagram and you get a billion dollars, you know they have to take it. So this you can say right. whatever you like about how the market works. The market doesn't work because the competition's incentivized to shut itself down because that's too much money to ever turn down if you're a founder of a, your first startup. So I think it's kind of interesting. It'd be, it'd be kind of cool to see how that develops. Um, I think probably nothing will happen, but we'll see, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be interesting to follow. I don't know. I mean, if you think back to the 90s where um you know microsoft had the personal computing market tied down and government came in and made them give apple money to make a competitor um what would you know look at the tech market today you know apple and microsoft still compete not as much directly now because you know microsoft's not really making phones per se where i think that's where most apple's money is but imagine a 2019 where Bill Gates never had to give Steve Jobs a bunch of money or whatever and um, how things would be so much different now. So I, I don't know if that makes sense. but uh. Yeah, I mean, it does in the sense that people being afraid of becoming totally dominant, like you say, led to cooperation between players that otherwise would want to stomp each other out like i don't think we're going to see in the current regulatory climate facebook throw snapchat a bone so it's a very different world at the minute in terms of the dominance those people have yeah <clears throat> now what do we got next year um the ftc is making a little case here against fake reviews in the uh fat blocking products space against one person it looks like but um looks like they find him 12.8 million dollars wow uh, but it says that they might suspend it if he makes a payment of 50 grand <laughs> and pays two, two quite grand. two quite different numbers there yeah, so basically, um, FTC is making the case that people, re in quotations, people rely on reviews when they're shopping online. I would say that's pretty accurate. Um, and this guy from Cure Encapsulations Incorporated, um, Naftula Jacobitz, that they said um, they made false accusations and unsubstantiated claims for their Garcinia Cambogia weight loss supplement. And they paid a third-party website to write and post fake reviews on Amazon.com. Uh, the FTC alleges that the defendants paid a website, AmazonVerifiedReviews.com, to create and post Amazon reviews of their product, which I think probably happens quite often. That probably happens. It does happen. Um, and, you know, it... It's tough, you know, sometimes I look on Amazon and I can tell some of these products, like the brands I've never heard of, will have like 10,000 reviews and they're like 4.8 out of 5 stars or something versus like a brand name product that only has a couple thousand and it's been around a lot longer. Makes me skeptical skeptical that any of those reviews are legitimate, but um, I guess it's most interesting to me to see how this is going to move forward. If they continue to target people or or what, but uh, I don't know what you guys think. Well, I, I think Vin said the other uh, the other week about how uh, prevalent um, gaming the Amazon review system particularly has been. So yeah, and <laughs> I I, guess I, that... it, 
it keeps on popping up too. It's like I, you know, I see people, you know, I see like threads about it or tweets about it, and you can see in the comments, it's like more and more people are learning how uh, to game these these review systems. Um, so it's definitely on its way up rather than on its way out. I noticed um, in my Twitter feed this morning there was an article. Should have saved it for the segment, but uh, Jeff Bezos said to combat uh, fake products or ripoff products, they're just going to leave it in the hands of actual manufacturers and actual brands to report it on Amazon versus Amazon taking the hands-on approach to removing these um, counterfeit products. And it makes you wonder if Amazon has any intent to combat these uh, fake reviews at all. Don't really seem like it. I, I guess the more reviews they have, fake or not, the uh, um, a the Amazon uses a third, Amazon uses a uh, third-party company to, to manage that for them. And mm -hmm. uh, from what I understand, they're they're pretty good. But you know, neckbeards in their mom's basement will be better at uh, finding the loopholes uh, and gaming a system <laughs> like that. Yeah. Apologies to any neck neckbeards uh, watching the show right now. I don't think there's many. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Facebook, Twitter. Where, where else did I say? Yeah. Vin oh, will be uh, insulting you throughout the show if you enjoy his insult. Yeah. The link to donate to the charities at the bottom. If you want him to insult you personally, <laughs> just make your donation. Let Vin know. Send him your picture. He will insult you personally <laughs> live on the uh, live on the chat. I'm just gonna put my mic on mute because I'm still uh, getting the word out here. I, I've had a message that someone's keyboard is being super annoying. So yeah, that's mine. So I'll put my, myself on mute here. Okay. <laughs> All right. Next on the list, uh, Cyrus Shepard had a tweet. Uh, I don't know, was it last week or something? Um, yeah, we've seen. Uh, I guess we've been talking to about Google search being able to answer more difficult type, more complex questions, let's say. Um, in this example, if you do a search for seeds with the highest, highest omega-3, it gives you a list of chia seed, pumpkin seed, sesame seed, sunflower seed. And you know, it's actually kind of a complex answer for a search engine to figure out because it'd be one thing to just list seeds that have omega-3 in them, but to be able to, now I'm not sure how accurate this list is actually, so let's assume it's right. Um, it knows chia seeds have, are the highest in omega-3 content, followed by pumpkin seeds and sesame seeds, so interesting. Uh, something else interesting is uh, we're seeing more and more of found on the web, and it gives a citation for Healthline, EcoWatch, and others. So just another way Google is stealing your data and somewhat killing organic search, depending how you look at it. Um, yeah. I guess Steve and Ben are busy. Uh, <clears throat> Sorry, uh, I'm sorry. I, 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 I will be ready any second. I'm just getting the Twitter set up. I finally got the uh, YouTube stream working. Having all kinds of technical problems on my second laptop today. So, yeah, where where are we at there, G? I'll jump in here. Uh, I was just seeing what you guys thought about the uh, Cyrus Shepard tweet about the Omega Three search and Take a look. how uh, this incredibly search result. Yeah, it takes on. Yeah, I was saying, you know, it's actually kind of a complex search to answer. Um, it's not just listed the seeds that might have omega three in them or do have omega three, but supposedly has ranked them in order of which will have the highest content of omega three. So it's analyzing. Yeah. It's, a it's able to analyze a spectrum. Right. Which is pretty cool. <laughs> This goes back. Steve talks about this all the time. He's like, enter a uh, uh, a complex question to Google, and and it, it and it'll fail. Uh, but it looks like they're coming around. 
this is a good example yeah. of that. Well, I did say they can answer some really cool complex questions, um, but obviously this is a this is a pretty specific complex question. I think they've stalled along. When you're struggling yourself to know what the answer you're looking for is, that's where Google is the least useful. And exact word matches on random forums where someone's asked the same question are more useful. Um, so I think it's a bit of both. It's an improvement, but there's still a, a fairer way to go, I think. Now, Cyrus closes the tweet by saying this is the future of, of Google Search. That, that's a pretty strong statement there. Um, how do you see something like this affecting affiliate SEOs or, or agency owners that have lots of clients that they need to worry about? Um, well, I guess if you make a product that has omega three, and you need to make sure you have the maximum. Well, no, I'm talking. Is about the, the is the skyscraper, is the skyscraper <laughs> technique? So Brian <laughs> Dean will uh, recommend that you you look at the top ten products that have omega three in them, and you add four extra omega threes, and then you'll be number one, just like the uh, skyscraper technique. That's how it works, right? Yeah, I, I'm interested in seeing what kind of knowledge uh, graph and featured snippet shit they pull out for. Uh, for informational searches like this in the future, because I can only see, see that expanding. I don't see that uh, going away anytime soon. Can you hear me? Did I just freeze? No, no, I just noticed the uh, on our new on our hashtag a couple of years ago, there was some different stuff on our, on the hashtag 24 <laughs> SEO. Uh-uh, um, <laughs> we should, should probably should have checked that out before uh, throwing that out there, but. That's all right. I don't know what it's about. There's only three tweets on it, and it's in foreign language, and one of them is of a guy eating something. So I don't know. So hashtag 24SEO. I'm finally on and monitoring. Um, obviously, there's the chat. Um, but if you do happen to um, ask questions and say things about the show on hashtag 24SEO, obviously, it helps us get more viewers and lets everyone know. Help us raise sure. more money. And the more yeah. money we raise, the less times I'll tell you sad stories about things to do with the. Hey, I, I, you know what, guys? I, I'm kind of happy because we started today's show $100 over what we made all of last year for the charity. So right. we're off to a uh, we're off to a good start. We're up to uh, $5,725. And I think last year we did, what, $5,600? Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think all in with the uh, the merchandise and stuff. So it's super cool. Um, thank you so much to the event sponsors and the speakers that are supporting this year. Um, it's been really, uh, really phenomenal the amount of support we've got. <clears throat> Did we share the um, the link to the uh, the merch page? I think Garrett shared it. Okay, cool. I don't know. Someone shared it. I, I don't have it in here. Okay. Because you wanted it. Uh, in, uh, 20, 24 hours of SEO.com forward slash replay hyphen room. And all the, the links are on there, except the yeah. wide link, which because uh, I can't log into the site at the minute. So, and well, guys, if, if, if you. Um, if you drop your name and email address on, on the website, 24hoursofseo.com, uh, you'll get first access to all of the recordings uh, of today's event for free. So, uh, and I don't think all of last year's as well, and last year's slide decks. So, you're going to get two full years, completely free SEO conferences, everything you need. And we're not um, spamming this list again. either. I mean, how many times did you hit that list all of last year, other than promoting? Uh, zero, the zero. Um, yeah. We, we email it for the event, um, and and that's it. If, if we had, um, we were looking at having a live 24 hours of SEO kind of meetup. We, we're not actually going to meet up for 24 hours. It would just be a, a social around the event and another conference. But that didn't happen last year, so there were no, there were no emails um, at all, except for to do with the conference. <coughs> Cool. So it looks like uh, maybe an algorithm update yesterday. Anybody see that? I mean, I don't know. It's, it's just a typical weekly uh, fluctuation. I think another algorithm. 
<laughs> the only yeah. thing I really have to say is uh, our health related site for the first time in 14 months or so is flat. It has not grown. Do I contribute that to an algorithm update? Not really. But uh, I actually saw, um, let's see. Saw about like a 15% uh, dip over the last two days in traffic. So I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but uh, hopefully it's just a blip on the radar as usual. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're pretty flat on all our sites, so. Yeah, one, one like the growth slowed, I guess, and it went flat for a little bit, but. That doesn't, it's kind of hard to tell over such a short period of time. Right. Like yeah, it's, like got, it's, it's nothing noticeable to me that you could easily attribute to an update of any sort. No, no, there was, uh, there was uh, no like annihilation for anyone. So. You know, I was reading some of these comments, and someone's like, drop and rank two spots for our largest keyword. And it's like, eh. That can just kind of happen. Great my, my, my actual keyword, keyword um, my keyword fluctuations were, were up big time yesterday. It was like mm -hmm. I was dropping off the map uh, for certain keywords and just other keywords that I've been tracking for a while just appeared out of nowhere. So I, I think it's just uh, something that kind of breaks shake. Yeah, I mean, that sounds like typical uh, some sort of flux versus these people, like, or not. I mean, like these people that are saying they saw like flux of like one to two spots. That just sounds like average Google dancing um, versus where you might see, in my opinion, an update of huge flux where you're dropping keywords totally or going from out of nowhere to page one or, and then like 12 hours later, you bounced out again. Um, like hardcore dancing, that's usually I see with an update, but. I think this is just another one of our standard SEO unmasked Google updates that we cover where, you know. Yeah, nothing's new. Keep nothing's new. Um, <laughs> Google's pretty smart compared to what it used to be. They change things all the time, they expect changes. Um, I haven't really got anything. Yeah. Um, uh, next article, it's uh, from Barry as well. Here, I forgot to put the links in the video. Should probably do that. Here's the update one. Um, Google is, for Google My Business, launching a new spam report form to stop you sneaky rank and rent people that are running fake businesses <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> um, kind of interesting. You know, I know there are a lot of legitimate guys that do good rank and rent stuff, but I guess this is a way to help you know, combat some of the really spammy stuff going on in Google My Business, and hopefully it works out. But uh, well, they had to do something. I mean, you know, it's yeah. being overdone when there's whole people selling like business software, membership training sites, all this kind of stuff, teaching them how to spam Google My Business. I feel like they had to do something because it's going to just be increasing numbers of people trying to spam it and it was just going to get worse and you, there's a lot of terrible terrible listings in google and i never really thought google local got as good at recommending things you actually want in the first place as yelp was beforehand i mean it, it never even gives me restaurants in the right town half the time when i look for my town and things like that and the reviews uh I know Yelp has some issues with reviews too, but sometimes Google's situation with the reviews is just bizarre. So I'm really not surprised to see them taking some serious action uh, about that kind of stuff because it is a big problem. Yeah. There's even a spreadsheet upload option. So you can do tons of locations at once. It seems like a uh, another Google honeypot to me. Um, I don't know. It's just like yeah, outing people just for for the sake of outing people. Back in the day, Matt Cuts actually like it was a big thing back in the day to um, 
if you see any link spammers to report them to Google. And this reminds me of, of the same thing. Oh, yeah, because they failed to solve it, haven't they? Yeah. Um, if they were supposed to solve this, they kept saying they were going to do something. Now they've just thrown their hands up and said, Do you think people are going to abuse this and just start reporting the shit out of their customer or their competition? Well, uh, that's one aspect of it. But then you have, you know, your certain percentage of like white knights that just, you know, are on Google's side all the time and they're going to be looking out to, uh, they're going to like police uh, the SERPs, so to speak. And oh, then, yeah, yeah you're going to have. Yeah, they're just going to be going balls to the wall, aren't they? It's, uh... Yeah. So it's and then if you have, uh, like you said, Garrett, guys that want to get rid of their competition, that, that, that type of thing is what I would imagine is what will kill this, this tool or this feature. Uh, just everybody reporting everybody else. But we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, next on the list, we were going to talk briefly about um, buying age domains or buying existing websites just you know, based off their existing link profiles. And it's something that I've looked into it before with someone that we're partnering up on a new site with. Um, I think maybe we'll move that one to the end. If there's anybody watching that's super experienced and would like to come on for a little bit and talk about it with us, um, you know, I, I know some of kind of like the basic stuff and what I would look for, but maybe it's not the most advanced way or the best way to do it. So if anybody's watching and wants to come on in 20 minutes, half an hour, or something like that, uh, Shoot me a message or bin a message or whatever, and or put it in the chat. And we'll get you on the hangout. Otherwise, yeah, we're really keen we to have some uh, have some pretty cool live panels this year and get some of you guys involved because um, there's a load of cool topics and things we get sent questions about that um, we don't answer because um, it's not something we get involved in. So it'd be super cool to have you guys come on and talk about some of those and give the audience some some input. So. Give us a shout if you want to come on and do that. Hey, Garrett, do you, do you think um, I'm going to get yelled at if I post in Signals Lab and Dan Ray? Um, I saw Andrew Ansley was posting it in Signals Lab, so you should be fine. And then, uh, okay. I don't I mean, think, and typically it doesn't care as long as you're not like blatantly promoting a commercial service. But uh, I saw BB shared in there, so. You should be fine. Yeah, if somebody wants to shit on an event promotion for a charity, I don't know if I want to be friends with that person. All yeah. right. Um, yeah, I was just going to say a quick, uh, you know, the, the schedule for the whole 24 hours is in the video description. Um, anybody watching, you'll see we have lots of slots for audience interaction and q a so if you're watching and you just want to talk about anything seo related or uh digital marketing related in that sense drop your name in the chat or message us and uh we can pull you on for one of those slots and talk about whatever or if you uh small business or something want some help with your website we'll, we'll have some time with that and uh, yeah Cool. I had another um, roundtable post in, in the um, links that I gave you, if you want to jump into that. Something about um, you can check country-specific rankings. You can check what, sorry? <laughs> um, on roundtable, <coughs> Barry uh, just put out a post that said, uh, uh, it was a tweet from Glenn Gabe, that you can now check uh, country-specific rankings in Google. Oh, okay, cool. Into YouTube. Um, I'm back properly now, guys. Um, we have the live link for the show. Finally, I, I got back onto the 24hoursofseo.com. On the homepage now, there is the link saying that we're live. Click on to go watch. So if you want to tweet out the 24hoursofseo.com URL, that's going to be easier for you than uh, banging the YouTube live link in, and then people can also, if they want to, register to get the uh, replays and everything else. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. I'm just about done with our promotions here, and I can actually 
participate. So as it's in Search Console, you can uh, look at uh, a SERP snippet or what? Or what's going on here? Um, you just append a, uh, a URL parameter to uh, your search, and it's just like ampersand G GL equals country code. Um, you can do the same thing with language code, and oh. apparently it'll give you, um, I guess, country and language specific SERP results. Interesting. I was saying here, uh, Glenn said, don't forget about using the ad preview and diagnosis tool in Google Ads. You can set up any location you want globally and see the first page of the results. So that's another way. I've never really thought, thought of uh, using that stuff to look at it. You know what? We, at Word Agents, we get a lot of Australian clients, and we get a lot of Italian clients recently. Um, and that's important. If, if we're doing our content research, and I want to make sure that I have country-specific information when we do our research and when we find our sources for outbound external linking, this is going to make it really easy for us. Um, right. In the past, I've had to explain to my writers, no, you got to go to the country version of Google and then do your research on there, and then use Google Translate if you can't read it. Um, so this will this will definitely help me for sure. But we'll see. Hopefully, it's something that sticks around. You know, uh, Google flip flops on yeah. all the new products like this. Yeah. I'm trying to remember what was the parameter you used to put in. Like, remember with Blogspot, it used to automatically change people's Blogspot domains to like .co.uk if you were in the UK, and you could put in like slash something, then the URL, and it would automatically leave it on Blogspot.com. The Google Google search itself you used to be able to put that into it, and it would return um, results for that region. There, there was only a, a few, a handful of pra uh, URL parameters that I've ever used, and it was really just for displaying um, the results differently. Like you can do one to add uh, the results up to a hundred. You can. Um, uh, I think there was like a tilde parameter, which would give you synonyms for um, SERP searches. <coughs> I haven't used those in a while, though. This one looks actually uh, useful in, in daily business. Mm, it does. All right. So hopefully we don't get kicked out of any of these Facebook groups, but I've got like five threads going for us. Well, it's a charity event, so yeah. Um, Twenty-one watches. Hey, everybody. Yeah. Uh, next up on the list for the news, we have an article by Chris Lee over at uh, RankExcel.com. Um, he had a site that was penalized to some extent, and he took it from a penalized site with no traffic to a site with sixty-four hundred hits a month. Um, Without doing a whole lot, really, he just uh, cleaned out his think content, updated articles, and disavowed some low quality links. Um, he claims that this site started with 211 uh, referring domains on Ahrefs. So yeah, I guess we got to take his word that you know he wasn't using PBN links or something that were obviously not found by Ahrefs or other crawling tools where you, obviously, if you're using a PBN, you're probably blocking them from crawling your network. But uh, um, on the other side of that really quickly, you know, he has 20,000 backlinks based off of 200 domains. So it's quite possible those 200 links that they built, uh, or those 200 domains they have links from, it, it seems like a lot of people these days, uh, when they're when they're reviving old sites or they're looking for uh, a big growth push uh, in terms of traffic, uh, they're doing a lot of content pruning and a lot of um, more taking away underperforming content rather than more backlinks or more content, which is uh, the old tried and true motto. Uh, anytime you want more traffic. Um, what, do you, what do you guys think about that? Is the whole concept of pruning and crawl budget and all, all that good stuff? Well, I thought Google had said it was probably fine to do it and maybe a good idea in some cases. Um, and didn't, 
and Jared mentioned on the show that he'd get he'd kind of tested it a bit as well. It had gone pretty okay for him. Yeah, I think if you've got sorry, go on, go on. You can finish. Yeah, that. Jared will be on later, um, so he, he can uh, expand on that. But uh, he does a lot of that t- testing kind of stuff, and I I don't know if he's just doing it just for quote unquote thin content that could be rolled into another article to expand that article into a bigger resource or if he is doing it uh, from a technical standpoint where he sees that URL just isn't performing how he wants and he's getting rid of it because of that. Um, so knowing, knowing him, probably both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, I know Robbie Richards talks about this a lot. Um, actually, uh, I tried to get Robbie on, on the show. He couldn't make it today, but uh, he said next year is in. So oh, that'll be a good one next Robbie year. Richards, then. Like yeah, but what, one of his, um, I think it's his on-site SEO, like, you know, 16 tips for on-site SEO guide. One of them is content pruning. And he's got a cool little uh, matrix on there that you can fill out uh, that'll help you determine if the specific page uh, is worth keeping or worth cutting. Um, I'm going to find that for you guys so we can share it in the, uh, in the chat. Yeah, and, and Garrett did it a while ago for a local site, and it was um, page amalgamations, so finding things that are too similar, like, um, you know, crossbows with steel tips, crossbows with titanium tips, and there just wasn't really enough differentiation locally and enough traffic. Most people were using, say, metal tips because they don't even know that the correct term these days is to refer to the titanium or something. It would be like, um, you know, like darts. Everyone refers to steel tip darts, and you know, they, they're made. They, the dart itself is made of, of nickel tungsten usually, but I, I, I doubt there's much search. As someone can correct me if I'm wrong now, but my guess is there's not going to be a huge amount of search traffic for nickel tungsten darts compared with just people looking for steel tip darts because they know. They're not, they just want a dart site that sells darts and then they're going to pick their set. There's not going to be a, a dart site that, speci- that specifically focuses on brass darts or something. So they know that it's going to have what they want. It was that kind of query. And some of the pages were kind of merged into the main page. So into the steel tip darts equivalent um, of local services. And the new, the new longer page um, performed better for both queries than either more specific page had performed by themselves when Garrett did that test. Yeah, I mean that that's a pretty uh, clear that's some pretty clear evidence uh, that it works for sure. Yeah, I, I mean uh, one test because we have one local client, but we yeah. don't have many uh, sites to play with, but it was good that it worked. I just shared in the chat a, a screenshot of Robbie's uh, little grid that he uh, decision making matrix, I, I guess you would say, um, for keeping or removing content on your site. And it basically just looks at the relevancy, the traffic, the links, and the conversions of the page. And obviously, if you have all four of those, you're going to want to keep the page. If you have none of them, um, you can remove them. Uh, but he also has two other options, which would be to either improve the page or to merge the page with another existing page. So uh, it's a, a pretty comprehensive little little tool there that you can use to decide if you want to prune or or keep or merge. Cool. I'll check that out. Yeah. I guess then, oh, yeah. if you keep if you keep a a list, I guess of random things that we share or guests share that aren't in the official notes anywhere, we can maybe put that on the post show email to everyone who's registered on twenty four hours of SEO dot com. We'll send out any of Ben's special notes as well as a little <laughs> bit of bonus content for you. I guarantee, as the day goes on, the special notes are going to become less and less as I get more tired and tired, but. Yeah, yeah, we'll keep him well, going. Fresh, he's got loads of great stuff coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he's been a lot more active in uh, all the groups and reading stuff lately. I remember when we started the show, you were like, "Yeah, I don't read anything." What are you, what are you talking about? Well, What's when this we round started, table thing? I was just so like disorganized. Like now, I have like my RSS reader that I have all my you know regular reads on, so I can contribute more to the show. But uh, like I said last week, I'm also doing my, my scheduling on Sundays for the entire week. I'm doing my Pomodoro technique. So uh, the new VIN is much more organized than the VIN of two years ago. That's cool. 
Uh, we got to use sure. Uh, next up on the news list, uh, I have an article from a betterlemonadestand.com uh, about social proof. Um, a lot of good tips. You know, well, like, it's, uh, it's social proof. Why so social proof is uh, important for e-commerce sites specifically as a seller. Okay, yep. Um, yeah. th this is what, uh, a longer read, so I, we definitely should show this link in the in the chat here. Oh, there you go. Yeah. But um, they basically go through a bunch of stats that prove why social proof is not something an e-commerce uh, company should should ignore, even though it might seem like something that wouldn't really apply to them as a uh, as a marketing vehicle. Um, uh, a lot of companies uh, they outline here. Are, are seeing some pretty good uh, results because of social proof, and that, that that's a, that's some stuff that you guys, that's kind of like your influencer product, right? Um, you're you're using influencers well, um, as a link building tool. Um, well, well, that was what um, Joe Sinkwitz spoke about last time on the uh, twenty four hours using it for link building. We're using it more for a replacement to advertising. So, say you spend ten thousand dollars a month on ads on Facebook, just using Facebook as an example, you'd really be on Facebook, Instagram, so on and so forth. Um, and you get, that gets you 2,000 clicks, say, and 200 sales, just to keep everything round numbers. What we'd be looking for is influencers that have the similar audience, but they'll sell you more reach for less money, so that you get more reach, you get 3,000 clicks and 300 sales for the same money. So that's what our influencer marketing is all about. Um, an interesting story um, around influencers and advertising is though I was at a conference a few years ago and they shared a case study where some, they they given an influencer the product and they've reviewed it and they continue to send huge amounts of ad traffic to that review instead of their own page because that converts better for them than their own content, um, which I guess backs up what the assertion of this article that social proof is because obviously there were loads of comments on the article, his followers had commented, there was loads of positivity going on in this this one page, which would be hard to fake or replicate, or you know, you cherry pick a few tweets to embed on your own page, it's just not as genuine, and that was really performing for them. So I thought that was a really cool example of how to use something you get out of an influencer campaign. You can then drive paid directly to that amazingly converting piece, which for some people will work out. Are you guys doing a lot of paid in that fashion? I, I don't do any pay for anything, but uh, it's always in the back of my mind that no, because maybe... we don't do it. we don't do it for clients. Um, they clients will do paid to influencer placements they get like that, but they don't share huge amounts of data with us on that side. Which we're just looking at. They'll share with us their campaign performance, in, uh, and then we have to try and beat it with influencers. Um, what they do afterwards, they tend to not give us all the data for. Yeah. It's something I, I always want to, like, I always have it in the back of my mind that, hey, once I own the entire keyword set for my website, I'm going to go scale into paid advertising. And, you know, you, you see some, some bigger affiliate sites, well-known affiliate sites, uh, you know, you'll see them in, in the Google AdWords section or, and, and Facebook ads, and so you know they're they're tinkering with that too. But uh, I just wonder what kind of can of worms I'd be opening by oh, there is transitioning. A, there is, there are a couple of businesses out there where they have content sites that you would recognize uh, as like as if they were doing SEO, but they don't do any. They don't build. They don't do link building. They don't build them with SEO in mind. They just start spending on social advertising from day one. That's um, actually uh, my, my good friend Joe. That he actually got me into digital marketing, and he just does PPC arbitrage like that exclusively. So he doesn't care about keyword stuffing, about any of the on-site shit. He just makes a really nice landing page, and he buys clicks from where he knows uh, he'll get people to convert. So it's, it's a completely different world, and. Those guys that have mastered that are banking hard. They're really making some big money. How, how um, does he? How does he manage his scrub rate, though? <laughs> I couldn't tell you. <laughs> I couldn't tell you. 
he, he's uh, his traffic sources are are all over the place. It's not just um, Google and, and well, Facebook. I, yeah, I imagine he does lots of um, newsletter link buys and all kinds of stuff because I know a lot of the a lot um, of media buying. Like, uh, yeah. Uh, what do they call it? Uh, pro programmatic media buying. Um, so, you know, ab above my pay grade, uh, uh, you know, all I know is Google AdWords and Facebook. So, yeah, it's uh, it's hard work these days. I think you have to be. Um, there's so many because there's so many courses out there for the basics. Your competition is already someone who has ten hours experience. If you're competing with the worst person running ads on Facebook in your niche, so yeah, you've got ten hours of learning to do before you're as good as the worst person you're competing with. Um, it was a lot easier not too long ago. Yeah, and I think it's a little bit um, far fetched to believe that I'll ever ever complete a niche, you know, and. Um, Sorry, and because <laughs> you see all the all the keyword search volume, and you see all the opportunities, but if you potentially rank for every single one of those uh, keywords, which you won't uh, in the in the first spot, the next step is to start building other sites in the in the niche and start you know owning those SERPs with other properties. So it's it's really a never ending project, um, and if you were to I guess. Uh, scale to other traffic sources you would have to bring somebody else in to help you out there yeah i think so i think definitely initially be you'd want to bring in um an experienced freelancer um drop a few thousand on their expertise getting you some basic test campaigns done and see if it's going to work in your niche and then explore scaling it out once um, i mean i know a lot of people watching um especially the folks from over on Builder Society. Uh, thanks to everyone from there who's supported. There's been some um, big supporters from the Builder Society community. Um, the A lot of them are more do-it-yourself, so it doesn't matter that they'll be quicker if they don't practice themselves, but it, it is a lot of practice. You'll probably run just to one page. You'll end up running 30 different ad variants before you find one that, that binks the first time you test it. And then your second time, you'll be like, okay, that worked really well. I'm, I, I got it right after eight variants or something. You know, I mean, that, well, that's what I found when I played around with it. I did some. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's what I was always told. Like, if you want to get into PPC arbitrage and, and, you know, push affiliate offers and hopefully you make money on the difference between the ad spend and what you make on the offer, um, to get the proper data that you need, I've always been told that you you got to have a bankroll of like 20 grand and that's just to dial in the offer and get it to a point where you can get that campaign profitable. Um, so for most beginners, uh, you know, I don't think beginners are going to want to drop 20 grand. So um, that's why they kind of migrate towards SEO. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, well, SEO can be just as bad. I mean, you can drop... Uh, <laughs> You can drop twenty months of your time pretty easily, which if you if you could have earned, um, you know, fifty grand working at Walmart doing the same time, it's a pretty big investment as well in time, isn't it? So, and I think the beauty of the pay per click spend is people can start with a much smaller budget because they're going to make something back. Like your campaign might not be profitable, but you spend a thousand and you end up with. Um, 750 on your first try because you suck and you're losing 25% instead of making 25%. You still get, you've only got to top up 250 from your work money to be back with a thousand to go again next month. And within a year, you, you've spent through 10,000 with all the learnings. And maybe by the end of the year, you're making 3% instead of losing 25% or something. You've become a, a profitable player. And then, and then every month, you're growing your spend instead of shrinking it. Yeah. And again, from from what I understand, it's the same thing. Uh, you know, like as an affiliate SEO, we're always looking for uh, the niches that nobody knows about, but has lots of search volume and lots of buying intent. And I would imagine it's the same thing uh, with paid. Is you want to find those unknown niches that uh, where the competition is so low that you get your clicks at like half a penny or a penny, um, and that's really where you're going to make your money just by. Um, I guess I guess niche research is really our our keyword research, so to speak. Yeah, I miss the old days on Facebook where the clicks were so so cheap. 
I mean, you could get newsletter opt-ins for like 80 cents to a dollar 20. Now I read a post, a brag post from a, an advertising agency. I won't out them here, but um, I have no idea if what they did is actually good or not. They were bragging that they'd got someone's um, opt-ins to their HubSpot landing page from $12 um, per opt-in down to six fifty. Um, which when you think a complete noob like me, just I stuck up two ad variants, um, didn't pay for any proper creative, um, sent them to a landing page that was uh, pretty bad. Uh, <laughs> uh, and it was costing me about a buck 20 per opt-in um, in, in a fairly, it was to do with marketing. So a pretty, you know, the kind of niche where people don't opt in super easily. Um, that's quite a big change in the cost since just five years ago. Um, and that's why so many people struggle in the paid space and why, despite it being easier to get started, you, you have a big dropout rate because, like, if your site starts to rank um, and you've spent ages building it up, it, it gets easier then to rank new pages, whereas on pay-per-click, you're facing a constant tide of prices going up. And so then you have to learn Instagram because there's still a bit of better organic reach and a bit of better cost on Instagram, but then Instagram starts going up. And so you're facing this constant rising tide of costs. And we do face that in SEO, the quality bar keeps moving towards us, but you don't, every year your site doesn't automatically become 17% less valuable, guaranteed that your existing campaigns become 17% less, more expensive every year on paid advertising. So you need to always be moving to the new platforms and always improving compared to your competitors. Otherwise you start losing money and suddenly you're like, but I've been doing this for three years, making loads of money and now I'm minus 2% ROI just because the costs have crept up on you. Hang on just one sec and go to uh, YouTube again. I'll be right back. Okay. Uh, we've got uh, Antoine Solutions in the chat. Uh, hey, welcome to the 24 hours. Let all your friends know in the industry. Um, and just a reminder to everyone, if any of you want to join um, a panel discussion, um, let us know. We're open to topics. I had the idea that one that would be really useful for ours would be, uh, especially after the conference I just went to yesterday, um, is conferences, because I'd really love um, 2020 to be the year when we go to just good conferences that we really enjoy and get loads out of. So if any of you watching have been to a conference in the last um, year or so and would like to come on and just have a chat with us for five, 10 minutes, uh, let us know how you got on, what you liked about it, um, and or if you just have any general thoughts on conferences in the industry and want to jump on for a chat, um, just let us know in the YouTube chat and uh, Garrett will uh, hook you up and uh, get you on the call for a little bit and you can join join the panel discussion about conferences. Um, but also, if you've got any other panel discussion topics you'd like us to uh, jump onto as well during this um, initial um, chat period uh, and before we get the big speakers on, we'll, we'll be happy to oblige pretty much any reasonable topic. <laughs> Um, hacking hacking into people's sites to put links on them is pretty much banned, um, and so is pornography because YouTube will uh, stop sharing our video. <laughs> Other than those two topics, uh, illegal and adult, you can come on and talk about anything. Yeah. Um, so I guess next up on the news we have. Uh, hey guys, just a reminder. Let's let's get some donations going. Uh, we we yeah. we we're up to about fifty seven hundred when we started an hour ago, and not a dollar yet. So I'm going to be a dick and call you all out. Um, <laughs> you know, if if you go to Starbucks every day, maybe skip today. Just throw five bucks in, ten bucks. It'll help. That's all we need. Uh, I'm going to put yeah, it in the I, I, and I know we're not the most exciting part of the show, but remember we've got some amazing speakers coming up. Um, Paul Shapiro always shares amazing value. Nick Eubanks huge supporter of the event, um, dropped everything last year in the middle of his mergers and acquisitions frenzy to come on the show. For the, uh, for the next 6.9 minutes up until 10 o'clock central time, I'll match dollar for dollar what goes in there. So, Oh, oh wow. Gonna, <laughs> All right. Vin, Vin's going to put in one minute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Well, Sell your house, Gary. I'm not too big. Yeah, I'm going to go call a realtor here. I need a couple hundred thousand dollars. I, I, should, I should have saved my last donation for now if I knew that was happening. Yeah. Well, oh, that, would have been, that would have been a sucker punch for Garrett. Yeah. <laughs> five minutes left. I, Come on, I, I just minutes. ran a second second promotion on YouTube also. Uh, I'm sorry, Facebook. But, uh, <laughs> man, I wish I knew. How to bankrupt Garrett Groff in five minutes. <laughs> Come on, you can just take some money straight out of Garrett's pocket and give it to some dudes. I mean, and there's um, if you look <laughs> on their site at the minute, there's um, there's a really cool story about a, a young lad who um, basically I, had exhausted. Did, did Steve just break up for everybody else? Am I oh, back? Is it just me. It's still here. Okay, I was just saying, there's a really cool story on the uh, St. Jude's blog at the minute about a young lad who uh, yeah, that ex you know had exhausted all. like a normal kid again so it really is amazing work and it's work that it doesn't benefit just the Jews or the handful of kids that they treat directly these treatments eventually uh, and there's some stories later where you'll hear about that when I cover some of the charity stories um, to go along with the speaker slots uh, these treatments end up in hospitals all around the world saving hundreds of thousands of people um, so although it's nice to hear one little story about someone who actually made it to St. Jude's, the work they do because it's a research hospital, it benefits the whole world. So if you can afford five dollars, ten dollars, um, you know, and if you're going to watch the whole thing and you're looking forward to some of the big name speakers and you're treating it as a conference, remember you'll spend nine hundred dollars to get these speakers on stage at a at a real conference. And we're just suggesting a hundred dollar donation if you're an SEO. Who's going to get value out of all of these speakers today and if you if your company can make a corporate donation we're suggesting just five hundred dollars so neither donation is even the ticket price for most seo conferences and yeah, all yeah. Of the money is going to st jude's to, and also, change, uh, to change the world really I, I, on that same uh, note there you, you, we're going to be giving you these uh, recordings for free and a lot of these presentations that are coming up are going to be valuable to your business too so even if you're just dropping a hundred dollars, I'm sure you're going to be able to use a lot of these strategies that you're going to learn today uh, to grow your your own income at your uh, on your affiliate at, you know website or your agency. Um, so yeah, I mean, like take take Search Lab. I mean, they sell their video pack for about three hundred and fifty pounds, something like that. You're getting the same top quality speakers coming on. Um, we're just asking for a hundred dollar donation, but we understand some of you can't afford it. Give whatever you can. And it makes a huge difference to, to St. Jude's. Um, and we're looking to, you know, really show um, what the SEO community can do and how generous the uh, community is when we all come together. Um, and I'm going to get tired and more teary reading some of the stories <laughs> out later on. A combination of tiredness, hunger, and uh, the sadness of some of the stories will probably get to me. So I'm trying to be upbeat with the good news story to start the show. Um, really excited. To uh, read about new treatments working, and um, St. Jude's really is a pioneer. Um, you know, a treatment that just no one's even trying them in, in, in most of the rest of the world because um, they're so unlikely to work. You know, only a research hospital where that's their only mission to take kids that any other doctor would have had to give up on because there was no next treatment. They are the next treatment and they become the next treatment, not just the next treatment, they become. The ninety percent success rate treatment someday in the future for every kid all around the world who's unlucky enough to be diagnosed and to have that fight on their hands. So please give generously, and we'll try and give awesome value. Is there anyone watching wants to jump on and have a chat? Come on, don't be shy. Uh, I just had to. I just had to match a donation. Thank you. Both. Oh, excellent. Our, that works with us. So. Oh Jesus. Fun. Yeah, thank you, Beth. She only did that to get Garrett, but uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Beth is like a mystery to me because I only see her name anywhere. I see her at her name on the donation page and email, but I've never that's actually the way, seen the uh, mysterious that's the way Beth. the mysterious Beth likes to be. I think she might be. I think she might be. A, I think she might be a Brighton SEO this uh, September, though. So you may meet her in person. Go from one extreme to the other, then. Yeah. 
I got uh, I have to match another twenty five from Anonymous. So thank you, Mr. or Mrs. Anonymous. That was uh, probably Beth again, just taking some more of your money. <laughs> <laughs> but no, seriously, thank you, Anonymous. That's really kind of you. Every little help over this twenty four hours. I mean, even those couple of donations. I mean, if you, if we do that every hour, we'll be getting close to ten thousand dollars raised. Um, obviously, for some of the big speakers coming on, people will um, be so impressed versus not too impressed with our usual SEO and mass show and give even more, which will push us up closer to our big goal. So thank you very, very much. Um, cool. I mean, I guess I'm just going to start the next segment and start talking about conferences and give you guys the lowdown on the ones we've been to. Um, well, can we finish uh, the news? Oh, we're not finished. I thought we'd finish when <laughs> Vin oh, yeah, went yeah, yeah, on oh, to fun. <laughs> no, no, okay. no, 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 no. Sorry. I thought Vin was uh, <laughs> wrapping us up. <laughs> All right, I just want to check. I think I got the my donations done. Yeah. All right, yeah, we're up to fifty. So what's the? What's the? Oh, nice, fifty-eight twenty. Come on, one hundred and fifty more. Someone, let's get us to six thousand. <laughs> uh, next up on the news, uh, I think Josh Hardwick from over at the Hrefs uh, found an article doing a data-driven guide to anchor text. Uh, we can go into the details a bit, but according to his data from Ahrefs, uh, there isn't much correlation, in their opinion, between exact match anchor text and ranking, or partial match anchor text and ranking, or um, anchor text in general might not really have that much effect on ranking like it did years ago. Um, yeah, I guess Steve and I's general approach is we don't necessarily care at all about anchor text anymore. Uh, we we like natural stuff. We're you know that's part of a more risk adverse <laughs> strategy that when we have content written on links we built, we uh, have the writers include them naturally in a way that makes sense for readers and a way that made sense when the article was written. Yeah, I, I, I think. Um, Anchor text has lost its its weight um, depending on the relevance of the site it's on. Um, a couple of weeks back, uh, Brinestone Pasha went on a Twitter rant uh, with like 56 uh, tweets about um, some <laughs> testing he was doing, and, and uh, a big part of it was uh, how how anchor text and the relevance of the site um, changed uh, the effective effectiveness of, of the link. Um, so if you have like a high authority and a high relevance uh, linking page, you're not going to want to use a, a partial or an exact match anchor uh, because then that would actually over optimize the link and it wouldn't be as effective. But if you used a natural anchor there, it actually maintained uh, the effectiveness that, that you would expect from, from said link. And um, alternatively, if it was a low authority, I guess you would say low authority, low relevance domain, you could go ahead and use the exact match anchor there because um, you would want to push that relevance with using the, the anchor text. Um, so I, I think between what's, what the study was done here and what uh, Grindstone put out uh, together, you get a clear picture of, of how anchor text should be used in, in 2019. I mean, um, considering how much harder it is um, to get the anchor text into things, um, I guess you're going to be choosing as well between having a couple of links with, uh, if you're buying links, it'll cost you more money on certain sites to get anchor text. If you're doing outreach, you're going to have more fails. So say you're choosing between having five natural links and three with a more aggressive anchor text, um, I think I I just would prefer to have the five links, and um, and if you start trying to get really aggressive anchor text on better sites, you're also getting the three that you do get for the exact anchor text on less good sites as well. So I think the natural approach gives you more links, so and on slightly better sites on average. So I think if even if there is an anchor text benefit, it's just never seemed worth it to us to game and then. There's all the stories of people that have gone too far and triggered a filter, which was another yeah. concern. 
but let's talk about that now. Um, and thank you to Bibi, who's uh, just made a donation. Um, big yeah. shout out. Um, I love the to, uh, $25 as well. Thank you. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Hey, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Well, uh, Garrett, was that in your, your match? <laughs> your uh, match they, were uh, they were late. They were late by five minutes? All right. <laughs> There'll be there'll be more incentives later on in the show. I mean, yeah. um, I, I ended up getting uh, getting caught out on a couple of a uh, couple of things during the show last time. I had to donate a hundred dollars. I'm sure as I become more tired and incoherent, I will uh, I will make a bet that I lose and have to donate <laughs> again. So <laughs> cool. I, I'm really yeah. like uh, these these new uh, Ahrefs uh, case studies because. A, a of all, it's not opinion. You can't really argue uh, the data. And um, B, it, you can really uh, extract some core uh, understanding about how to how to operate in, in, from an on-site um, optimization standpoint. So I hope they keep on coming. Yeah. Uh, next up on the list, uh, Nick Eubanks, that will be on the show later on today, um, put out an article how technical changes, um, he saw really good on-page results, or really good results from fixing some on-page issues on a client site. Um, it's all about your listen .com. The um, uh, A lot of this was what we talked about with uh, Chris's update, too. Um, he did a lot of content pruning here, um, a lot of on-site SEO changes. Um, one, of, one of the key things that jumped out at me is uh, the, I guess, frequency of their updates. Um, or maybe that was Chris's, but, but they're, they're constantly updating and pruning and, and keeping a, a, a page fresh which really drives um, traffic growth, in my opinion. A couple of tools he shouts out in here, um, URL Profiler and Sitebulb, um, both tools with you're hearing a lot more about on, on Twitter from people that are doing on-site work. So uh, maybe if we have someone on later who's doing a lot of technical work, or maybe we'll just... Uh, I tried out Sitebulb a while back. Because um, you know, I think I've been pretty open that I'm, I'm a big proponent proponent of internal linking and doing it properly, and you can see really good results. And I tried Sitebulb; they have a good visual. Well, I, I think it's an okay visual map. It doesn't have some things that I really want, but it does a good visual map of all your internal linking. And I, I think a lot of people like it that way. It's just not my preference per se. Um, it was a pretty decent tool. I uh, I use the other one. I use URL profiler, and it's solid. Um, but actually, what I use just uh, you know starting back last week was uh, website auditor, and I like it a lot, man. It's a, it's a desktop app, and it's kind of a mix between the two. Um, you can get that vis uh, that site bulb uh, map uh, that visualizes your entire architecture. And you can also do the individual um, breakout of, of uh, SEO elements. What I want in a tool is a way to filter out. So if you're looking at your internal linking map, all I want is internal linking that's done contextually. I'm not saying um, and other internal links on your site are important. But I want a way that I can just filter out. Like, let's say you're looking at a page. And within your content, you have five internal links. I don't want. The internal links included in my map, like featured articles at the bottom, or you know, an internal link to a category page in your nav bar. I don't always care about that, and I I could write trips and screaming frog, and then do this all in Vue JS. But you know, it's very complicated, a lot of time. Yeah, I was just gonna say that you could do that with screaming frog. You just I think you could set it to only pull links within the body tag, right? Yeah, I think so. Okay, and then so you I'm just pull that out. report, and um, and then you could probably scrape the the links, and then maybe make a visualization of that. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah, I talked to uh, Stephen Von Bussum. I think that they run Content King. Um, they're working on an internal link profiler, 
and I'd mention him some of my thoughts and I don't know exactly when they're planning on releasing that into their tool, but Ahrefs actually Ahrefs secretly rolled that out too. They have a, an internal linking tool now um, as part of their suite. It's pretty cool. I mean, uh, you can either just plug in a, a URL and, and it'll break out all the links that, that it sends internally from that page, or you could do the whole site and you can just export it into a CSV and and you'll be able to uh, do what you were saying pretty easily too. Yeah. BB just having a quick shout out on the chat to Stephen Van Besten. Um, we actually spoke to him about coming on. He's um, he's running an SEO meetup today and he's away away from home, so he couldn't couldn't manage to come on. Um, so two years in a row, we've uh, managed to clash our clash our schedule with him. I think he travels a lot though, because I've I've met him in um, I've met him in London and stuff. So I think he's on the road quite a bit. Um, doing meetups and conferences and stuff. So hopefully next year we'll, we'll get him on. We did want to do a tool segment, so uh, but big shout out for uh, Screaming Frog for being the only tool provider to uh, donate, support the charity, and jump on. Um, we were hoping there would be a few, and I have a whole panel and a bit of a discussion and debate so Garrett could grill them about why his internal linking needs aren't met by their yeah. tools. But uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, we just have Screaming Frog, which from what Vin's saying is, which uh, Garrett's just gone back to using, having tried a whole bunch of tools. So it sounds like uh, sounds like he's made the right decision there, to be honest. Yeah, we, we got turned down, actually, uh, unfortunately, by a few tools that we pitched for this year. But hopefully the uh, Screaming Frog segment will be a good uh, proof, proof of concept for them for next year. Yeah, I think so. I think it'll be really good. Um, I mean, we've got a huge speaker lineup this year. We've got slightly less speakers than last year, but the list is just phenomenal. I'm really excited to hear some of the presentations. Um, I, I think we had 20 total speakers last year, and, and man, that, that was a grind. I, I like having a little bit of a breather in between uh, speakers here where we can kind of reflect well, on what it, we just learned. Overnight, we had like nobody, and then Steve and I were just like rambling on, and thankfully some people came in and uh, yeah, come on the show, people. There's like 22 of you watching. Someone must want to come on for a chat now and come and join us while we're uh, going to be talking about conferences. Yeah, I, wrapping up uh, Nick's article quick, I was just going to say, you know, it's worth mentioning that, um, what, what's the name of the site again? Uh, Yourlisten.com had a bunch of authority, right? But look how hampered it was. You know, th this is a site that has tons of authority, tons of links not performing anywhere near its potential because the on page is all screwed up and the amounts you know and this is something that applies not on huge levels like a big site like this but your small sites you can build a couple hundred links and an easy initiative and get absolutely no traction because everything's just messed up on your site and you know there's some really good things to look at in this article, if you know if you're having issues and you have what you think is decent domain authority or whatever you want to call it, page rank, could have some on-page issues that you're never going to get past if you don't pick them. BB's uh, commenting that Garrett was uh, delirious during the last uh, 24 hours of SEO. Um, I don't think I was much ahead, to be honest. Um, I made the mistake last time of getting up at 6 a.m. and doing a full day's work before the show because I thought I needed to get the uh, um, today, only slightly better, though, because uh, there was building work outside. Uh, they're building a new apartment tower outside where I am, and I, I was woken up at 8 o'clock. So I'm, I'm, I'll be two hours less delirious this year. Yeah, I think last year, what, my son was three months old, so pretty much getting no sleep then. And now it's not much better. He still wakes up three times a night, so yeah, whatever. I'd say it'll get better, but you get about 17 more years till it gets better. Same as the rest of us. <laughs> uh, I'm, uh, there, go ahead, man. No, I'm, I'm just uh, I'm hitting Reddit right now with uh, with our advertisement, so I'm just going to mute for a second. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, the last little bit of the news here um, on Twitter, someone had reached out to me, Nathan Morris. Um, on a TS question about you know buying age domains or whatever to take advantage of the page rank they still have, um, you know it's not something 
I'm super into. I've a few months ago we started up a travel related site. And the individual that we partnered up with it, you know, made a good point. Are there any websites, existing sites out there that are related to what we're doing that we can just buy right now where it makes sense to buy them because of their backlink profile versus waiting six months to build the links to just catch up with them and then, you know, not take advantage of the age that domain has, the authority it already has and stuff like that. Um, we were kind of looking purely at buying existing sites. Uh, we did look into some, you know, auction domain type stuff or, you know, I, I do see a lot of people talking about drop domains really carrying none of the existing weight. Um, but I, you know, I'm not super familiar with it. I'm sure people, I see people say they still have success with buying drop domains or expired domains um, and piggybacking off their existing authority. You know, what we were looking at was for a travel site, let's say in two years we want to have 800 referring domains. Um, and we found some decent sites that had some decent traffic. And let's say one of these sites had 150 links built to it. At our cost to build these links to the site, let's say you're an individual and you need to buy or build 150 links and you're going to pay $200 a link. That's going to cost you, what, $30,000? Is my math right? Yeah. That's going to cost you $30,000 to build those links. You know, it's an arbitrary number, obviously. Or, or in time, like um, Julie Joyce years ago worked out the average amount of time per link. Um, right. per link even if you're buying links because of the negotiating, the writing the article, the people that mess you, you know, all the stuff that happens was about four hours per link. So even if you're doing it yourself, you're still looking at, you know, X dollars plus... 600 hours of time and that's if you're buying the links obviously if you're doing natural outreach it might be six seven hours per link or more yeah um so but that's the kind of baseline is is a lot of time 600 hours you value your you value your time at say 50 bucks an hour you know it's, it's a lot of your time you're giving up yeah and uh, so what we did specifically was you know we would just export all the referring domains for a website we were interested in buying um, you know, let's say it had a total of 150 domains found on Ahrefs. Maybe 80 of those are actually links that you wanted or had the quality that I wanted. So then we'd say, okay, this site has 80 good links that we'd like. They're getting X amount of traffic. You know, those 80 links are going to cost us Y amount to build or the time, however you want to value it. Is this website worth buying for? Fifteen to twenty thousand dollars to give us a head start. Is this website owner even going to consider selling to us for fifteen or twenty thousand um, dollars? And you know, the biggest thing to us was, yeah, you know, that's kind of a large investment, fifteen twenty thousand dollars, but it's saving us six months' time or something. Um, it's, and you know, something important to us too was, you know, it's taking a lot longer you know, the practice that we use for sites to start sticking and get good traffic. I know there's a lot of guys out there that are ranking sites pretty quickly, but you know, we're really long-term thinking. We want sites to be around for five years, making tons of money and having a really good exit on them. Um, so we were valuing websites based off their links. Um, didn't really put much thought into how much the content was worth, you know, it is worth something, and that's the way we were looking at it. And that's why I was hoping someone out there was watching that has a lot more experience in searching expired domains or drop domains or buying websites for this purpose had some more feedback. But uh, I mean, we have got two old case studies from when, when we uh, tested it many years ago, um, and one of the way the way we did it um, was through a, a third party provider. Um, and what they did was they would they would um, pick up domains, um, I guess, in a similar way we did. They would find you know domains that were about to drop and pick them up before they dropped, and they'd keep them alive with some new content and then resell them to you. So, um, all right, if you picked it up as an actual drop domain, you might only be paying a hundred bucks for it. You're paying these guys like six hundred dollars or something, but it, there wasn't a drop. It was always indexed and it was uh, always continuing to to exist. And 
so we had two niches we tried this in and it kind of answers the question we got on twitter which was have you ever bought ones in a similar niche to what you're trying to launch put different content on and what happens well they both worked initially really well um one of them got penalized and the other one um we got screwed over by a business partner and we never ended up making the course but i'll give you the two examples and what happened one of them was in the uh stop smoking space um and we were just doing affiliate marketing for a shampix provider um shantix for those of you in america and so we bought a uh, drug related domain it was to do with stopping drugs and um, that kind of stuff um, some kind of charity or campaign organization that had gone out that had stopped their campaign given up or whatever um, you'll notice a couple of the big drug treatment providers do that kind of purchase as well and uh, rank really well so i would say that in this space it's still working really really well some of the top ranking um, sites in the space were formerly um, campaign sites to do with stopping using drugs um, so it was close enough we thought to stop smoking so we put the stop smoking content on there did built about 10 links just in there to the new pages directly and it ranked number one in the uk for um, cheap champix online by champix uk a whole bunch of slightly longer tail stuff and it was on page two for um champix in the uk to start with so that one worked really well um, made some good money. Two years later, it just disappeared completely. Google dropped it. Around the time Google started talking about trying to catch people doing this. The other one, um, we uh, a school in America, we were making an education site and a school in America didn't renew their domain. And this, this third party broker picked it up and put some school type content on it. And then we bought it from him, replaced it with um, content um, for, a phone repair training course and immediately for our six hundred dollar spend we were getting uh 400 email opt-ins a day from people interested in that it was good timing because that was just the thing uh, we were going to make a course we made we had a trial video made by the guy that we were working with to do it unfortunately he decided to not do it and keep all the film equipment and neither of us knowing how to repair a phone the remaining partners it kind of just ended up on the back burner. Um, but that one still ranked until we got rid of it. Um, I think we uh, gave it back to the school um, in exchange for a small charity donation or something like that. We just gave the domain back to them um, because it wasn't worth anything to us uh, anymore. But that one still ranked up to that point um, when we uh, gave it back. So I think Garrett's right that if they're dropped for a substantial period and you pick them up, the links aren't necessarily going to have any value. Um, but if you're able to pick domains up before they're dropped and replace the content, um, you and like I said, there are evidence, there is evidence in the wild, in real industries, of doing exactly what I did, and it's still working really well for them, and the sites are still ranking. Um, I think it still works, but I think you can't just pick up some random drop domain that has 100 links and expect a new site counts as if it has 100 links. I did, but Jason, you pick up some a $100 donation from Jason Berkowitz. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Jason. That's an amazing donation, um, especially during, as it's during the uh, non-educational part of the uh, show. Um, we're expecting more of the, uh, the $100 suggested donations to come in when the uh, proper speakers are on. So super appreciate it. Thank you. Jason's a buddy of mine, uh, met him through Traffic Think Tank, and, and we got to hang out over at Traffic Think Tank Live. Um, he's one of the sole New Yorkers that I know in this industry, uh, you know, off uh, offline. And uh, he runs a little agency himself. So uh, we appreciate that, but I will, uh, yeah. I don't know if he's still online right now, but uh, we'll get him on soon. Yeah, well, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll see you at Traffic Think Tank Live one year if, uh, if Nick is kind enough to move it out of the winter, because I'm used to being in England where we don't have winter and I'm not coming to Philadelphia in, in their winter. So if it stays in January, I will not be there. But if it uh, if it moves to maybe Florida in the spring or something, you know, that, that would be pretty cool. I'll come. 
So yeah, Jason's uh, agency is called Break the Web. So if you're uh, in New York and need a local agency, check out Break the Web. Cool. There you go. Cool, cool, cool. So we're through the news completely now, right? Yep, and we have an hour and a half to kill before Paul comes on. Well, we got a right. half an hour discussion of uh, conferences. I guess we'll let Vin start with oh, yeah. uh, Traffic Think Tank Live. How was that? Yeah, that was about, um, that was, when the hell was that? That was uh, late January. It was a great time, man. I, I'm, I really enjoyed these, uh, these one day uh, in and out conferences because it's a small core group of people that are all kind of focused around uh, the same mindset, I guess, uh, an approach to the digital marketing, uh, both with Traffic Think Tank and uh, Minnesota Search Summit, which I'm sure we'll talk about later. Um, but but great great presentations. The content was was the best I've seen uh, at an SEO conference in, in terms of value. That is something that you can actually take away and apply to your business uh, that day. And it was small enough uh, that you could really get one-on-one -on -one time with uh, some of the business owners and some of the speakers, uh, whereas something huge like you know traffic conversions, you might not even be able to shake hands with with a presenter. Um, at this one, we all got to have drinks afterwards with each other. We all got to uh, you know uh, talk shop throughout the day, and um, pretty much every presenter uh, I, I took away something from. Uh, whether it be something I can apply to my, my business or just something that got like my gears turning and, and got me thinking um, differently about something that, that uh, opened new opportunities for me. So uh, I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, and I, like I say, I definitely would have come if it was, uh, wasn't was in winter. So uh, please do it <laughs> so I can come. I don't mind flying over to... Uh, uh, John Wright, I was on the show a few months back now or maybe longer. Has comments about drop domains. He said, uh, regarding dropped links, I've bought many expired domains, but found many were not easy to rank and assume that if the domain was a recent drop, it had a chance to recover. Otherwise, the value is more in setting up a new site and having other people chase the site for a link given the backlink profile that you, know, you bought it for. Oh, yeah, loads of people make a lot of money buying um, drop domains. Um, they show up good on Ahrefs, Mars, and all that kind of thing as having a good metric. And then they sell links on those sites. Uh, if you remember the, um, I guess most of you, uh, I don't know if John does, I'm sure he does remember the My Blog Guest situation. Almost all of the sites on there that were doing link swaps with each other and that you could uh, pay the subscription to get your guaranteed links on the sites on there. Um, almost all of them were drop domains that had been repurposed um, just to be spam blogs. Um, and that obviously ended badly with a manual action, but up to that point, they seemed to be having some effect. So I, I think I'm not going to step on a, a future speaker's toes who knows much more about it than me who's going to be talking about uh, the PBM space. So I'll leave that to Joe Sinkwitz later. Um, but in just general terms, um, they you can still sell a lot of links to people that don't know any better on on sites that are drop domains and to some extent um some people are even having success with using those domains um still um but less so than in the past when you could just go like gangbusters and buy any old drop domain put some content on it and it would rank let alone anything else and you could 301 them to your site you could put links on them immediately after putting 10 random blog posts up it was super easy back in the day to use drop domains and Google has tightened up. So there's definitely some success being had by um, people more experienced in that side of things than me. Like I was happy to do it when it was easy money. Um, but obviously my main specialism has always been in other parts of marketing and um, link building now. So I never, when it got hard, I never continued to keep digging down the rabbit hole, but there's definitely people still having success around the edges with, and if you're just looking to get lots of sites to sell links to idiots on, then buying a whole load of drop domains is definitely a good idea because you'll sell lots of links to idiots on the strength of the backlink profile, as, as John points out. For sure. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't bother either, John. I mean, it, they, they, they stand out like a, a, a sore thumb, like they'll have some random, you'll have some random domain like 
Um, and it, it's clearly used to be someone's local business, like billsplumbing.com, and they've put on like about water or something, and they're selling links on it. I mean, they just stand out like a sore thumb. The domain doesn't seem to have enough to do with what it's become most of the time because they're usually done pretty shoddily. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, we I wouldn't bother. Uh, there's there's plenty of even if you're doing paid links, um, if you're patient and negotiate hard, um, there's plenty of places you can negotiate better deals than from those brokers that have a thousand of those crappy sites to sell you for thirty ducks each or whatever. So we don't bother either. Not that we do a lot of uh, paid links or anything. For some of our high risk projects, we definitely consider it, but most of the time we just do it the boring way. Lots of pitching and lots of uh, lots of outreach. So. Um, but definitely, uh, definitely better opportunities out there for money. Oh yeah, the archive.org check is is pretty hilarious sometimes. <laughs> yeah, we uh, we uh, we actually have um, we have our guys check if if a site's suspicious, even if we've picked it up naturally and we pitch them and the person seems real, we do have our guys have a quick look on archive if. If it just something doesn't smell right, like the domain just seems like a weird name for what it is, or like you say, it looks too much like a cookie cutter project. Um, and we found some pretty hilarious um, drops and previous content on sites that have been trying to get get us to work with them. So archive.org is is fantastic. Um, it's also good for catching out um, members of parliament and other. Uh, government types when they post uh, obnoxious things on their campaign websites, then take them down. Uh, but then when they get caught out by the press and archive.org, it's uh, often the intern's fault. It's amazing how many rogue interns there are out there in the, uh, in the world. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Anyone want to, uh, anyone want to jump on for a chat? I don't know if John wants to, since he's, uh, yeah, in the, uh, YouTube chat. More than welcome to jump on, John, if you want. Um, so where are we? Next week, I, I just uh, I just posted in uh, Reddit on big big SEO thanks to Paul, and I threw a uh, a post up in the Authority Hacker Pro group. So hopefully our our viewership starts to expand in the next couple of minutes. We'll see. Cool. Excellent. Well, we're doing we're doing well for the early hours before the uh, yeah. the big advertised speakers. I mean, we've got we've had twenty six to thirty watching solidly, which is uh, yeah. Every, everybody's at work right now, putting putting out their morning fires. So uh, hopefully, around lunchtime, we we start to uh, see it grow. But we appreciate all you that are that are here so far. So yeah, yeah I think we're through six k now. Um, yep. Should be comfortably, I think. Um, so yeah, yeah Gareth was going to say about months. where we're off to. Uh, so John Wright just put in hundred dollars. Thank you very much, sir. Much oh, thank you, John. That's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, we're well above yeah. last year's uh, total from uh, fifty six hundred. So yeah, good start to the day, guys. We're only a third the way there, though, guys. So let's not get complacent. <laughs> um, yeah. So back to conferences and stuff. Uh, next week, we're going to PupCon Miami. Um, the first PubCon we went to was last October, right, in Vegas? Um, yeah, it was a really good event. Yeah, it was fun. Um, as some of you may or may not know, we generally don't go to many or any of the presentations. Um, <laughs> Except PubCon, Travel and Think Tank Live. That, that was great, again. Um, PubCon was pretty good at putting together networking events compared to um, Let's see, where's some bad ones I've been to? Uh, Ungagged, those networking things were not very good. LeedsCon was not very good. Well, LeedsCon, uh, I think the um, the networking, it was a really good party. It just didn't attract LeedsCon the right LeedsCon was the one where uh, they wouldn't let us sit on tables, though, right? <laughs> and we just like commandeered the section. Uh, that was. Uh, or was that on gagged? That was on gagged. 
Oh, okay. All right. I got it. Next I'm gagged. I'm gagged with the pure terrible. No, Leeds Gov had the uh, the pretty good party um, with the up the upper deck bar and the out in the air in Vegas. Oh, right, right, right. Yep, yeah. Right. Um, the problem with Leeds Con was the presentations were. It was similar to the one I went to yesterday. I went to Marketing Show North, and I think these more general marketingy ones. Um, there's probably some great people there to meet, but they're they're in the wrong departments for SEOs to network with. They don't really understand. They, they're going on about things like scrub rate. Um, uh, yeah, I think I think um, if someone donated five hundred to make me dance, someone else would immediately to stop me. I uh, I have the moves of uh, a deranged moron, um, like with many things. So yeah, at least conscious had the wrong audience for us. The party was pretty good. If you're a hundred percent in the paid ad space and and that's or you know people in the, one of the niches that you're active in that are definitely going and there's a big crew of you going to be there, I think it would be a really good event. If you're just going to meet new people and it was a very strange event during the day. Uh, everyone was more obsessed with the uh, some weird basketball hoop game thing than they were with mingling or. Um, it was a strange event. I wouldn't recommend it for SEOs at all. There's nothing to learn there, and it was hard to meet the right people. And like I say, people just kept asking you really weird questions as a way of introducing themselves, um, which which I found to be strange. I, um, I run into that I'm, type of thing at, at, at all the bigger conferences. You you get guys that like obviously just read like how to pitch your business at a conference, and they're like obviously going down like. The, the checklist in their head about how to talk to you. And you're right, it's like the most awkward conversation possible. And well, I, I never, guy, I, I I never do business with people uh, like that. Trying to convince me that I should set up um, a, a, a nice spam email marketing campaign to all the heads of SEO and agency owners in the in the US. Um, and they would definitely, we definitely would get loads of business out of it. I was like, no, no, we would get my obnoxious email tweeted out by one of the SEOs mocking us for spamming them. So yeah, this is not the industry where you want to email all the heads of SEO agencies. Um, people uh, people don't appreciate that too much in our industry or respond <laughs> well to uh, cold emails. So I will not be, so don't worry guys, I will not be sending you an obnoxious email pitch anytime soon. If you want some links, you know where we are. So <laughs> give me a shout. Um, but yeah, are so. Are we going to do dinner next week? We could, yeah, we could. Um, is there any interest from anyone? Well, I guess anyone watching now or before um, we get to LeedsCon, if if you maybe send us a tweet um, at SD Brownlee, B R O W N L I E on Twitter, um, let me know if there's any interest for us doing one of our dinners. We normally do one every time in Vegas at PopCon Vegas or whatever event in Vegas. Scar always organizes the dinner. Um, but yeah, Vegas is more. Um, you know, we've always looked at sponsoring some of these conferences, and you really don't get much out of it as a sponsor, I don't think. And um, unless you're like one of the big ones spending 50 grand. So, what we've been doing the last few conferences is invite 10, 15 people out to a dinner. There's no sales or anything. It's just we all have dinner, we pick up the tab, we all talk, we all just network anyway see what we're all up to and people want to do business together great if not there's no sales pitches it's whatever it's just fun and i think that answers jeff's question what defines good versus bad networking what we liked about the pubcon networking was there was the main event and then it kind of went on to you know an after party kind of hanging out afterwards people and that's when all the business gets done is when people break down into smaller groups and start to socialize more when it's the big when it's just a really short big mob then everyone goes home um so popcorn had both to be fair the, the pre-event mixer was was really rough um luckily we did manage to meet some cool people and it was rough because they give they gave everybody one beer ticket each and <laughs> then <laughs> and we were then supposed to be there for two hours yeah, you weren't allowed to buy your own beers. So like they gave you one beer ticket, everybody just went through that within 15 minutes. And then the bartenders stood there behind a fully stocked bar for the other hour and a half. 
um, but we're not allowing anybody to pay cash money for beer. So it was really kind of awkward. Um, but to answer Jeff's question, and I think this kind of goes back to um, what we were talking about before is <coughs> good networking is just being around uh, people that you know are within your, your peer group, so to speak. And I think that's why PubCon uh, worked out for us so well is because we were just in a group of everybody kind of like the same level, the same wavelength as us. And we all we already had a, a base of understanding, so um, we were able to kind of get along right off the bat. Um, if you're going to go to a giant marketing conference and, and pitch yourself to somebody that's like way obviously outside your level, uh, I think it's going to be a little awkward and, and uh, you might not have too much success. Um, but you should be going to conferences where you know you know it's in your your sphere of influence and, and uh, there's a lot of like-minded people there because. Uh, you, you'll be able to make good connections that way. It definitely attracts the right audience um, for everyone because it also attracts a lot of big brands, in-house marketers, people that are uh, junior staff that are there to watch the presentations. Um, it, you know, whoever you were, PopCon had people there that you would want to meet. So we obviously quickly honed in on, like Vin said, people that we were having a good time with and talking shop not people that we thought we could sell to necessarily but through just being at the event with a nice crew having a good time other people come up to you and talk to you and we got quite a good bit of business out of pubcon um way more than ungagged ungagged was really new central like everyone was people were sitting down with and saying ideas and questions and stuff they were up to I was like, how long have you been in the industry? Five minutes? And obviously you're nice to them because you know maybe they had only been in the industry for five minutes, but it didn't attract the same caliber of guest, which was surprising because it used to. And the caliber of the speakers is often really, really good. They have some people that are really well known in the uh, black hat world come and speak and share good stuff, but it just didn't attract the same caliber of um, audience, the, the one that we went to in Vegas anyway. Um, Jeff says, give me an example of a strange question. Well, Garrett had some guy asking outside the hotel, hey, my name's Bill, how do you manage your scrub? <laughs> right up some yeah, so there like, you go. You know, it was like two in the morning, never met this guy, he was like drunk, smoking a cigarette, we were walking into the hotel and it's like, uh, one, I don't know what scrub rate is. I had to ask our, our friend, a friend of ours, and then I now now I know what what the guy was actually talking about. Two, if you don't know what scrub rate is, it's let's say you have, you have 100 leads. Your scrub rate is how many of them are in total dog shit, and you need, you can't even sell them. And so yeah, I was surprised that people. Are selling leads like you're buying leads, and then like 20% of them are no good. You can't even use them. I don't, I don't know. That's a whole other thing we can talk about later. But yeah, it's like weird stuff like that. And it's like, ah, oh, man. Like, it's like I, I, I think your networking for conferences really starts way before you even get there. It's like, you know, I chat. I'm in so many Facebook groups and Slack communities and message boards that I've got friends that I've talked to for years online, and I, I never actually got to meet them. In, in real life. Um, so, you know, you go to those conferences to solidify those relationships. I know uh, Robert Adler. I've known that guy for years and years and years, but I just met him for the first time in Vegas when we went to PubCon. And, uh, you know, just just doing that and, and uh, getting to know somebody face to face, it kind of just like releases any tension or, or um, any kind of concern about doing business with somebody because it just builds that trust. Um, so as far as networking, definitely participate in online communities first. Communities first. Uh, so when you get to the live conferences, you, ha you have a few buds that you can hang out with right away. Um, and it makes it just kind of that much easier. Yeah, and I think that goes, um, that kind of answers um, Jeff's question as well. I mean, good networking is the, the presence of a bunch of people that you already know at the conference. If the conference, like when we went to Ungagged, everyone was saying to us, well, what have you gone to Ungagged for? You should have come to PubCon a couple of weeks earlier. So we did PubCon the year afterwards. If everyone you know is, is there that you haven't necessarily met yet, 
um, or that you've met once a couple of years ago and you want to meet again, that that's a really good feature for the conference because it gives you a base to work on and actually getting some stuff done. Like, oh, I've met this guy now. I've met this lady now. Um, we, we can actually find out a little bit more about what each other are about because you've exchanged a few emails, a couple of orders in. You don't know what their challenges are, what things they like. You know, no one tells you that kind of stuff by email and you just kind of stay professional. Once you've met properly, you can actually start forming a friendship then over time. Um, you know, like uh, sure. Vin and I started our, our friendship uh, in a casino, <laughs> At the casino. In, a casino in, in Philadelphia. A good old heart. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, just gonna say quick, uh, an anonymous donation of a hundred and three dollars. Thank you very much. Awesome. Wow, thank, thank you, you. Mr. Anonymous. Um, yeah. But yeah, me and Steve were uh, met at a casino in Pennsylvania, and at that point, we weren't doing business together between our companies. I think we were just chatting because we uh, were both active in uh, on Builder Society, and I went in completely ready to party and completely not ready to talk about business and i think it really caught steve off guard but uh it worked out for us we're still hanging out two years later well, i wasn't i wasn't expecting you to talk about business so i'm glad you, <laughs> did. I'm glad you did <laughs> and i and i learned uh the red roll uh roulette <laughs> strategy which uh was quite popular when we were in vegas with everybody but uh i think i don't know if anybody walked away uh, with Mr. Hendrix. J. Paul Hendricks is the anonymous $103 donor. It was a hundred dollars for the kids and then a dollar bill for each of us, assuming it's that kind of dance. <laughs> I think Garrett was already the Garrett was already clear on the dancing, but uh, thank you very much, man. <laughs> so so a, a, Andrew from Raven Tools just chimed in. He says, I met all you guys at a casino as well. Uh, he's sensing a theme here. It's not a bad well, theme to have. A lot of these conferences are in Las Vegas. Um, so, I mean, what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Andrew will be uh, talking uh, on the uh, event later today. He's going to go through his uh, keyword research process. And um, it's very similar to how I do my keyword research. And it uses um, uh, a bunch of different tools that I know uh, everybody will have uh, some interest in. And, so um, what time is he coming on? Around six or seven tonight? Seven o'clock, yep. Seven o'clock, yep. So definitely chime in for that one if you're into keyword research. And uh, always red roll. Red, always red roll. <laughs> Except last trip, it did, it did not. I, I tell you, I tell you what, it's really funny. When I was like really, really poor, um, red always came in. Like uh, the number of nights out I've had, just crazy awesome nights out when I started with like fifty dollars and did a red roll is insane. Now that now that I have a proper job, I, I just walk out, put a hundred on red. The casino takes it, and I go back to the bar and play twenty dollars of video poker and cry into my drink. <laughs> in, in all honesty, I uh, I taught my family red roll on our casino oh, nice. cruise trip. So I had my my seventy year old mother and my wife uh, yelling red roll on the cruise ship, and everybody was staring at us like we were uh, crazy. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell my brother that he's gonna be super, uh, super <laughs> pleased with uh, the, the a tradition he started when we were both uh, like back in college and stuff and broke has uh, has spread to luxury cruises. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. But um, change of environment, man. See you later, Andrew. I'll talk to you uh, tonight, buddy. Talk to you tonight, Andrew. Looking forward to having you on the show. Um, but yeah, so I, I'm not going to be able to make uh, PubCon Miami this year. I'm uh, trying to focus a lot on on some internal growth stuff at Word Agents. So uh, I'm not going to be at that one, but I will be at Minnesota Search Summit. Yeah. And I think all of us will be there, right? Yeah, I, after you guys review last year, I'm definitely coming out. I'm all booked up. Yeah, it was a it was Probably a fun will. time last year for sure. We uh, it's another one of those one day conferences, just like Traffic Think Tank, and um, you know, just one day of lectures. That the the content there was pretty good, uh, but the people were great. I got to meet uh, Paul Shapiro for the first time. He'll be speaking today. Uh, John Cooper. Uh, the presenter of the event, Susan, she was uh, a lot of fun too. 
and again, it was just a, a great space to meet up with our peers and just to kind of bro down and hang out with uh, people we talk to online every day. Um, yeah, I mean, outside of setting. businessy stuff for a conference, that was probably like the most fun I've had at a conference. A lot of good people. It was put on very well. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they they actually just um, re opened up tickets, I think, two weeks ago. Uh, so we'll be there too. Uh, it, it's in it's in late June this year. Um, um, Jeff asked, "Do we typically find it's worth the expense?" I mean, yes, massively. Um, yeah, if we service didn't... providers, it might be different for someone selling, you know, like SEO consulting, like you are, because chances are everyone there, you know, does SEO. You're not going to be selling SEO to clients. Unless you, clients. yeah, yeah, unless you benefit from meeting um, in house. I guess if the bigger agency, like, well, if your typical clients are bigger and your clients are going to be there, like the in house heads of SEO and all those kind of people, like some of the people we were hanging out were the heads of the in house teams. And they obviously, they didn't buy our service, but they obviously do buy some services from outside. Um, some of their creative, I think they did outs outsource and things like that. So I think it just depends. I and mean, I think from a purely, if you're just going to learn, um, I doubt you'd have value in going to more than one a year and you'd want to pick wisely for what you wanted to learn. Like, uh, you know, one of Paul Shapiro's technical SEO events, but someone like myself would be what I'd go to if I was just trying to learn because I don't know anywhere near as much about that. Um, whereas, you know, go to something like Search Love to learn or something, it's going to be some, you're going to get 10 tips all day and then you're trying to work out whether it's really worth three grand for the hotel ticket and travel just to get 10 tips um, when you can, I mean, I guess you can buy the video packs for a lot of these conferences. So you can buy a couple of video packs for a pretty low investment and decide for yourself if you're going to get enough out of it. For us, it's worthwhile because we're going for the same reason people are spending thousands on booths and stuff because all of our target markets there. So for us, it's a huge ROI, but for other people, who knows? Um, and you're coming to Barcelona as well, Ben, aren't you? Affiliate World Europe. So looking into that one, I, I haven't booked the flight yet. Um, Get it booked before the flight goes, man. I found you the. Uh, I know, I know. It's a, it's a pricey the one. bargain of the year. I, I know I'm de definitely in for Minnesota Soda Summit, definitely in for uh, Brighton SEO in, in September, and definitely in for like um, like three or four weeks straight in Vegas uh, for Rhodium Weekend, uh, Ungagged, and PubCon Vegas. And then come back nice. from that and go straight to SMX East in New York, uh, hometown conference. Um, but still got to look into Barcelona because I'm just counting my pennies on that one. No, nah, no, nah, man. That's going to be the best one. Everyone, <laughs> everyone keeps telling us you got to go to these affiliate conferences in our space, man. So cool. Affiliate World Europe, Barcelona. But you know what? Uh, back to ROI, Jeff's question about ROI. Um, and Steve and Garrett's presentation, I know you guys are going to talk about uh, keeping costs low when traveling to these conferences. So I won't go into that. Um, but it's hard I, for Ben because he's uh, been spoiled by men. Like he used to be like, oh yeah, I fly economy everywhere. I don't need a seat. And I'm like, so what flights do you need to find for you for Barcelona? And he's like, I'm not going in. I'm not going in economy. Find me, find me some business class seats. So <laughs> Mint has ruined you with uh, JetBlue. Yeah, Jeff. Jeff, uh, Jeff asked your target market is, is SEO companies, and, and that's really what I was about to get at. Yeah. Um, as an uh, Jeff, I you, you run an agency, right? I, I believe you do or you work for an agency, you're not going to go and land your your clients at an SEO conference. What you're really trying to do is is just create relationships with other, your peers at the conference um, and other opportunities come out of that. You know, ju just from from my standpoint, I'm always seeing guys that I know and I'm like, you know, if the light bulb goes off. I'm like, oh, I've got a client for you. I've got a guy that you got to talk with. And that, that, leads to business uh, through a referral. And the same thing with me is like all, all the business that I pick up is from those, you know, late night, happy, you know, mix drink mixers and, and just talking with guys that own agencies or guys that own an SEO company or a tool company and uh, the opportunities to kind of, uh, you know, work their way out. Um, but if you're gonna go, if you wanna go after your target market as an agency, 
you really got to be going to those industry niche specific conferences um, that will have your target market. And you probably well, exactly look at look at what Gary Vaynerchuk does. So he's an advertising agency. He do, he does speak at some um, you know ad agency type conferences and stuff. But you see, if you look, he publishes his whole shed. Um, and you see him at tons of things like um, real estate agent um, conferences, um, you know, anything where people that use advertising services are at, he's there um, pushing Vayner Media there, uh, which is exactly what Vin's saying. You, you're going to get, you, you want to specialize in an area and be at the conferences where people from that area are there. So. Um, so Jeff does a lot of white label SEO for web designers. So ideal conferences for him are WordPress meetups and conferences that they're all over the place. Um, you know, there's, there's tons of opportunity there to meet those web designers at their conferences. You will meet very few web designers at, um, you know, on Gagged Vegas, for example. Yeah, yeah. And and you'd be surprised all those little meetups with that only you know if you go to meetup.com you see you type in you know web designers and see what's around you it's, it says like only ten people go fifteen people go you go to these and and you'll walk away with business so even if there's just like a small core group at, at these meetups um, they're valuable too so uh, you don't have to fool yourself into thinking that you need to go to these big conferences to to pull business you can go to your your local meetups and, and uh, and do quite well. Uh, Colin asked, what do you guys think about streaming and SEO digital marketing? I've been thinking about what I can do with it a lot recently. Not entirely sure if it's the future of things, but it is interesting. I don't know. I, I, the only streaming that we do is, is uh, the show here. Um, we do get some business through the show, but it, it's not a big vehicle uh, for us right now. It's more just an outlet for us to talk business, I think. Yeah. Do, yeah. Do I mean, you guys we, do? Go ahead. We definitely, we definitely get business from um, more recently, like the first six months, we no one really mentioned the show. Well, people would mention they'd seen the show, but no yeah, one had to your camera. Have I gone off? Yeah, we hear you, but the the camera on YouTube is is uh, is just a blank slate. Uh, it's probably because I'm uh, on Gmail. Let me try and get back to close back to the right. Cool, cool. We can still hear you. Am I back or not? No. Uh, not just yet. No. Let me try turning it off and on again. Cool. <laughs> Any joy? Oh, uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, there we go. Turn it off and on again, the solution to all of the world's problems. Um, what was I saying? Uh, you were answering about um, Oh, business, and, and yeah, that. yeah. Like, recently we've started to get where the percentage of the audience is new people is increased and, and we've had we've started to get leads through from the show where people are like oh i discovered you guys through the show just thought i'd reach out you know it's, it's early days yet for that it's not going to be a big percentage of our business at the end of the year but um because we enjoy doing the show but obviously if we do it for another year and don't get any business we'd probably start thinking about whether it's having the right impact uh we still do the 24 hours because obviously we have a really great impact on the charity, but um, it wouldn't be worth doing the show just to get an extra few few viewers on the charity event. We can just do more promotion for the charity event by itself. But it's starting to get business now, and, and a lot of people mention the show, and um, people have recognized us at conferences and come over for a chat because of the show that happened the first time at Brighton SEO last year. So yeah, it's, it's definitely definitely been good. And I think for someone like myself who kept a really low profile before and was getting a lot of business though from the small group of people who did know who the hell I was in sp very specific sectors where I was really well known, it's useful to just broaden it so people outside that circle know at least who we are and can find out a little bit about us and check us out before they do business with us. 
And we did find when we launched the show, loads of people who were new leads would watch an episode before they sent in their inquiry, just because we had the show linked on the website. So I think it's more interesting content for people to watch than your About Me page. Like a, a recent video you just did talking about something is, is much more interesting. And the show is a good way for us to always have fresh content or fresh things discussed without having to think, oh God, we're gonna make another video for the website. We just, every few months or whatever, we're not even that often, just swap out a couple of episodes for some other ones that we liked, put them on the website and people can watch those and, and they're fresh. So I think it's really good from that perspective as well. It's keeping putting content out about yourself without having to think about it or how do I do some content. And it's, yeah. And I, it's, so it's, I think it's got lots of wins. But both of our companies have so much going on right now. I know you guys are doing a lot. You have your your hands in a lot of buckets there. Uh, I've, got my, yeah. I've got my website. I've got Word Agents. I've got uh, you've got White a restaurant. Pen, a um, yeah, you're a so, restaurateur. <laughs> yeah, uh, we're opening up a restaurant soon. Um, so SEO Unmasked, we we got a lot of ideas, but it's more of like a slow burn, and we're just uh, happy to take it at, at whatever pace we can take it at, just because of how much else we got going on. But uh, as we move on, we got more and more subscribers, more and more followers, and I, I think we're learning what, what you guys um, like the most uh, as far as content-wise, uh, so we can continue to do more and more of, of what you like. Um, so we're just gonna grow it as it grows, and and if it brings some business in, great. Yeah, and some things we added just as a joke one week um, ended up being our most popular feature, like uh, two, Two recent new business inquiries we had both mentioned they loved the rand of the week segment. Um, <laughs> uh, it was just a joke, but now it's a weekly thing. And we didn't do it obviously on the, this charity one because we're trying to keep things in a in a positive, good spirited vibe for the charity event. But the rand of the week has become um, an extremely popular uh, segment. So watch the real SEO unmasked for uh, for some exposure to that part of the show. <laughs> <laughs> all right so um, we walked through so it's time through. time for me to talk about some charity stuff since we're oh uh, yeah go for it go for it um just share see if it'll let me share the link i don't know if that's worked uh hold on paste there we go so a sad more of a sad story this time um this is one that I, I found um, just recently, um, mainly because it covers one of the new therapies that they are working on at St. Jude's. Um, it's a, just a young girl who um, had gone through all the treatments that were available in the UK. Um, they weren't working and they had to go to America to one of the research hospitals for um, one of these new proton, proton therapies. And they thought that they'd thought that they'd beaten it, but um, sometimes, you know, even these new treatments, they don't work all the time while they're being developed. That's why St. Jude's needs more money to keep pushing them. Um, you know, a little girl has not even started her life properly. Um, her name was Sarah, and in the end, when they found out the cancer had come back and the doctors had said it was the end, she turned to her mother and said, I'm not ready to go yet, mum. Um, she wanted to go to a prom. She had little brothers that she wanted to grow up. You know, all the all these kind of things that we just take for granted while we're arguing about whether anchor text matters or what the latest Google updates are. Um, and the amazing thing about St. Jude's work is that they actually help stories like this one become less common. I mean, this is a sad, sad story of someone not getting to grow up because not even the new treatments were enough, but you only have to look back to the past where the same thing was happening and a particularly nasty form of childhood leukemia that virtually no hospital could treat. Um, research that St. Jude's was doing has led to that going from a 10% survival rate to the vast majority of children all around the world where that treatment's now used routinely by hospitals um, now survive. Um, and if you add it up over the time since the work was done at St. Jude's, it's an entire city's worth of families you could fill with and all of those families would have lost someone if it wasn't for the, the research that's being done at St. Jude's. And, uh, you know, the, the, the sad stories now remind you of how important the research is. So 
Um, while we're having a good time today, if, if any of you can chip in, Tan, if you're looking forward to your favorite speaker later and you can chip in $100 um, for the value of the conference, please do now. Um, show your support, help us raise more money, help St. Jude's keep these treatments going. Um, I mean, it must be a really hard place to work. I can't even imagine how their team feels day to day. Um, where stories like this one aren't just something you read in the newspaper that have bonded with this uh, little girl and got to know her and it's not worked out but I'm sure the thousands around the world that they end up saving as their revolutionary treatments become mainstream uh, make it all worthwhile and you can support the wonderful people there and the work they do today um, on behalf of our industry as a whole um, so please do chip in if you can. Yeah, every little bit helps. And uh, someone in the audience, uh, JYH, just uh, thanking us for, for doing it. And um, his son is a survivor. So congratulations to his, his son. And um, Thank you very much for supporting the show and being here on being here on YouTube, watching along with us. Yeah. So, uh, did we want to do any more conferences? I guess Brighton SEO we should cover off in the conferences section definitely before we wrap up. And um, that's one of my favorites. Yeah, you might as well tell everybody what you're up to with Ben, getting him there for next to nothing. Oh yes, yeah. We're uh, has someone got the link to my blog post to share, um, so people who are watching can can grab it. And, so um, is it on, is it on Steve Brownlee or marginally coherent? It's on it's on stevebrownlee.com. I think I linked to it from the homepage now. I think I remember to update the site before um, before the show. Um, so Vin wanted to come to Brighton SEO. Um, obviously, like he's already alluded to, he's trying to manage the budgets, and it was just possibly one too many. So we were looking at, because Garrett and I have been talking about it so much and all the points and miles game, we're looking at getting Vin to Brighton SEO in style, um, less than $1,250 in flights, but he wants to be in business class, hotel needs to be free, and then obviously Brighton SEO is only 150 quid. So a nice cheap conference, even though it's in a different country. Um, but I'm also gonna cover in the, in the blog posts and on the show, each week on SEO and Mars, we're just having 10 minutes on this until Ben gets, to, well, until he's all booked up and then we'll do a different feature segment. Um, I'm gonna also cover how you can get there almost for free, um, you know, just playing a few fuel surcharges and flying economy and things like that. So it's gonna cover, and that's probably something for Jeff as well, like if he wants to come to Brighton SEO, which is one of the biggest SEO conferences in the world, 150 quid for the conference ticket, virtually free for the flights using points and miles and then absolutely free for the hotel. Ben's already booked his hotel for free. Um, that's the kind of thing that's quite achievable. And you can take the same learnings that I'm going to be sharing in all these blog posts and get to conferences in the US even cheaper. The problem is, of course, the conference costs sometimes $900 to go to. And if you're getting to Brighton SEO for $300 in fuel duty, a free hotel and 150 quid for the conference, it's still cheaper to go to Brighton SEO even though the flights and stuff might be cheaper inside the US. Um, so we're going to be getting Vin over to uh, Brighton SEO. Yep, yep, yep. I'm excited. Almost, almost free. I, I hear there's a lot of fights at, at these conferences, so uh, looking forward to it. <laughs> um, uh, that happened once. <laughs> and it wasn't uh, I, I missed I'm... all the action. I was staying in the hotel when it all happened. And I met all the people involved afterwards. I was like, we literally left straight before all this straight straight before all this craziness happened, and then we were back in the hotel bar afterwards. So we missed an actual fight at the uh, Brighton Hilton Metropole, apparently. So, hey, we have a uh, Jay says uh, thank you for for sharing this. My son was fortunate fortunate. Oh, well, I, read, I, read, I, read, I read that one out. Oh, I'm sorry, hey, I jumped out. Cool, cool, cool. Well, thanks, Jay. That's awesome. So, where would Garrett go? Uh, probably just uh, I think we're two hours in. It could it could easily be his first. Yeah, tour. yeah, yeah. It's about that time. <laughs> I was about to do the same, but he beat me to it. <laughs> I'm talking to... about your Brighton SEO trip on me instead, so he could escape. So <laughs> <laughs> I 
I'm excited. I, I'm, what do, uh, we're staying at the, the Hilton. And yeah, it's right, Hilton Metropole. Not a bad hotel. I mean, Brighton does not, it has one swanky hotel, but last time we were there, it was a building site. So um, the Hilton's nice and dependable and clean and quiet and has a good bar. And yeah. the beauty of the Hilton is um, everyone who's going, like loads of us stay there. So there's just random, ex you don't have to worry about like, oh, how do we organize some networking when the parties aren't going on? Everyone's just hanging out in the Hilton. So yeah, obviously, obviously people fighting each other kind of uh, probably thinned the field a little bit last time. But, <laughs> and uh, and that, that goes back to some conference tips for, for you guys is, uh, this is something I learned last year. When I, um, last year was like my first big year going to all these conferences. And I was like spending big money on all these like swanky hotels. Um, it's completely unnecessary. You're you're barely in your hotel room at all. Uh, I, I think I went to bed at like one o'clock in the morning every night, and I was up by eight a.m. the next morning, and pretty much just uh, in the room to sleep and shower. Um, so just go for the best deal. Uh, go, go for um, a hotel chain that that you can use consistently. I know uh, Stephen Garrett like Hilton, and uh, I stayed there a few times, and it was very affordable. Um, nothing crazy fancy, but that's not what going to conferences is about. You're there to meet people and hang out. So uh, don't overspend on your hotel room. Well, the reason I like the Hilton is the consistency. I've had some bad experiences with Marriott, um, where the food's been terrible, the room service options have been brutal, and um, you know when you're getting back at one in the morning cooking room so we had a fifty dollar <coughs> excuse me fifty dollar donation from uh share the partner great awesome ah uh, thank you very much yeah thank you uh, we got a question about the medic updates but i guess we'll get to that straight after the uh so thanks for the question tal we'll get that get to that straight after that we finish on brighton seo because i think that's the last one we wanted to discuss unless you guys had anything else um so yeah, so we're getting been over there, points miles. Um, I'm gonna be doing and Garrett's gonna be doing some Garrett's got a site, Garrett on Life, where he's gonna be doing a lot of hard hitting reviews of things he doesn't like <laughs> in the travel world. Um, I'm gonna be sticking more to the uh analyzing prices, booking strategies, um, some of the stuff that we're gonna be sharing on our travel tips later. So we'll go a lot more into that later on with some specific examples of how you can book some flights in different ways that save money. Um Brighton SEO itself is fantastic because it's all about the parties and networking. So you fly in um, or you get the train down. First starts things off with unofficial networking at the Hilton. Um, there's a couple of unofficial dinners, which you might not go to the first year you go. I certainly didn't get invited to anything the first time I went, but everyone goes for dinner. Um, and there's probably like 50 different groups all going for dinner. So you'll meet some people in some of those groups and go for dinner. Um, then you go to the official party, which goes on till one, two in the morning. Um, and there's loads of people there. Everyone's mingling outside. Um, if the weather's nice in the smoking area, smoke outdoor patio area. So loads of opportunities to meet people and hang out there. So before you've even got to the first day of the conference, the pre-party, you've already met 50 new people or something, um, hung out with all your old friends. Um, then the main event, uh, they have some really good speakers. They had um, Rory Sutherland come and speak. Um, I think it does show a problem with the SEO industry that the best speaker at an SEO conference one year was someone from the advertising industry, but um, <laughs> Rory Sutherland is fantastic. So there are sometimes speakers I'll go and see. Um, during the day, the bars open all day. There's two separate bars, one of them sponsored, most often by Deep Crawl. And they they have like their free beer tent thing there as well. So you have, a, and then there's the other main bar um, where the after party is. Constantly through the day, if you're between lectures, you can go to the bar, have a beer, talk to some different people. There'll be unofficial wanderings to the waterfront if it's uh, a sunny day, so you can join those. It's just and there's some other unofficial, which I won't say where they are because I don't know if the people that organize them want me inviting people to their parties, but there's an unofficial all day pub session um, at a particular pub that a whole group of people go to. And there's loads of lunches for specific types of individuals. So I think there's 
um, you know, an agency owners lunch, you can put your name down there for. There's an upcoming women marketers lunch. There's, there's all kinds of specific lunches you can put your name down for, which is obviously a more organized sit down, have a meal network type thing. The whole event's designed to be uh, with networking in mind, which makes it a really fantastic conference to go to because that's the main thing we want to do is meet people and have a good time. And in two years, that will lead to business. We're playing the long game. We're not there walking around pitching people. And <coughs> some people we met, we never even told them what we did until the end. Like we've just finished chatting to this guy for two hours over some beers. And he's like, what do you guys even do? We're not there pitching it hard. We're there to make friends, um, meet people in the industry. And those the conferences with networking in mind are just much, much better. So um, Brighton SCRI, it's worth traveling from the US because the conference is 150 quid. If you fly economy, your flights will be less than the difference in price between that conference and the other conference. And Brighton SEO, you see in my blog post that um, was shared in the chat earlier, Brighton SEO did a graphic explaining the cost. But if you put the hotel cost in as well, which they didn't put in, the hotels in every major city in America are more expensive than the hotels in Brighton. So you're adding another $1,000 saved. So Brighton SEO will be one of the cheapest conferences you go to as well. Strongly recommend. Yeah, I can't wait. And uh, it'll actually be my first time flying overseas anywhere. Uh, wow. I was in, no, of course, I took a few, on the boat normally, aren't you? Yeah, I took a few cruises <laughs> for the first time last year uh, for a honeymoon. But this is uh, the, f the first actual trip across uh, across the pond. So uh, it's exciting for sure. So for for Tao's question, Tao Schlenks, uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Um, what's your three's consensus on the medic update? My medical site, written mainly from a personal perspective on a condition, got hit. Just wondering if you have any ideas for recovery. I will be right back, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, we um, talked about it on the show um, I you know it's a tough it is probably going to be tough to for some people to hear I guess but there is a part of the community that thinks the, the consensus of this part of the community it's about quality in a way that not necessarily about your content is of poor quality but you're using content to funnel people in a way to buy sales or to make sales and buy your product. Um, and I think that's what it had a lot to do with personally. Um, if we looked at some of the sites we've talked about in the past, kind of really thinnish, averageish content that was written specifically to get people from a search result to a product page, um, eventually through a funnel, versus content, like let's say you were searching for like, oh, what's something popular now, keto stuff, an informational page about keto that was average-ish average -ish quality on content. A lot of those sites did not get hit that weren't trying to funnel a user into a sales page somehow. Um, and there were, there was also, also theories about what the affiliate deals, um, Am and John, Steve's friend that's been around for a long time, made a big rant in the SEO signals group on Facebook about people don't understand how page rank goes through your site, especially no following affiliate links. If you have pages that have 10 affiliate links on them and you know follow all those links and you only have a few other links, you've lost Let's say you had 13 total contextual links, 10 of those are no follow affiliate links. You have decimated most of your page's uh, uh, page rank authority. All that link juice is gone effectively. Um, if you are in the SEO signals group, I, he does a way better job of what I just said, but uh, you can search for it. It was a really in-depth rant. So you, you still believe in, in link sculpting and the power of directing well, link juice to certain pages? Ultimately, I think it was a lot of stuff in Medic, a lot of small things that added up to a lot. But you know, sculpting link still happens. It it uh, 
we had a client about six months ago around this time. It was right before the official medic update was hardcore sculpting page rank. Nothing else around it. Like there was no way. That's the only reason he took a huge penalty. Um, and I think a lot of people got cut out on it and or maybe don't understand. I, I mean, how many people know why they are no following an affiliate link other than they've been told to no follow an affiliate link or something. And yeah, I, 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 I don't have too much to add, to add honestly. I, I, and I apologize just because I don't really enter um, those niches um, in anything that I do. <laughs> and I'm not a local SEO guy. Um, I do actually have, one dental client, and um, I, I forget the exact date that Medic hit. It was it was August, right? Somewhere around August, Garrett. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm looking at the uh, analytics now, and, and since August, it, it took off in in, uh, in terms of new traffic and traffic growth. Um, it looks like it got hit slightly by the January update, the early January update. Um, but we're right back to traffic levels um, as of uh, the Valentine's Day update. So, you know, but in my one my one experience, I, I wasn't hit by medic or had no issues with medic. Something well. to add to your point, I've also seen a lot of people, or I remember people were saying, you know, this might just be something that they're rolling out, not fully tested, didn't go as they expected. And if you look over the best couple months of people talking about it, a lot of people did absolutely nothing to fix their quote unquote issues that got hit by medic and recovered to back to where they were. I mean it took four or five months, but yeah I, mean, it, I think it's not just one answer in this update. It's not like a penguin which was links or panda with content or Miami is some general quality type thing. Maybe this is kind of general type quality where a few things got targeted. All at once. Um, and I think that's also a happened in spaces not just uh, medical related. There were quite a few business type sites hit, and other couple other industries along with it. So, I, I think that's a good point to make about any update. Is uh, a lot of times you just gotta sit and wait. Like for instance, I just mentioned I got I got hit by my my dental client got hit in the uh, early January update. I did nothing. And we're actually just right back to where we were, and then some, uh, just because it's a, it's a shakeup. Sometimes you got to wait up to 120 days, 90 to 120 days, just to get a, a real feel at, uh, for where you're at, and, and as far as rankings, and if it really was um, a penalty that you got hit by, or if it was just the, you know Google being Google. I know there's people out there that are able to isolate. Um, certain ranking factors really well when it comes to an update and, and they start uh, making adjustments right away. I think for most of us that don't have uh, the, the ability or capacity to test like that, um, right. I think it's okay to wait a couple months. Uh, it, might, it might hurt your pocket for a little bit, but in the long yeah. run, you don't want to start making all these changes as soon as uh, you see a dip, dip in traffic because you might actually be making it worse. Um, so the hardest thing to do is, is to do nothing, but a lot of times that's the best route to take. Because uh, you know we have a health-related site that gets decent traffic, and back in end of July into August, um, at the time we had zero sales pages on it, right? The site was not making any money other than we have, you know, like, naturally placed AdSense ads just for some revenue. You know, we're not overdoing it on ads. There are no sales pages. We're not selling any products, no affiliate, anything. Um, got a huge, massive boost. Was that because truly Google was going after people that were funneling to sales pages? I don't know. Was it just maybe a bunch of links got indexed? We had more page rank all of a sudden on that day. I don't know. You know, like Vince said, I don't have the time or the resources really to test this stuff. And I yeah, yeah, because other people say and uh, I, I made I made a point to say that because there's definitely guys out there like that are saying, oh, these guys don't know what they're talking about. You can do this, this, and this. Not everybody is that advanced, and not everybody has um, 
you know the resources yeah, to do that. My kind of full time stuff. job is to run, help run the link building company. My full time job is not to sit on Cora all day <laughs> and run reports. You know, I don't have that. I don't have the sixty hours a week to do that. Which is great if that's what you do. It's just I, I, I can't pretend to say I know everything about it. I don't, and uh, it just yeah. I just have yeah. to kind of take what's out there and try to make sense of it. Yeah, a lot of it's common sense too. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of it's common sense, and I think uh, people try to go by like a playbook from a course they read or or you know some forum post they read, and uh, they try to force that. They try to force those uh, ideas in, in, into their situation when a lot of times it's just you got to wait or, you know, just evaluate the situation with with uh, the information that you have at hand and and make the best common source, uh, common sense decision. And I think that, that idea is lost on a lot of SEOs. But, you know, for the most part, I like to wait about uh, 60 to 120 days anytime it looks like there's a penalty or any kind of hit and more often than not it recovers on its own and if it doesn't if I'm at like 90 days between 90 and 120 days I start looking at um, what can be changed to to uh, recoup those losses and get back on track yeah are you starting to get hit with business emails because uh, my inbox is yelling <laughs> I, at me. I, uh... They all get forwarded to Steve if they're coming off our website or something. So I don't know. Oh, okay. Uh, my, my grandmother and my aunt are taking my sister out to lunch right now, and they're going to be stopping up at the office to give me some money to make an, a donation for them. So they, they want to bring me lunch. So. And it looks like uh, Tao or Tao, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name, uh, made a donation of 25 bucks. Thank you very much. That's awesome. Every donation counts. You think we're gonna hit twenty grand today? Um, you know, hopefully it starts picking up once we actually have the uh, speakers ripping through stuff. But uh... I have another question: What's your favorite link building method? People say that the skyscraper method still works, but I know every time I get an email like that, it goes straight into the trash. Um, <clears throat> I don't think it's it's it would be uh, proper for me to to say any one method is is the best. Uh, I think it really depends on what you're trying to accomplish. It depends on the niche and vertical you're in. It depends on if it's your site or a client site. Um, I think you have to take all that into account. Um, skyscraper method still works. Uh, Garrett will be able to speak to that better than I can. But on the small link building campaigns that I do myself, I always have great results with that. Um, and you're right, a lot, uh, a lot of people are getting wise to the method and, and it's not as effective as it once was, but it's, <laughs> it's still pretty damn effective. Um, my two favorite uh, methods personally would be skyscraper and good old guest posting. Um, still works for me pretty well. How about you, Garrett? Well, my personal favorite is, you know, kind of related to skyscraper, but Coming up with an angle, uh, a good link bait. So I don't. First, the first, I think you got to you got to define link bait for the audience because I think it's very different. Well, link bait is something that um, is going to be one really easy to build links to because two, it's a piece of content that's not really out there. It's newsworthy, in my opinion. It's PR worthy. It's Awesome. And obviously, people are going to say it's they have different standards for link bait. So, like, let's say um, one we did a long time ago that I think oh, Steve's not here, but so whatever. But I'm pretty sure our NDAs are over. Um, yeah, it have to be. Uh, we were doing a lot of link building for a re drug and alcohol rehab facility, which I guess you know a lot of you people know is it's kind of tough to do link building. In that industry. Um, so how are you going to come up with a link bait that's going to, and you're doing outreach for, that people aren't just going to put in their trash folder, like you say, just delete the email. You know, you get tons of them every day. So the angle we came up for one of them was um, overcoming, or the, overcoming the e ecological effects of our everyday addictions. 
like coffee or you know stuff that a lot of us drink every day we, we're not necessarily what do we say addicted to them but you know the daily parts of our lives that are somewhat hard on the um on the earth you know growing the coffee and all that stuff i can't remember all the other ones that were in there now but you know coming up with this great link bait that's not just going on google seeing what other people have written about made it a little bit better and then outreaching um you know i, I think skyscraper still works it's a lot it's a hell of a lot harder than it was five years ago because no one was doing outreach now everybody and their brother is really doing outreach right and if you really think that in my opinion, taking the five best articles for a query, you know, after your Google result, rewriting that content and making it in quotation marks better. I, I think you have a lot more work cut out for you than trying to find a really unique angle that no one's really talking about. And then you start doing outreach for an awesome topic like this, it's so much easier. And the links you're going to get are so much better, in my opinion. So. Yeah. So and and I think favorite. I think a lot of times um, with link building, you really just got to do your own work and create your own strategies by really looking at how um, your, your niche builds links for the vertical. Uh, I know Steve Steve did a great presentation or a blog post on uh, determining how many links you need every month to keep up with the competition. Um, I think that plays into it, and I think that uh, different link types work better for different um, verticals. So you're not going to know that sure. uh, unless you dig into your competition and have a very solid understanding of, <clears throat> of what your competition is doing. And then you go ahead and you make a strategy uh, that's a little bit better or more effective than what they're doing. So you can beat them at their, at their, their own game because you know those links are what's working for them. Um, so again, Robbie Richards, he's like my favorite new blog that I found this year. He put out a, a really good uh, post on, on this, and, and I'll share that in the chat shortly. Let me see here. Yeah, and mine is on, if you go on stevebrownlee.com, which is linked just a little bit higher in the chat. Um, I've got the link to the uh, Brown Builders article about analyzing your competitors' links, et cetera, at the bottom somewhere. And there's only a couple of things linked there, though, so you'll see it easy enough. Yeah. Um, ba -ba -ba. I'll find it later. I'm making notes of everything I have to share, so it'll come out in, at one point or another. So uh, about 20, 28 minutes until our first presenter, we got Paul Shapiro up first. And uh, I've actually seen the presentation he's going to do. And if you're into data analysis and technical SEO, you're going to like this one. He's going to do an introduction to APIs and how you can use um, the APIs from third-party SEO tools uh, to build a, your own internal tool that kind of layers on top of all the data that you can pull from these tools. Uh, so that's coming up in about 20 minutes. Um, like you guys were talking about, uh, you know, really personalized outreach. Definitely a great way to get links. Um, you know, something Steve and I have fought though over the years is you can build 30 something, whatever the number is, how many links a month doing really personalized outreach. Um, if you start talking building links in the numbers of 500, 600, 1,000 a month while maintaining that quality, you know, I'd, we've never figured out a way to maintain that quality and still stay, stay personally personal and um, all that fun stuff. You know, how, how do you, there's not a lot of ways to scale it other than hiring a bunch more people and repeating that process, which gets really, really expensive all of a sudden. Um, but I guess you know, it really depends on the links you need to build. If you're just building them for a few sites, yeah, perfect. But, uh... Hey, Gary, can you update the show notes to uh, so it says that all times are CST? I don't know. Did you write that? Uh, no, I will do that now. Cool. 
Uh, Nick Rizzo says, scale is the problem for sure. We try to build highly linkable assets, build links to get them the rank, and then allow them to accumulate their own links monthly. Yeah, I, th I think that is a point that's lost on a lot of people is <clears throat> when you're building your linkable asset, um, it's going to, you're building it not just for the links that you're going to point to it, you're building it to get natural links too. And uh, I, I think that's probably the strongest um, point to make when it comes to putting a lot of effort into your content and your linkable assets, because not only once you know once your your link campaign is over, the the links that you're going to build yourself, um, that content has a lot of potential to to get it, its own natural links over time. So yeah, the, it, it all starts with the content and. Uh, you know, if your content's no good, your your, your link campaign's not going to be much better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and we've had that happen a few times. I mean, even the we spoke earlier about the dodgy stop smoking site. Um, I put a stop smoking timeline on there. Um, looked semi pretty um, with an embed thing, so people can embed it on their sites. Um, did a little bit of outreach for it. Built probably five links ourselves. Like I spent half a day on it or something. Um, and it ranked, because obviously everything was ranking on that dodgy site at the time. And loads of people just kept embedding it and picking it up themselves. Um, we had it happen with an etiquette guide we did for a manufacturer. Um, they, the budget with them was enough for about six links a month. Um, but the etiquette guide was picking up another six by itself once it ranked every month. So getting double their bang for the buck because it was all just random people arguing about it, embedding it in their blog post to debate, all that kind of stuff. So you can have some lucky hits on that stuff. And I think the key is just not to worry about it, like whether it's going to work or not. Like I'm not saying become like these big agencies that present at conferences and everything's either it's going to be in the press or it's a failure and we spend another $20,000 on the next one and it'll either blow up or we bin it. Build stuff that you can build your links to, grinding them out, buying your links, whatever it is you're doing. But try and just have some ideas that you think, oh, you know what? If that ranked, people would link to it. Yeah. Because uh, some of them you will have wins on. And if you put no thought into all of them, then none of them will get any free links. If you just have it as an afterthought and think, what could I do to just make this so that if it did rank, there's an easy thing or people can do to link to it? Like, is there something they could embed? Is there something? they could talk about? Is there something about it that's going to make it easier for people to want to share it? Um, and if you just throw those elements onto a few pieces and one of them gets lucky, you could get a couple of thousand dollars worth of extra links for no effort by the end of the year. Um, it's just worth thinking about whenever you put one of your ideas together. If, if you, think, like you think about it like uh, the, the link efforts that you're, that you're putting in, the links that you're building manually, that's like the uh, the entry ticket to getting eyes on it to get those natural links, right? So you're gonna get it up to the first or second page, but then what? You know, that's really when uh, <clears throat> the proof is. You know, uh, that that's when you're really gonna be the content's gonna be tested to see if uh, it's gonna require all those uh, natural links. So you don't want to really be spending your time or money um, spending so much on on every page to get it to spot number one, you want it to get onto the first page and then have your content be strong enough that you're going to get those natural links to help boost you the rest of the way, hopefully in a perfect world. just want to say uh, thank you, Brennan, for the $50 donation. Much appreciated. Oh, thank you. That's amazing. Keep in Thanks, Brennan. Yeah, we, I, love we, the ones, I love the ones during the hour where people are kind enough to donate while we're just talking and stuff. It's uh, keeps you going and we haven't even had to uh, remind anyone so we really appreciate those ones just come in in the flow thank you very much man and hopefully we're pro providing you guys uh enough value to to make those donations worthwhile um i know we're we're just chatting away here but pretty soon we'll we'll have some pretty focused presentations by some pretty smart people so uh, your money is going to be worth it and we all appreciate it well, it's going to be worth it anyway because it's going to St. Jude's. I mean, all the speakers could not show up or suck now, and the money's yeah. still going to be worth it. So. 
But I mean, almost all the speakers, I mean, I think that's one thing to make clear to all of you guys watching. Um, this isn't like a, um, you know, charity pop concert where all these famous prima donnas come along and say, oh, I'll support it. But they don't play any of their greatest hits. They just, they've, they've turned up because they know 3 million people are going to watch them perform their crappy new album that no one's buying. And they're going to get to plug their album. They don't give any of their own money. They don't really give anything. They're just using it to promote themselves. The speakers have, have universally donated. Some of the company speakers have donated hundreds of dollars as well as giving up their time to be here. So everyone's really all in this year with supporting the event and supporting the charity. And I just want to say a huge thank you to all the companies and speakers that have supported this year. It, it's been amazing. Last year we had some great support considering it was our first year. Um, you know, and a special thanks to Ellie and Clearlink last year because they made a big difference to our, our total and our efforts last year, both securing extra speakers and supporting it as the sponsor. This year, obviously, huge thanks to the flagship sponsor, Word Agents particularly, but all the companies and speakers that sponsored this year, and we'll be giving them shouts out throughout the day, um, uh, especially uh, the first man down on the list virtually every year is uh, Mr. Nick Eubanks. Um, huge thank you to him because obviously his support in the first year um was 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 really huge for the event and the people that he brought along and the attention he attracted and he was uh first person back on the list and himself and people that work with him have all been instrumental in some of the early fundraising as well so he's my first uh big shout out to nick eubanks um it's made a big difference to this event and how much money we've raised the support he's given especially last year when um he was in the middle of all that crazy stuff and he still turned up with a shoe on his head to raise an extra 500 for charity so <laughs> yeah and, um, and we still get a lot of questions about his presentation uh his TN i think it was the most popular in the end wasn't it yeah you know the, you nick, nick is wild man he, he's, he's still a young young guy and uh and he's got a lot of businesses going on i i, I don't know where he uh finds the time to create new strategies like he did with the top or ex expand on existing strategies like he did with the topic modeling video. But, uh, you know, high hopes for today's presentation and no pressure, Nick. Yeah, yeah no pressure, Nick. But, um, you, were the, <laughs> you were the most popular last year, Justin. Well, the secret is he doesn't have kids yet, so then you have no excuse either. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you should, yeah, be, yeah. You, should be as, you should be as mercurial and dynamic as Mr. Nick Young. <laughs> your free and easy lifestyle. Well, you know what? I'm giving away uh, the blueprint for hiring and managing content writers tonight. So hopefully uh, you guys find some value from that. I know not everybody wants to uh, uh, shell out some money to word agents to for us to manage your writers for you, but uh, we're going to show you how you can do it on your own. So I'm doing that at 1 a.m. Central Standard Time tonight or tomorrow morning, however you want to put it. So one day. I've got the shakes now from drinking too much coffee, and yeah, I've just drunk another two double espressos. <laughs> oh man! Uh, so every morning I wake up and I, I fill my coffee mug up with espresso, and I sit and sip on that for about until lunch. But today, my wife went out and got me a bunch of Red Bulls, so <laughs> I will be zooming all day. I think I may have ever done it already, and it's not six p.m. here yet. Um, <laughs> I'm a little bit worried. I'm going to have to just uh, switch to alcohol a little bit earlier than planned this year because if I keep drinking coffee, I got pretty ill from the coffee last year. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I guess I, I, I'll i put my alcohol uh, time at like 8 p.m. tonight after after my break, come back, what's have that, a few beers. What's that, 8, 2 a.m. my time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I shall... Uh, I shall phone down to room service at about half past 12, knowing this hotel, because that's how long it'll take to turn up. We got Megan Mars in the house, another coffee drinker. Hey, Ooh. Megan. <laughs> All right, let's check our donation. Yeah, three, three cups before 1 p.m. is pretty easy going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think we all drink too much coffee in this industry, but what can we do? Yeah, I got, I got to switch over to like green tea or something just for the sake of my teeth. Freaking yeah, coffee stains are no good. Minus stains the hell from coffee. 
Cool, cool, cool. Uh, anything you guys want to go over before we uh, jump into our first presenter? Let me see if we can get Paul and make sure he's ready. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess let's uh, do a rundown of the uh, uh, schedule or something. Do you want to do that, maybe, Gary? Or... Oh, yeah, I don't know if I can. Yeah, so in 15 minutes at noon Central Center time, we'll have Paul Shapiro talking about introduction to APIs and how you can use them to automate your SEO practices. Uh, after that, Jeff Coyle Mark from Market News, um, how to build content plans and improve site authority with user intent. Um, at 2 o'clock Central Time will be Nick Eubanks. From, uh, he's going to be representing his uh, seven-figure agency program. How to set up an agency to scale from ten dollars to $20,000 a month in billings to $80,000 a month in revenue in 12 months. Um, following him will be Oliver Whitham from uh, WP Engine. Not sure exactly what he'll be speaking about, but I'm sure it'll be great. Um, Joe Sinkwitz is coming on at 4 o'clock Central Time. Intellifluence, he's going to be talking about mapping out uh, artificial influencer marketing type stuff, I believe. It involved the word PBM, so I think it's going okay. to be his usual, uh, his usual pretty on, interesting. The edge, on the edge of the envelope. From uh, he did, he did using influencers as paid link last year. So I'm sure on a similar vein, he's going to be uh, on the edge of the envelope. With some cool tips. So I'm looking forward to that one. Yeah, five central of top of small from FE International. Um, six o'clock, we're going to do another gap period audience interaction Q and A. Andrew Ansley is coming on at seven for keyword process or uh, excuse me, keyword research. Um, Gregory Elfrink at eight o'clock from Empire Flippers, acquiring, automating, and scaling digital assets. Nine o'clock and ten o'clock we'll have a break. Eleven o'clock, Jared Hobbs, who joined us last year, is coming back for site speed optimization. Ben's going to be on at midnight. I think Jeff Jarrett's one is going to be uh, really cool because he gets um, like he uses all, all kinds of techniques, and like I tend to think my site's loading pretty decently fast if it's down to like 0.4 seconds, um, and you know I'll tolerate one and a half seconds if it's a quick build. We're just looking to make a small amount of money from and sell in a few years. It's um, down to some insanely low numbers. Yeah. You, you're going to be like thinking he's mad when he starts telling you how quick he gets some of his pages. So it's going to be you, a good one. You know when you run the, the page speed insight report and like you, can, you always get that negative uh, grade on uh, first time to paint or first paint time or whatever it is. It's all, On every site I, I ran, it's always like I can never get it up to speed or what, you know, because it's something built in the WordPress that just doesn't al allow you to, to fix that. Jared fixed that for me. And um, so my, my pitch score is like 95 or something like that right now. And I actually did see an increase in rankings within two weeks uh, from when we we implemented that. So I'm sure he's going to talk about that. So I, I would definitely tune in. Cool. Yeah. And then Vin's up at midnight building and managing a team of freelance writers. Steve and I are going to be doing a segment, business travel hacks for SEOs. Um, it should be interesting. And then. We'll have a couple hours, it looks like, of no speakers. So if anyone wants to come on overnight or, you know, if you're over in Europe, that'll be early morning for you. Love to shoot the shit. Or if you're in Aussie land or Eastern Asia, I guess, you know, that's kind of afternoon, isn't it? Or maybe early evening. Yeah. And guys, if, uh, if you know anybody, any newbies or anybody that might want to jump on, <clears throat> we'll answer questions live. If you guys want to do a live site audit, we'll do that live. Um, you know, I don't know if you want to reveal anything like that, but uh, we're here to help. So it's not just a presentation thing. We want to be interactive with you. And uh, if you guys are stuck on anything, we can try to help you out. And if we can help you out, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll reach out to the audience and see if we can all figure it out together. Yeah, so if you are a night owl and you want to jump on, um, just let us know throughout the day. It would be awesome to have some of you on for a chat. Um, we're going to keep trying to bully you to come on and join us for a chat all day. Um, last year, we just had a bunch of speakers couldn't make it at the last minute. We, we filled all the slots and people kept wanting to come on all day. So this year, we've got slightly less speakers than a couple of gaps in when, you know, the speakers didn't appreciate the time slots, but they were kind enough to do it anyway last year. This year, we've deliberately, you know, not 
tried to force people into really difficult time slots and no one's volunteering to come on this year and we've actually got slots so uh, <laughs> yeah help us out here now and help us uh join with the we can even do SEO story hour again like we did last year where people came on and told us crazy stories maybe we can have, maybe we can do a rant of the year <laughs> oh boy! Uh, uh, yeah, honestly, we will be so tired um, for some of those overnight slots. If no one comes on, I will do round of the year. And uh, judging by Vin's timeline, we will be drinking by then. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's your own fault. Come join us and talk about sensible things instead, and tell us some of your cool SEO stories. Hey, Mr. Adler, there he is. There he is. You want to talk to Uncle Vin? <laughs> the future hey, of SEO right there. The future of never becoming an SEO if he's more sensible than us. Hey, dude. <laughs> Birdman, I'm a content writer who's been up for 24 hours finishing orders. Hey, Since I'm about to slip into a coma, is there any chance I can watch this stream after the fact? Birdman, yeah. I don't know if you're one of my content writers, but... If you are, I did not expect you to be up for 24 hours finishing orders. But yeah, you can um, go to 24hoursofseo.com and just uh, enter your name and email address, and you'll get an email in a week or two uh, with first access to the video the video downloads. And you eventually we'll get them up onto you'll the also, YouTube channel. You'll also instantly get access to all of last year's um, recordings as well, and last year's slide decks. Um, most of the speakers this year will also, no doubt, be kind enough to share their slide decks after the fact. So you'll be able to uh, check those out then as well. No mm. problem. And yes, SEO interns are getting younger all the time. They sure are. Well, as they said on the Untouchables, if you don't want a rotten apple, you pick one from the tree. So uh, all these, all these dodgy black hats and uh, stuff floating around. You know, we uh, we hire. You know before they even go to school now to make sure they uh, learn SEO the right way. That was actually a topic I was thinking about doing for this, um, how to leverage uh, an internship program for your business, uh, you know, to basically get inexpensive labor while also helping young kids. Did an SEO agency do that? What's that? An, an SEO agency did the SEO apprentice or something. I don't know which agency it was now. Oh, Maybe yeah. Google it and see if it comes up. But. Well, I know that um, Spencer at Niche Pursuits ha always has uh, like a little intern or, or like a, an apprentice um, that he does. <clears throat> but um, I, I'm talking about mo like more of like a formalized program at your company where you can reach out to local universities and, and have a study flow of interns <coughs> every semester um, to help them get the job experience that they need and also to help your business out on, you know, tasks that you might now not want to spend uh too much money on yeah i looked into it in the uk um apparently apprentices have to have an office to go to they can't work from home so distributed companies can't have apprentices so that was super useless yeah i'm gonna look into it over here because i i am considering getting an office just because we're getting a little too big to be uh so spread out so uh, once that happens, we might have a, a few interns helping us out a little bit. Mm -hmm. Cool. You could do you could do interns as a service, like you hire the interns and then <laughs> and, and, and about the interns. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I I don't know about the legality of that, but uh, I'll spend no, that's a little that sounds fine. Um, so if you reach out to Vincent at wordagents.com <laughs> in the email title free interns stroke slaves he'll take care of you yeah 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 all right so i hit up paul he's going to be on shortly and uh we're going to get underway here it's been a fun start to the day so far i'm definitely uh happy with the turnout oh yeah it's been really good thank you all for joining us in the chat um it makes it a lot more fun when we're getting questions coming in constantly because it gives us topics to talk about. It, and it reminds us of stuff we wouldn't have spoken about. Like we wouldn't have spoken about those two old sites that we tried putting new content on old domains and stuff if someone hadn't asked about it. So there's so much stuff we've done over the years. It's kind of cool if you remind us and uh, brings it back up for discussion then. So we have some pretty cool talks. Um, yes. I got 
Go ahead, man. Oh, did you just sorry, short I, out? There you yeah, go. yeah, sorry, I, I cut off there. Um, so yeah, just before we get into Paul, um, obviously he's the first of our, our key, keynote speakers. So I want to feature speakers instead of just up, uh, chatting and answering questions. Um, please do try and support him with a donation. Um, he's obviously given up his time. He uh, gives this kind of presentation at conferences that people have paid money to go to and stuff. Asked to all the speakers today. Um, support him with a little donation. Um, if you're going to professionally benefit thousands and thousands of dollars from this, please try and chip in $100 or something. Help support the charity and uh, make it worth Paul's time sharing all this amazing knowledge. Uh, I will now be quiet and uh, we'll introduce the speaker. Yeah, hey, Paul. <laughs> there he is. What's up, buddy? We can't, I, I don't think I can hear you, Paul. You might have to unmute yourself. There we go. You hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes. Yep. There we go. Hey, Paul, welcome. Hey, everyone. Second year in a row. Yeah, it's a good cause. Thanks, man. Hey, thanks yeah. for your donation, too. I appreciate it, dude. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So you're going to be our guinea pig using uh, Google Hangouts to do this and uh, the screen share. Uh, is that immediately obvious how to, how to do that to you? There is a screen share button. Mm -hmm. Cool. Click Look there. how complicated that is. Yeah. <laughs> Click share. Let's see. Oh. Hi. There's some inception <laughs> going on. That I'm working? just going to put myself on mute to. Uh, yeah, we'll, there, have to, we'll have to mute ourselves now so that you can start. And then I guess if you try and um, we're getting quite a lot of questions. So I guess try and leave 10 minutes or so at least at the end so we can have some of the questions get answered and things like that. And, Give a shout out to people that donate during your presentation yeah. and so on. So yeah, thank you, right, everybody. Everyone, everyone can see it all right. Okay. I'm assuming yes. All right, everyone. How's it going? Going to talk to you about the idea of APIs and how you can leverage them for SEO and other forms of marketing. Um, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Paul Shapiro. I'm the head of SEO at Catalyst, we're an agency uh, owned by Group M, and we focus on uh, search, uh, SEO, PPC, social media, marketing, paid social, um, right out of Boston. It snowed earlier today, so it's, it's, uh, it's chilly up here. Um, again, this is for a good cause. I just want to encourage people to consider donating. Um, you know, St. Jude's is, is, is a great organization. Um, and it's you know you know 100 bucks, 50 bucks, 10 bucks, whatever you can give, um, it's it's definitely appreciated. All right, I don't know how many people in the audience are familiar with this image. Um, this is you know the Mars rover. This is from the Mars Pathfinder mission back in the 90s. Um, it was sort of like a, a big deal in my household. My family was super into this this Mars mission. Um, almost to a fault. Uh, we had pictures of, of Mars coming, uh, hanging on our walls. It was sort of a big deal. The Mars rover was was sending back images, and you were really seeing Mars in in a way that you weren't seeing it before. And my my father was super into this. He hung pictures up. There was more pictures up of Mars uh, than there was of of I think our family. <laughs> um, and as a result, my 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 parents, my dad. Used to, used to teach me about the mission. I was a young kid, maybe five or six years old. Uh, and, and he used to tell me about all different aspects of the mission. Uh, the Mars rover, the Sojourner rover, had you know, various instruments on it, um, different, set, you, know, you know, the research that they were setting us uh, forth to do on Mars. Uh, one of those instruments, uh, I used to go to class and say it over and over again. Uh, and I was, Alpha proton X-ray spectrometer. Uh, I thought I was so cool saying this big word that I barely knew the meaning of. Um, it, it, it just, I, I was hearing it at home and, and I, I thought it was cool for, for using a big word. Uh, so when you hear the word APIs, I want you to avoid what I was actually doing. And what I was actually doing was I was initiating term vomit. Uh, I heard a, a big fancy word 
uh, it sounded cool in, in the context of my conversation um, without really understanding the meaning. Uh, I want you to come away from this presentation and understand what an API is, how it can be applied to you, your business, um, your work, um, and not just being a six-year-old kid initiating, uh, you know, undergoing term vomit. So brings us to the point. So what, what is an API? Um, and in the context of this presentation, we're actually talking about RESTful web APIs. There are some other types of APIs, but uh, the RESTful web APIs are the more applicable type of API. Um, and, and usually what people are referring to um, when, they, when they talk about an API. Uh, so, so what is an API? First of all, an API is an acronym. It stands for applica uh, Application Programming Interface. Cool, sounds a bit like term vomit. Uh, so <laughs> what this actually distills down to is this concept. So APIs provide you a way to interface with external web services. Uh, so what does that mean? This enables you to do things like automation, incorporate other third-party systems into your own application, your own services, um, and you can sort of mutually benefit. So you can uh, expand your system, and then you could you send data data back to their system and sort of enhance um, the usage of that tool, that, that web interface on, on their end. So how does this work exactly? Uh, let's take a step back, sort of um, have an understanding of how you know, the web actually functions. Um, these guys on the left represent typical web users uh, on their computer. They're connected to the internet. And they're accessing a server. Every time you go to a website, you're accessing a server. A server is essentially another computer on the same network as all these people. This big network we call the internet, the World Wide Web. So they're connected to the server. So, um, and these are a series of requests going back over the HTTP protocol. Uh, so they go to a website that's sending a request from the server. It's getting returned a response. They're seeing the website. Uh, they post a form, um, they're sending data to that server, and the server gives some sort of response. Now, this is sort of facilitated uh, via this concept called CRUD. So CRUD is a, another great acronym. Uh, stands for Create, Read, Update, Delete. And th this just, I think, makes a lot of intuitive sense. Um, you know, you know, you're, you're dealing with data essentially, so you're either creating data, you're reading data, you're updating existing data, or you're deleting existing data. Um, and this is applicable in, in a world of uh, where, there's, where there's databases, this is applicable um, in a world of, of websites that have their own systems um, and with web, RESTful web services. Now these CRUD operations are facilitated uh, via what are called methods. Uh, so it's just a way of, you know, interacting essentially. Sometimes they're referred to as verbs, um, and these these operations are being facilitated by uh, these verbs. Uh, and this will make a little bit more sense when we we go through a few examples. Uh, so, get and post. Get and post are probably the most commonly used um, methods or verbs uh, with web APIs. And uh, just to conceptualize the get method, at least every time you visit a website. You put a URL into your browser, you put google.com into your browser, you're using the get method or verb. Uh, so you're, you're reading data, that's the, the CRUD operation, read, um, and it's being facilitated via the get method. So you put google.com into your browser, it reads the Google's response back to you. And that is actually an example of a web API. So. We just covered get, it's used to request data from a specified resource, in that case, uh, a website via server. Um, post is the other really common one, <coughs> which is unlike get, it's actually being used to send data to a server to either create or update a resource. Um, there's, these are two other ones that are a little less common than the others, but also really important. Put is used to send data to a server, create or update a resource, a little bit different than post. Um, but I'm not going to get too much into the nuance there. Um, delete um, is used to actually del delete a resource. So if you had a, a piece of data that you submitted via form and you actually wanted to remove it from a website, you use the delete method. 
All right, so let, let's use an analogy to make a little bit more sense of this now. So this is a, um, a spice company and they have a catalog order form. Um, so in order to send an order to this, this company and receive your spices, you have to fill in some a various bit of information. You have to put in your billing info, your shipping address, you have to specify which item numbers you want, what the name is, what the price is, how much quantity you have, what's the subtotal, et cetera. Um, and you could do this, um, conceptualize this as if it were a web API. So if we wanted to turn this catalog order form into an API, uh, this is essentially how you would do it. So first, you'd, uh, you need a look at what the company's inventory is, what, what is actually depicted in the catalog. So you would use the get method to return um, catalog items. So it'll give you a list of products, and then you can sort of apply um, you know, automated business logic. Or um, if you were doing a web interface where people could log in, they could um, sort of pick and choose using that method. Um, and then they need to actually create a purchase. So that's going to be handled via uh, a post method. So they're going to need to document, and this can be done automatically by the computer program, um, you know, which SKUs do they want? Is there an associated SKU ID? Uh, what quantity, um, what are the prices, and then you just send this information, this, this data payload to the server using the post method, and then sometime after that, you know, you'll, you'll have an order of spices to your door. Um, and when you're using the post method, you're sending this sort of uh, data payload. Uh, a common format for that is, is JSON. Uh, JSON is just a, a sort of a way of, of formatting data, structured data, um, and it, it might look something like this. So you have an account ID that's some sort of ID unique to you, to your username. Uh, you have your shipping address um, with all the associated information, and then you have your order information. So you have um, an item number, SKU number, how much quantity you have. The computer system will, you know, maybe it'll calculate the, the subtotal, the, um, and then it will uh, you know, you, you also submit payment information and then you send that information out and, and an order gets completed. All right. Now, enough for an analogy. Let's look at a more tangible real world example. Uh, so, this is an example using the Google Auto Suggest API. Now, Google talked about sunsetting this a long time ago, uh, it's, it's still active, fortunately. Um, and I actually think it's a very simple um, API to understand. Uh, so you take this URL, this suggestqueries.google.com, uh, the rest of that URL, and then there's this URL parameter at the end, Q equals. So that Q equals um, can, can be anything. So the, the actual value there, I've put in um, a URL encoded word board games. So board percent 20 games, that percent 20 just represents a space character. Um, and you can put anything in there, and then you'll get a response. Uh, and because it's a get method API, if you were to just put this into your web browser, you'd, you'd see the response just like a computer program designed to, to interface with this API would. Um, and by the way, just to, to understand this term API endpoint, an API endpoint is just uh, essentially like a, a URL that you would put into a browser in order to utilize an API. It's a little bit of an oversimplification, but uh, that is the, the basic concept. So you take this URL now, you put it into your web browser, it has the, the value board games inserted into there, and you get a response. The response comes back in the form of XML. Uh, now, this one returns XML. Another common format is JSON. Sometimes you see CSV or unformatted text. Um, but this one does come back with an XML response. So you have this suggestion tag and the, the data attribute uh, with a value equal to each auto suggestion from Google. You have board games, board games for kids, board games for adults, et cetera. Um, and then you would utilize your computer system to actually parse that data and put it into whatever format you actually wanted. Um, so you get a list, for example, of, of all these various um, outputs from the board game suggestion, board games, board games for kids, board games for adults again, et cetera. Now, Again, what use is this for you? So if you've used any of these services, answer the public, Uber suggests, keywordtool.io, these are all services that have made use of this API and like APIs. Uh, you know, they've essentially 
and you, if you wanted to create one of these tools yourself, this is how you would do it. Um, you'd write some code to, you know, sort of iterate through different variations. Uh, so that that bulleted list there at the bottom, uh, it's you know it's going board games and then it's appending like another word so can uh, versus how um, and then you see the various responses come back um, associated with those different things. That's how Answer the Public works. That's how Uber Suggest works. Um, and if you wanted to create this, that's how you would do it. Let's look at another example. So another fairly simple example, um, GrepWords. So GrepWords is a, is a paid API um, that, that's used to get keyword data. So you can get search volume from it. Uh, I think you can get suggestions from it. And it's fairly easy to work with. Um, this is also a get method based API. Um, very, it works very similarly to the one we just shared with the auto suggest. Um, the difference is that this one requires, because of the paid service, uh, an API key. Um, and even sometimes free services will use an API key because you'll have certain limitations, um, and that API key will help you know uh, assert those limitations. Um, API keys are essentially just like passwords. So you have a unique uh, password or API key associated with your account, uh, and then their systems can keep track of that and maybe allocate a certain number of credits, how many times you can actually access that API. So here, the endpoint is you know api.grabwords.com. Uh, and then you use your unique API key, and then you have the Q attribute, uh, and that's that's another variable. And you you iterate through you know various different keywords uh, that you have in a list somewhere um, that your computer uh, program is ac accessing uh, some way. Uh, maybe it's from a CSV or a, you know a hand coded form, um, and it's just gonna it's gonna loop through each one and get the different responses. So if we oops look for the response. So unlike the other one, this is a, a JSON response. So I input my own secret API key and I put in the word board games. We get this JSON response. So you get things like the keyword comes back and the, the date that the CPC was updated, um, you know, each month of data, their search volume, so month one search volume, the global monthly search volume, in which case for, month, uh, for board games is 246,000. And then you'd, again, design a computer system to sort of just interpret that JSON. Uh, and you get some sort of like tabular data that maybe conceptually looks like this. You get a column that is keyword, has the name board games, and then the search value 246,000. Um, if that makes any sense. OK, uh, so we're talking about um, some concepts that are really, um, you can understand using the examples. If you really wanted to go ahead and apply them, a little bit more significantly, it, it probably does require some, you know, concept of computer grant programming or the use of a developer to, to create systems. Although there's there's definitely value in just purely understanding it. Um, we don't have enough time for me to sort of get into the nitty gritty of you know how to do computer programming. I might touch on it a little bit, uh, but you know I do run a a conference, Tech SEO Boost, uh, a conference dedicated solely to to technical SEO. And these sort of sort of technical things that may help enhance your work and, and do better SEO. Uh, I get, last year I gave a presentation that was sort of like an introduction to computer programming. Uh, so if that's something you're interested in digging a little bit more into, uh, these presentations are freely available. Go check them out. Um, you can check out my my introduction to computer programming for for SEOs and, and marketers. That's the URL. Um, all right. This is about as deep as we're going to get into the computer programming. So let's look at an actual compute, a piece of Python script that can use the GrepWords uh, API in order to pull search volume. I'll go through this line for line. It, it is eight total lines. This is a, a short piece. There's a short computer program, a short piece of code. Um, and it's, I think it's fairly easy to, to sort of conceptualize, even if you don't understand the specific syntax. Um, line one. So this is. We're importing a library. Um, this is just telling the, the the Python code to use the request library, which helps facilitate using APIs and, and downloading uh, things from websites. Line two, uh, this is import JSON. This is importing the JSON library. This is just giving the computer program the ability to parse JSON. 
line three. Okay, we're creating a variable called board games that is a list of board games. So these are three board games I, I personally enjoy. Uh, Gaia Project, Great Western Trail, Spirit Island. It's just a list of board games, again. So four uh, is actually a for loop. Uh, so this is a type of loop. Uh, so we talked about earlier, so if you had a list of different things and you wanted to use this API on every one of them, you would you would loop through each one. And that's what this is doing. It's a type of loop. It's going to go through each board game in that list of board games above um, until there are no more board games left in the list, and it's going to execute all the code underneath that. So line five is we're going to actually create the API URL. So you can see API URL equals you know that sort of base of the URL ends in the the Q um, the Q parameter, and then we're appending X, which is each board game in the list above. Uh, so it's you know going through the first board game, and then it's going to hit line six. Uh, so we're creating this variable r, which is just downloading that API URL. Line seven is it is actually parsing that JSON into a format that you can sort of dissect later in line eight, in which it is extracting just the search volume part of the JSON. So you look at the actual output of this. Uh, you put this code into your, your command line, into your, your Python interpreter. Um, and at the very bottom, you see the output. So for each one of those games, um, Gaia Project, Great Western Trail, Spirit Island, it is outputted a search volume, 1,300, 2,900, 5,400. It just works. Right. Another example, um, very similar program. It looks pretty close to the previous one using the Google Auto Suggest API. Uh, again, we're using the request library to download data. Um, instead of JSON, it's XML, so we're using the, the element tree library. Uh, we have a list of board games. We're going through a for loop, which we're constructing using you know, that endpoint. Um, and then it's iterating and parsing the XML. And for that, we get uh, a different output. So for every list of board games there, it gives you the, the first several suggestions. So for Gaia Project, Gaia Project Rules, Gaia Project Review. Guy Project versus Terra Mystica, which is another board game. And then it does the Great Western Trail iteration. There's Great Western Trail, Great Western Trail expansion, Great Western Trail rules, and so on. It's, it's looping through everything in that list. Um, so I, I think you can sort of, at this point, start to conceptualize how APIs can be used. If you were to incorporate this data into your program or into your work, um, this could you know, speed things along. You could do more advanced stuff with this if you incorporate your other data or your other, um, you know, whatever, your business logic, um, maybe other, you know, computer programs. Uh, you can do some interesting things. So, and that's actually where a lot, of, a lot of the magic comes when you start combining these things, these APIs together with other things. So let's look at an example of combining these two APIs. Uh, so this is, again, you know, it's essentially just that. It's combining the two APIs. Uh, so first, it gets a list of suggestions from the Google Auto Suggestion API. And then each one of those suggestions that comes out of it is being put through the GrepWords API to get their search volume. So every suggestion that comes out is getting an associated search volume via the GrepWords API. And the output looks like this. So um, if you look at the sort of the after the section of code, the output, so it says board games, then the it lists the associated search volume for board games, 246,000. The next suggestion uh, is Board Game Geek, and that's you know, 20, uh, 27,100 is the search volume, board games for kids, 33,100, and so on. So you've, you've just used combined two APIs and made a more robust system out of them. Cool. All right, um, so the rest of the presentation is gonna go pretty quick. Give you an example of how to use the Google Autocomplete API. Give you an example of how to use the GrepWords API. Um, now I just want to go through some other API examples. I'm not going to, you know, go through them line by line and, and how the code works. Um, this presentation will be made available somewhere. Um, and if you want to like copy and paste this code, it's all functional code that you can use as examples. If you want to build upon it, use it for whatever you're doing. Um, just have a sense of like some other APIs that exist for SEO um, and what you can do with them. 
webpagetest.org. Uh, if anyone's doing web performance optimization, trying to make really fast websites, I, I, we all know that webpagetest.org is, is an amazing resource. And I have a pretty decent API. I think it allows for 200 calls um, for free. I'm not sure. I assume that's per per day, but it may be per month. Anyway, I have to check. Uh, so here's some code for webpagetest.org. You have a, a list of test URLs, search wilderness, try think tank, search engine land. Um, and it's going to go through there. Um, and it's going to get um, some of the metrics. In this case, it's it's doing the lighthouse test um, and it's getting for just the first view because web page test does several views to, to sort of play with the caching and whatnot um, it's getting um, the FC uh, the FCP the first contentful pane um, and extracting that for each one of those URLs you could sort of like schedule that on a regular basis and sort of document this data over time um, and if you just want to conceptualize how you would use that um, SEMrush. So SEMrush has is really a wealth of data, and their API is pretty pretty simple to use. Um, so here's some SEMrush example. You need to put in a, a domain name. Uh, you put in your unique API key because it's a paid service again, and that's your your super secret password for using the API. Um, and then this program will go through for that domain name. It'll spit out the um, you know the various keywords. Um, the associated position, search volume, and URLs for each of those uh, keywords associated with that domain name. Cool. Um, Google Analytics. If you're doing any sort of you know, automated reporting, um, playing with you know your your analytics data, this is extremely useful. And I don't even need to uh, give you your own code because Google makes this code available online, it's fairly easy to to work with. Uh, these are the URLs with the example code, um, and then you could, you know, get your for each domain name, you know, associated, you know, sessions, um, and all the, the various metrics that you're tracking in, in analytics, and sort of incorporate that into a larger program. Um, Moz using as an example for for backlink data. Uh, so this is. Um, Moz actually makes a, a, a Python library that I'm utilizing here. Uh, so this will, um, you know, this will, um, you know, for, for a domain name, you know, give some sort of uh, sort of backlink information. Uh, so it's, you know, the, give you domain authority, page authority, um, and some, some backlink info. Uh, Search Console. Um, again, this, this is actually some, uh, freely available on my, my personal blog. Uh, I use it to sort of download all the search, um, the, the query data from Search Console and back it up to a database on a on a, some level of frequency. Um, you can you can use combine this with, with cron jobs um, to to sort of schedule that. Um, Jerry Oaks has an alternative version if you're working in uh, with Google Cloud to sort of back it up to to BigQuery. Um, so again. Pretty useful for data analysis. Uh, Webhose.io, really cool service. It's it's an API. Uh, if you've ever used anything like a like a like a BuzzSumo or like the content section of Ahrefs, uh, this is essentially um, how you would roll your own service of that using the Webhost data source, and it has some pretty unique service uh, features. Uh, so here again, it's you know you have to have your own unique uh, API key, um, and you put in a, a search, uh, a query, um, and then it'll it'll give you a list of you know what what's being shared on social media for that query, the title, associated interactions on Facebook, or whatever social media thing that you actually want to extract from that. Uh, it's pretty interesting. Again. Reddit. Um, so Reddit, I use a lot for for content creation ideas. Um, this is again a tool that uh, some some code I made freely available on my on my blog. Um, it's it's pretty neat. So you put in a username, password, um, and then some API information in the form of the client ID and the client secret, um, and then you can put in a whole boatload of of search terms. So I like to do things like how to and can I or where do I, those sort of like question phrases. 
um, and then you know maybe you know the actual subject of your website um, and sort of see what's being shared on 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 Reddit, what has gotten the most upvotes, the most comments, and sort of use that to to inform some content strategy. <coughs> Wayback machine. If you wanted to look at all the sort of historic data being cataloged in Wayback Machine, you can use the API to sort of do this automatically. Uh, this is, you see, this is it's a very few lines of code. You put in a domain name, um, and it'll, this will output, you know, a list of, you know, all the associated URLs uh, cataloged by the Wayback Machine. And then you could go ahead and, and use a, there's a, actually a separate API for this to actually get the, the Wayback Machine uh, formatted URLs that you could maybe then dump into another program and download. <coughs> Voice is, is breaking up a little bit. Um, and then uh, without code examples, but just, just to make mention of some other services that have APIs that are very useful, uh, Stat or whatever rank tracking tool you use, many of them have APIs. Um, Google Natural Language Processing, their, their tool, their API for that um, can be used for if you can imagine many different things. Um, if you don't want to train your own machine learning model, there's APIs that sort of are, are pre-trained and you can leverage. Um, any cloud cr crawlers you have, you crawl, botify, um, you can sort of extract that data, funnel it into a report or an analysis. Uh, if you're accepting payment information, you're probably going to use something like Stripe, which is an API-based uh, uh, payment processor. If you want to use geolocation data, you can use Google Maps, Foursquare, other map associated APIs. Um, if you want to, you know, play with you know your project management workflow, there you know Slack API, um, who is data, you know, sky's the limit. A lot of services have APIs nowadays. Um, again, I just listed a lot of individual APIs, and I want to sort of bring this together in an example. Um, that is tangible, combining various services together for a unique purpose. Um, so we'll go through one more example. Um, and this, this is available on, on GitHub via GIST. Um, this screenshot on the left, is, this is actually in the form of a Jupyter Notebook. Jupyter Notebook is sort of a, uh, you know, people who use Python for data analysis, a, a format in which they, they often um, use um, they, they use their Python scripts in, in this format. Um, so this is freely available. And this is if you want to find expired domain names linked to from uh, you know, like an industry forum or, or niche source, you can use the script to do that. Uh, so essentially, you use Screaming Frog or another crawler and get the outlink report. So you'll have a list of all the domain names that is being linked to from that source. You uh, distill all those URLs. You change them from from you know long URLs to domain names. Uh, so you extract the domain names from those URLs. Step three: use that Moz Linkscape API uh, to check in you know, the page authority and domain authority for each one of those URLs. So you can sort of only care about certain page authority, domain authority thresholds. Um, then step four: you you check whether that domain is active. You check the HTTP status. Is that a that returning a 404 um, to give you some indication if it's if it's still a live domain name, and then lastly, you use a, a Whois API to see if it's if it's available or unavailable. Um, I think this particular Whois API was was a little bit uh, iffy; wasn't always accurate, but uh, you get the idea. Um, and it could definitely, if you're trying to pick up some domain names um, with a little bit of backlinks on them already, this is this is definitely a viable way of, of thinking about it by leveraging one, two, three, three or so APIs into a system. Um, and if you want to really sort of apply this further, um, me and, and several people, uh, Hamlet Batista, Jar Oaks, um, Tom Anthony from Distilled, Brittany Muller, um, we're working on this project uh, called the Machine Learning Toolkit for SEO. Um, and this is essentially, you know, uh, this whole little toolkit that can be used for machine learning applications. Um, so it gives you access to some APIs, um, ways of ingesting data, ways of cleaning that data, and sort of compiling those all together into sort of a, a way of, of applying machine learning and, and doing research on that data. 
Um, so that's, a, that's another way to be thinking about it. If you're interested in machine learning and APIs, definitely check that out. Um, and you can see like uh, GR set up a Jupyter notebook uh, playing with some of these APIs already. So there's you know, SEMrush functionality built in, Google Analytics capability uh, functionality built in, uh, and you can sort of play around with that and then you know, apply machine learning afterwards. That's just about it. Um, again, I just want to reiterate this. We're doing this for a good cause to raise money for St. Jude's. Please consider donating. Um, it's, it's truly a good cause. Thank you. Thanks, buddy. That was awesome, man. Yeah, sweet. <laughs> now, uh, you, you have my gears turning. Last time I saw this, you, you, you got me going. And uh, you got a couple questions in, in, in the audience, uh, so I'm going to throw them your way. Yeah. Um, Nick Rizzo wants to know, uh, and this is kind of my question too, with zero background in coding or any of these things, is it relatively easy to pick up uh, the basics of, of utilizing APIs? to build my own tools or extract data for data journalism. Yeah, so I, I think in the few examples I gave, um, obviously you have to you have to start learning computer programming a little bit. Um, and honestly you can you can pick that up in you know a day or two. Use one of these online services like Code Academy, which is like this interactive tutorial for learning these things, you'll you'll get the basics down in in a couple of days, and, and that's Python. that's Python you're talking about, right? Uh, I'm talking about Python, but Code Academy does you know JavaScript or you know, it'll teach you HTML and, and you know whatever you want to learn. There's a lot of languages available in there, um, and it's it's pretty neat. Um, you can check out that that presentation I gave that sort of goes into a lot of the basics that'll help. Um, but you saw from like the code examples, there were like eight lines of code. And you could sort of, even if you understand the concept there and then apply it later, once you start to understand how the, the code actually works together, I think it's relatively easy to pick up. Yeah, um, I, I'm, all, all I know is like Visual Basic, some HTML, some pseudocode, and just understanding you know, the, the concepts, those basic concepts, you can kind of understand them. What's yeah. that? You're good to go then. Just uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Python and uh, rock and No, I, you can look at the at the code that, that Paul put up on the screen, and you can kind of work out what it's supposed to do, even if you don't know the actual tags and, and the actual language itself. Um, yeah. yeah, and that's right. why I call it a computer programming language. You know, it's, yeah. You know, it, there, there's there is a language to it. If you understand the concept, that's like ninety percent of the battle. It's just learning the actual vocabulary and how to like construct a sentence. Right, dude, dude. Are you on a blue screen, or is that your your the color of your that's wall? My wall. That's oh my wall. god, <laughs> that's some perfect paint right there. <laughs> I should should be doing some like green screening. There you go. So, uh, guys, do we have any more other questions for Paul? I I have one. Um, so I came across my first API that had a ridiculously slow um, rate request limit. Um, now we don't make requests very often, but they're made from our web app. So people, they get made just whenever someone does a certain action, it checks certain things on the API to give them that immediate feedback on whether they should check something or not, if there's any warning mm -hmm. signs in the data. They make them so far apart with the seam size we have at the minute that it, it, it's gonna occasionally, they're not gonna get a result. But what's the best way to handle that kind of situation? Um, for someone who's a relative API rookie like me that hasn't had to deal with a full second, one request per second or something ridiculous is the limit for this API. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, part of working with APIs is understanding that you're utilizing someone else's service um, and they're allowed to put whatever sort of restrictions they want on it. Um, and just for people who aren't familiar, rate limiting is essentially, you know, you can only request, uh, you know, to pull an API like every so often at a certain interval. Um, they're putting restrictions on the API usage, even though they're giving you access to it. Uh, so you need to look in the documentation what their what that actual rate limit is. You need to adhere to it. If it's you know you have to you can only pull like one, hit the API once every you know 100 milliseconds. You add in you know a timer. You wait for 100 milliseconds in between, um, and then if that affects sort of the user, you need to maybe add in like a, a loading bar. Some indication to let them know that you know we're we're working on it, 
Um, in some instances, you can contact the API provider and see if they'll lift the rate limit for a certain purpose. If you, you know, if you pay them, or uh, if there's an application that you think they think is, you know, mutually beneficial, they they may be willing to do that. Cool, man. Cool. And, and Garrett, you know, this this uh, what we were talking about before with uh, figuring out the contextual links, uh, just you know, the internal links uh, that are only linked contextually. I think that this is definitely mm -hmm. something you could use to to do that. Um, yeah. Even with the Ahrefs uh, API with their their new internal link feature, you can definitely build something quick like that. I remember yeah. seeing that, that project that was that we spoke about on the show a while ago. I don't know if you guys remember the name of the project. It was kind of turned web pages into um, database formats so you could query it with SQL. Um, yeah. Was was that the the tool where you type something in and it was constantly changing like do you remember it was like one of those crazy websites? Yeah, you yeah, were I, I thought that was quite a cool project. Kind yeah, of, um, I'm, I'm thinking about providing, something a new, providing a new interface to the web to just put cool. the pages in. Yeah, I forget the name now. It was yeah, on the originally, show. I was, um, like I mentioned earlier, I talked to uh, I talked to Stephen Van Bessen like six months ago. If they were going to put an API into Content King because I like their crawler and stuff, and you know it's updated live, not automatically, and all that shit um, for this purpose. But you know they haven't got around to it yet. And now that you've mentioned that H Ahrefs has a internal link type tool, I'll have to check that out. And yeah. See what that's all. Also, I, I think like. Content King does have an API. Oh, is the API fully rolled out? Yeah, I I think you can access. I mean, talk to Steven, obviously, that there's. There's yeah, access yeah. to some parts of it and, and not others the last time I checked. Um, but that was that was several months ago. It might have even okay. been since then. Yeah, it's been a while since I've talked to him about it. So no, no, Garrett's luck, the one bit that isn't in the API is the bit he wants. Yeah, <laughs> that's kind of how it's going with that tool so far. <laughs> but um, Garrett's their most weird user or something. Can can you make any uh, use cases for, for this uh, for like an affiliate SEO? How they would uh, Utilize the API for you know to make a process more simple or, or more efficient. Or am I putting yeah, you on the spot I mean, here? <laughs> no, I mean it's 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 fine. Like I that last example I gave is you know sure. about you know you know acquiring expired domain names. If you were you know doing that to sort of you know, like a, a gray hat ish approach to sort of boost the authority or acquire old content. Yeah. To sort of boost your affiliate. That's 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 one example. Um, you can use an API, you know, to sort of you know manage, you know, you know, your um, you know various sources and sort of make sense of that in in interesting ways. Um, I think it sort of depends on you know what are your activities that are sort of driving value for your your affiliate programs. Like, uh, what are those activities? And then I'm sure there's there's an there's an application there. Cool, man. Cool, cool. All right. Uh, we have any other questions in the chat for, for Mr. Paul? Yeah, come on. Fire in some questions. Let's, uh, let's have some. Uh, I mean, so we Paul, use the real big question is, uh, are you excited to be a dad? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> so excited. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I got, I got twins on the way. Congrats uh, again, man. That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Wow, right. twins, twins, that's a, uh, that's a blessing. <laughs> uh, we, do have a, we have a little bit question for you now. Um, technical SEO has been a resurgent reasons, recently, which is awesome. I love tech SEO, obviously, but do you think specializing too heavily on tech SEO could hold someone back career-wise? And that's from Colin McDermott. Yeah, and that's, that's an interesting question. I, I also... I tweeted out something yesterday that's pretty highly relevant that was trying to sort of get the community sense on this on um, how organizations are structured. Are you are you siloing your technical team from your content team, your more creative people? Um, I I think it's best like you need, you need you, they, we talk about a T shaped marketer where you sort of specialize in, in one area. Um, and you develop your skills in others, maybe not 
you know, as skilled in those other areas, but you, you are specialized in, in one of them. Um, I think that still holds true. You need to have a semblance of, you know, various related skill sets um, and then sort of hone in on one. Um, it doesn't make sense to, you know, just do technical SEO. That's definitely not going to get you very far. Um, you, need to, you need to understand all the different aspects. Now, do you need to specialize in other aspects? Uh, I, I think that's probably not the case. Um, you can specialize in one or, or two or, or three things and sort of be decent at doing some of the others or at least understand it. That's interesting. I, I always had the kind of impression that we're um, too few good technical SEOs. So I kind of expected the opposite answer that you'd uh, find it easy to find people desperate for your work if you were <laughs> one of the few that I, uh, is able no, to I mean, I'm, I'm saying like, should you? No, no, I, I mean, I agree with you, but that, that, wasn't, that wasn't the question really, right? It was, are you, is it? Bad to would, would it would it hold you, would it hold you back? I guess was the question um, in your career. So I was kind of imagining that it would do the opposite of hold you back. So, um, so that that was all I was saying. Yeah, I mean, I I, I I think you if you focus too much and and that really you didn't have an understanding of everything else that would hold you back. Mm -hmm. um, if you're going really hard into technical and, and you like that and you understand everything else surrounding that you're fine yeah cool yeah. well what what else we talk about? <laughs> uh i i think having your hand in a few buckets opens new opportunities too like uh um paul we met that guy dave at traffic think tank he specializes in schema markup as a service only and uh from what i understood he's he's like killing it like he, he he's has too much business so uh it's beneficial oh. to, to, to try new things and that you might not be an expert on uh, you think that's something that might only last for a short period of time um i don't think that that was his entire business i think he does other things too so uh if, if it fades out i'm sure uh he has other things to fall back on but yeah. right it's like a it's like a stock portfolio you know you want to you want to diversify yeah. a little bit yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and then Garrett okay. had a piece about that on the show a little while ago about diversifying i mean vin's taken it too far becoming a restaurateur i think but... <laughs> Fortunately, well, uh, fortunately, I'm not making any food, so uh, that you yeah. know, investing in it as far as uh, as far as I go. We got a quick question from Birdman, um, who also earlier. I don't know if anyone's read that out. I don't think so. Uh, just thanked you heavily for the uh, in-depth knowledge share, Paul. So thank you from them as well. Um, they're just saying I've heard a lot of talk that AI is being implemented in various aspects of SEO. At the risk of sounding super ignorant, is there any truth to those rumors? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, there's definitely. I mean, I guess I need clarity on the question: uh, Is AI or machine learning being applied in in the practice of SEO? Like, if that's that's certainly the case. Like, I, I do use uh, machine learning in in what I'm doing all the time. If the question is, is Google using machine learning and AI? Um, I think that's also the case. Um, they have sort of, uh, one of their, their key engineers has a, has a big AI machine learning background and he's become, had a more prominent role in you know, their work at Google search recently. Um, and they they said they're using more machine learning. Yeah, Bird, Birdman, I, I think the answer is yes, it's, it's being used. Um, I think you may be thinking of more mm -hmm. about when it's going to be tangible for the everyday SEO or may, more maybe a, a beginner intermediate SEO to get their hands on it and use it in a way that, that'll be helpful in your life. Um, it's it's definitely being used uh, in technical SEO like, like Paul's doing, and Google's certainly using machine learning and AI uh, in their algorithm. 
Um, but as far as how common it is it in the everyday SEO's life, um, I guess it depends on, on what you're doing and, and where you're at. Yeah, I, I figured. So uh, so yeah, it'll it'll become more and more prevalent as there's more use cases and, and it becomes understood by uh, by more and more people. But for now, I, I think it's uh, guys like Paul who are really into technical SEO that are, are the ones that are using it most. Well, from what Paul said during his presentation, I mean, he's working with colleagues on a new toolkit, which I'm assuming is going to make it massively more accessible for people who want to, I'm assuming, buy the toolkit or whatever, however it's going to be released. People who want to access that toolkit, I'm assuming, are going to find it more accessible than it currently is, even for Paul and his colleagues doing it all manually from scratch every time. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So that should and, probably... Yeah, and just to, to clarify on that that toolkit, that's it's a it's a Python toolkit, so it definitely does require some understanding of, of Python, but it's sort of putting it all in one place and you know, making it a little easier to apply for for SEO purposes. Uh, but you know, that's it, you need to understand how to code. Yeah, and uh, like like Paul suggested, if you guys are interested in getting some coding chops, there's there's some cool. Uh, Tutorial websites out there. Uh, what, what was the one that you mentioned? Co Coachery? C Code Academy. Code Academy. Yeah. And I've seen a few well, other ones out there too. And I found um, Learn Python the Hard Way. Um, he had his book up for free at one point. I'm not sure if it's still up for free now, but it would be for worth it. We got it for Python 2 is still free. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, Python, Python 3 is really, Python 3 is really similar. So do you learn Python the Hard Way too, and then read a blog post about the differences between 2 and 3, and you're good to go. Yeah. Right. Cool. So, you guys have any other questions for Paul? Uh, I know we got through a few here. I mean, Let's I have one because we had the big conference section on the previous segment. Um, I'd like Paul to tell us a bit more about his conference and why people should go and who goes typically and just a bit more about it. Yeah. Um, so, it's called Tech SEO Boost. And, you know, we had just had our second year. Um, we're, we're working on year three. It's a, it's a conference dedicated solely to technical SEO. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a free conference with limited seating. Uh, so if you can't get in, we also make it completely available online for streaming and the videos are available for free afterwards. Um, the audience is sort of a mixture of, you know, you know, technical SEOs, people wanting to learn more about technical SEO. Um, web developers that are trying to understand this whole crazy SEO thing. Um, if you're interested in more super advanced SEO, more technical SEO, it's it's definitely uh, a conference I would have on your radar. It really came out of uh, my own personal desire for a conference like this. Uh, so I you know I I curate all the speakers, I curate all the topics, um, and it's it's things that I I think that. You know the SEO community um, is more interested in it when it comes to more more advanced topics. Uh, so if, if that's something you like, that's something you enjoy, you're more interested in, definitely check it out. Yeah, I, I got to see some of last year's videos, and as a non-technical, non-programmer -prog SEO, uh, it definitely just expanded my horizons just to understand what what was being done and and uh, the possibilities out there. So even if I have to go and, and hire a coder to do some of this stuff for me, um, I get I have my head's wrapped around the concept more. Mm -hmm. So uh, just just to get that much um, out of it, it was very beneficial. Yeah, and I think with a lot of people complaining that the talks at most conferences are too basic, I'm, I'm assuming that was part of the motivation for Paul starting it was there wasn't anything like that really, or there isn't much of it at any conferences. Um, it sounds like the kind of thing if you want to learn stuff that's not going to be in your typical conference, which has to cater to everyone, it's going to be a good good thing to get along to and actually learn some stuff that isn't covered day to day that much. Oh, yeah, yeah. Cool. So are, are the videos out for this year yet? Or yeah, yeah. They're um, on the website? They're, they're on the uh, website. It's Catalyst, right? Yeah, I mean, you could Google Tech SEO okay, Boost. Yeah. Tech uh, SEO Boost, and I'll put, get them up in the chat room, yeah. Cool, cool, cool. cool. All right, buddy. 
I appreciate you jumping on All on right. short notice, man. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You gonna be in the near future, Paul? I uh, have MozCon on the agenda, but um, outside of that, you know, my 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 conference going days with uh, me being a father to be is somewhat limited this year. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we hear that. Well, uh, appreciate it again, man, and uh, we'll talk to you soon, buddy. All right, have a good yeah, one. Simple. Thanks, man. Take, Take care. All right. So that was awesome. That'll be the probably the most technical uh, um, presenter we have today. Uh, hopefully you guys got something out of that. Uh, I was fortunate enough to see that presentation previously and and uh, I've already listed out a ton of ton of ways I, I wanna use that information. Um, if you guys are able to jump on Upwork and just hire a coder uh, to, to use, you know, to integrate all of your third party tool APIs into one private tool for you, it probably won't be that expensive to do so, and uh, you're, you're going to get a lot of power out of it. Um, yeah, I mean, since we've started using APIs, it just makes stuff so so easy. Like, if there's something you're you're always telling your team, go on to this tool, check this thing, make sure this number matches this. They never remember. They make mistakes. If if it just comes straight up on screen in front of them every time automatically. And even for yourself, you make mistakes, you forget, you have busy days, you're clicking around, you're not checking things properly. Having data, even just simple API use like that's been amazing for us. And then you get to the level that Paul's using it with like seven different APIs all in one new super tool that they're putting together. It's uh, gonna unlock a lot of power. Um, it's pretty cool stuff. And it really isn't hard to access most APIs. I mean, I'm struggling with that one on the rate limiting issue because of people firing requests in at random times. If you're writing your own script that's just going to do things in order, it's really easy to work with rate limits because, like you said, you can just have a, you know, wait this long and show a progress bar. When you've got people requesting things at random, um, you've kind of got to build your own queue in the background, um, which is more fiddly. But for just your own scripting stuff, Python is really easy to get into. Um, if, you, if you've learned basic, you already are going to have enough of an understanding of how programming works um, to learn Python really quickly. Because although it's um, a different philosophical approach than basic, the way they've written the language, I mean, obviously, every language has got a different philosophical approach than basic these days, because basic gets all the hate. It was just what we all got taught as kids. Um, it's a different philosophy, but the, the you know the programming concepts that you'd have learned late, like you know what a function data structures are. You just have to learn um, the idiosyncrasies of Python and how that works. Uh, well, so, so you you would know, Steve. I, I I think this might be a little overwhelming for a lot of people. How long would you say it would take to learn enough to make your own little API tool using Python? From from no knowledge. Um, I mean, I think I think it'll take most. It'll take you longer than two days to learn Python, probably. I mean, Paul is uh, probably uh, considerably. Well, if it took him, if it takes him two days to learn a new language, he's uh, a full order of magnitude uh, smarter than myself. <laughs> but um, I think with a, you know, if you just do a little bit in the evening for fun, do learn do learn Python the hard way and just work through his book. Call that one month. That's definitely realistic if you have a basic understanding of computers. I mean, and, and, I don't even need to have programmed in basic. You can get through his book in a month. If you've never programmed before, if all, all you've ever done is edit a bit of PHP and WordPress, mess around on HTML and CSS. So you're a real beginner um, at using all that stuff, and you've just done a bit as part of your SEO career. I think a bit of casual time in the evening, half an hour a night, you'll be through Learn Python the hardware in a month. Um, and then you'll just pick, I'd, if you pick a simple API to start with, so something like if you've got Ahrefs or the Serpstat a, a, API we use sometimes, um, you just read the documentation and quite often it just it's, it's just a simple, like, like Paul showed in his presentation, you send a request, which is just like type, and you can do, do it yourself, like you can make an API query up for a lot of these APIs, paste it in your browser, and see visually what your specific request looks like. So then when you send your request, you get your data back into the Python data structure that you've just learned about and learned Python the hard way. You can check that everything's mapping the way you expected and that you're reading it correctly. And 
if there's an error, you can often just look in the browser. Obviously, there's API Explorer tools you can download for more complicated APIs and stuff, but it's really just like saying, give me this, and the URL. Like, you know, in um, WordPress, if you don't have, if you have the URL set up to show category, then forward slash post date, then forward slash, each one of those is like a variable you're sending. It's like WordPress, give me the post July 18th, this name, and it queries the database and gives that back to you. That's all an API request is. It's just where it's going, what your key is, what data you want it to give you, any other variables. And then you get some data back just dumped into your programming language for you to use. So once you've learned Python, you'll write your first API request and get data back that you can use in a couple of hours. So um, anyway, I will do the quick charity roundup. Um, I wanted to share something positive um, since Paul was so positive during his uh, presentation um, about the charity. Um, I know you're going to hear a lot about it during the talk from all the speakers and everything, but um, it wouldn't be possible without us supporting the charity for all these great speakers who normally charge their time, speak at big conferences. People pay thousands to see them speak if they're all appearing on one day at a big conference, and we're giving you 24 hours of this stuff for free. And it's all to support the good works that Jude's are doing. And one of the really amazing projects they're working on, um, along with Washington University, is their Pediatric Cancer Genome Project. One of the things with children's cancer is it's often caused um, by hard to pin down genetic faults. You know, cancer in the very young is really rare. It's typically, it's an old person's disease because that's the point after which um, natural selection didn't remove um, the causes of it from our genome. So it's quite rare for young people to develop cancer relative to an older person. And as the, so the roots of pediatric cancer are often hidden deep within a child's DNA and it's hard to trace. And the work St. Jude's and Washington University are doing together is, is to trace the genome of, of various different types of childhood cancer looking for future cures based on that information and unlocking information that we couldn't get in any other way. And for those of you who remember just the Human Genome Project generally, the amount of government and university investment, money, man hours, these kind of projects are huge. And St. Jude's wouldn't be able to do these projects without your support and without I can't afford to donate as much as some of the big name SEOs that we've had on donating 500, 50s, hundreds. If you can just give five, 10, 15 dollars, I know Paul will appreciate it having given up his time. I know the future speakers that are coming up will appreciate it too. So please just take a minute before we welcome our next speaker to jump on the link and just make a small donation and help some Jude's keep on with projects like this. Um, pediatric cancer genome project, which are really revolutionary, and no one else is doing this kind of work, um, except obviously for the the Washington University uh, team as well that are working on the project with them. So thank you, we appreciate your support. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> um, looks like Jeff is ready. Number two, hey, Jeff. How are you all doing? Hey, Jeff. Doing good, well. good. Thanks for joining us. Can you hear me well? We yeah. Are. All right. You've got a comment already. You've got uh, Nicholas Rizzo saying, excited for this next one. Market Muse is super powerful, picking it up in Q3. So there all we right. go. Love to hear Welcome that. To <laughs> <laughs> hey, Jeff, so we don't steal the screen from you. We're going to mute ourselves. Um, so as soon as you're ready, we're going to go on mute so you can do your presentation. And uh, then we'll we'll take ourselves off mute for some Q&A at the end. That sounds fantastic. And I'm open to Q&A of any kind. Can, can you all see, see my screen all right? Yes, sir. All right. Um, but so thank you so much. Um, just a little bit of uh, background about me. I'm the co-founder and chief product officer for Market Muse. Um, so I manage uh, the both the marketing team and the product team. And that includes our data science team as well as our engineering team. Um, and today's discussion uh, really going to be about how to build content plans um, and really ensure that you're focusing what you build on what's important for your business or your site. So it's it may, you know establishing yourself as an authority, establishing that you can answer 
the needs of prospects. You can you know give people what they want with the content that you build. Um, and I don't want to extend the, uh, uh, the, the, the time too long until without going into this, but I did also want to say that I truly appreciate props to everybody setting this up, uh, the 24 hours of SEO group. Um, you know, I, I'm connected with uh, a number of people who have, you know, really supported this cause and it was a no brainer for me. The charity St. Jude is, is a real special one. So if you haven't considered a donation, um, please do it at whatever level um, you feel is appropriate. You know, they do amazing things and I know was just described, but it's, it's sometimes it's not easy to see that they innovate in spaces where um, many large medical organizations won't touch. And for many reasons that I could stand on a very large sound box and talk about, but you know, they don't, they, they do things that other people won't touch for many reasons. Um, so uh, I'll get off that soapbox uh, and, uh, and, and then the topic today, uh, get into it. Um, so, uh, Again, how to build content plans and improve site authority with user intent profiling specifically. Um, I'm really gonna talk about some, some practical applications of something that in the space is really considered a little bit esoteric and weird, uh, which is thinking about intent, thinking about what a user wants. Um, and because it's very important, you have to be thinking this, you have to be thinking critically to understand how every article that you publish, every item that you update, is contributing to the overall success of your um, you know, of your brand or of your site. Um, and so, first thing I'll mention is, unfortunately, you know, sadly, uh, the the um, the situation that we're in now is people are still doing this, uh, and the data points that they're using um, are suspect. Right? They're only looking at keyword research solutions. Maybe it's GA, uh, Google AdWords Keyword Planner. Maybe it's something else. They're looking at the keyword that they love and that they care about. And they're looking at, in some cases, just pay-per-click competition, which has been the standard, unfortunately, for years for a great deal of people. And I mention this not because it relates to explicitly um, building content plans, building authority, and thinking about user intent profiling, but just that the fact that this is still a great percentage of, of uh, agencies that, that, that give solutions for kind of novice customers um, and it is a lot of internal content teams practices. It yields a lot of weird situations in the market. It yields a lot of opportunity for you because you're thinking critically enough to join the 24 hours of SEO uh, YouTube channel. And you're thinking that there must be a better way of, of, of building content that's going to service your service your users more effectively. Um, and so quickly, I'll mention like this was, you know, this was the first way of people thinking about I need to find my keywords. I need to be thinking about those keywords. I need to focus on the ones that have high volume and low competition. Can I find those, you know, those ideal holy grail situations? Um, I've also got ones that have high volume and high competition. To achieve them, I'm going to have to do a lot of work. So I'm going to really need to make sure that it's great if I go for it. Um, low volume and low competition. That's going to be something where it may be a layup, uh, historically called maybe a long tail uh, or something that's really specific to my business and I can build small amounts of content and do well. Um, and then you got the low volume and high competition. Um, that's going to be a special case. Uh, and those are situations where you'd only do it if what? It's high conversion rate value. Um, so when you get a lead through that avenue, it might be, you know, uh, wrongful death attorneys in Poughkeepsie, New York. But when you get a case from that type of lead, it's worth millions of dollars. Um, so in these situations, your really four square process is giving you kind of the first place to go but it's extremely dated tactic because it's not really thinking about you. It's not thinking about your site. It's not thinking about what content you have today, who the world thinks you are, who the search engines think you are, and how that should relate to your next steps. It's really just focusing on a bunch of words that then you've got to take and do something that isn't going to be disjointed. Um, and again, when you do find those ideal situations, everybody's doing it that way, right? You know, the, 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 the bowl there, they're, 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 they're piling in, you know, lots of garbage content. They're piling in some great content. You may have some more powerful competitors and they're writing a lot of great stuff. So those are going to go away over time as well. And so you've got these situations where the, um, you know, when that happens, you're going to start to see those things fade. Um, and if you're standing still, if you ha don't have that documented content strategy, these things are going to go away and then you're not going to really know what to do. Are you going to go out and find more words? Are you going to go out and find things that you should be writing about? Um, it, there's a better way. 
And so what today really what I want to talk about is, first of all, some of those data points, why they're not the you know gold standard for what you should be thinking about, what third party competition data is valuable, um, what things should you be critically thinking about when you're looking at those things. Um, and then, you know, what happens uh, when you, you know, you realize that maybe your business or your site, you've taken those approaches. How do you get out of your own way in those situations? Um, can you now take the, the data that you have, the information about your site, about the places where you are considered a subject matter expert, where you have some authority, um, and connect the dots? Really build a concerted clustering strategy that takes what you've built, bridges those things together, um, and it will yield a situation where all boats are rising for your site. Um, so to do that, what you you know the first stage, uh, of course, is to look into the mirror, right? To look in the mirror and hold up your site analytics and say, you know, okay, I'm going to be realistic. This isn't an internal report that I'm trying to make myself look good or my client look good or validate their you know their ideas. Uh, it's really about what's really driving traffic for my site, okay? What's really building the traffic? Where do I have efficiencies? And efficiency meaning when I write content on these topics, it does well. It achieves my business goals. It achieves whatever it is my core KPIs are. Is it improving revenue per thousand page views on a publishing site? Is it getting more leads? Is it getting more sales? Is it improving average order size in an uh, e-commerce situation? Um, so what pages are actually driving that traffic? What are my, am I proud of them? Are they representing my business well? Or was it, you know, the top 10 ways that, you know, uh, I did something and I happened to get a lot of traffic because of some way? Or is it, you know, which pages are getting those conversions? Am I driving those uh, visitors um, to places where they can convert and they can influence my overall e-performance indicators? Or is it that I'm just trying to hit my traffic number and I know that I'm going to get my conversion number from somewhere else? Um, and are all of those things truly connected to your business vision? Um, are they on the topics that you wish to own? Um, and you wish for your business to be considered an authority. What we'll often find is that teams have been taking various keyword research process steps, and maybe they've got editorial teams writing on their own in silos, and they're not connecting to one another. They're not connecting the content items. And what you end up having is the ones that are performing in organic search don't necessarily meet the business vision of today, or they might meet the business vision of three years ago, and those are still generating the traffic, and we haven't done anything to tweak those, those situations. Um, so the first step really is to see what have we done, and did I just get lucky, or ha did, did my strategy actually execute and yield content that's producing content, producing visitors that tell the story, and they, they are the ones we want, they are the prospects that we need, and it's because we've established ourselves as an authority. Um, and last, I'll mention, you know, it's, it's also important to have that mirror in front to say, did I get lucky um, in these situations? Would I be a sitting duck if a competitor were to start profiling me and profiling my content strategy? Um, and they, they were tactically picking me off and building better content than me, building content that better achieved user intent, better served the readers and said, Okay, well, you know, John Smith's site isn't going to really change all that much because they think they've got this process in line. I'm going to build a better page that answers all the user questions that allows them to achieve their goals better. Um, and they're not going to stand a chance because they can't move as fast as I can. And that's where I really pivot into, you know, thinking about user intent. This is the sort of yawn definition, the, the uh, uh, definition of user intent, right? It's like, I don't really understand how to make this applicable to me. It's that I've got, there's informational queries. It's, I want to learn something. You know, there, there, there's 15 different user intent profile maps. There are people that have mapped it to a buyer journey in their industry, which can be a very valuable technique. There's ones that have added uh, local search and, 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 and queries that now get answered by um, Google instantly, instant, instant matches or uh, news matches or things, <coughs> pardon me, of that nature. But really the biggest things to think about is I'm looking for a particular brand. I'm looking to compare a particular brand. I'm looking for a particular website. I'm seeking out uh, either whether I'm in the consideration phase or the awareness phase or the purchase phase. I'm seeking out something uh, to uh, either purchase or to connect with, or I'm trying to learn something. You know, what's the uh, capital of North Dakota? Um, I've got these different situations that 
Um, you know, these are the standard definitions, but this is typically where people stop when they're thinking about user intent. They're like, okay, well, I've got this one. I'm going to map this word to this user intent. It doesn't mean all that much unless you can draw some sort of correlation um, and use that to define your strategy. Um, so what today we're really going to speak about is a couple innovations in user intent that I've been working on personally with, with um, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, and it gets us closer to the way that the search engines are thinking about intent. And the, it also will get you critically thinking about um, the way, how hard it is for the search engines to actually great, give great results that meet some percentage or all of the user's needs, the things that people care about. And thinking critically, becoming the search engine result page detective effectively um, to assess what is happening behind the scenes and what you need to make as a result of that. Um, and the first thing I always talk about here is thinking about explicit intent. You know, it's difficult to write great content at scale and to, you know, understand that content isn't just about managing keywords. It's not about matching keywords. It's really about thinking, okay, what types of things would people be searching for that would connect to the pages that I intend to write or I need to write? Um, so what explicit intent means, it's really, really important to key, key in on this, is that this query only does one thing. There's only one thing that someone really wants when they're typing in this query. That would be an, a, an intent, a query that has the intent that's explicit. I mean, it's obvious after I say it, right? I'm looking for the 2018 Dodge Caravan tire size. I, I love this example. Um, what is it? Is it 16 or is it 35? I don't know. Um, I should probably look at that for this, uh, for the case of this, uh, the, for this example. Um, but this is where you've got um, something. There's not a lot of uh, not a lot of difference in why I would be researching it. Maybe there's a little bit. Maybe there's a few nuance, but it's pretty pretty close to explicit intent. <clears throat> what you're going to see in that situation in the Google search results is that all of them are going to provide. Um, a mixed bag. You're going to get something that's more general and provides a, a lot of information, but then you're going to get things that will service explicitly this value. So obviously, if you're a search engine optimization professional and you're thinking critically here, what if none of the results are good? And this is something that matters to your business. And you can truly answer that question. You can answer that explicit intent and that matters to your business. Are you good enough? Are you, are you already have enough authority on things related to this so that you'll immediately perform? Maybe, maybe not. That's when you're gonna have to take and be a little bit more critical about your site. But thinking critically when you're looking at the SERP, when you're looking at the search engine result page and saying, are these great results? Are they providing the value that the user might expect with their explicit intent queries? Um, the next is really thinking about intent fracture. Um, so intent fracture is something that is, you know, I'm passionate about. If you've ever heard anything that I've spoken about, I say intent fracture like 15 times and everything. Um, so what this is, isn't ambiguous meaning. It's not synonyms. It's that the thing that someone typed in, they might type it in and they have completely different reasons for typing it in. They have different intent. There's fracture within the intent. I may be early stage awareness. I may be mid middle of the funnel. I may be late stage. I may be just looking for something completely different. There's a lot of spread in what I'm looking to accomplish by typing in this query. Some things that you might have uh, seen, you know, in your everyday world is, you know, uh, the example on this graphic here. You see some suggestions for making your query more refined. Some query variants that might lead to a more explicit intent of your query. Um, and what you'll also see is in the search engine results page, you know, the search engines don't have an explicit answer for you. So they might be providing various intents. They might want, if they type in CRM software, they might want to see some examples of vendors. They might want to see someone who's written long form content about comparing vendors. They might want to see uh, a definition about what is CRM software. I'm not sure, Google will say. And they want to provide, because it's fractured intent, they want to provide a a cornucopia of options that maybe will allow them to realize who and when are, are more people looking for these types of results. So when you're looking at, remember slide two, uh, when you're looking at doing your keyword research, some questions you need to ask yourself are, is this intent fractured or is it explicit? Is that what's driving that search volume? All right. 
This is where the light bulbs typically go off. I've got to write content that speaks to the entire intent story in order to do well. I've got to really tell the story that I'm an expert across the board for all of those variants, for all the reasons why somebody might be, re might be researching this, if I truly want to be an authority on that topic. And here's a cool example here that, you know, there's some vocabulary words in here, which I'll get into, but covering all the intent in one long form guide or a pillar page that tells the story that, hey, I actually know everything about this topic. My site, my business, I, I know it all. Um, I have a great sense of what this is about. I understand the nuance of the buy cycle here. I understand the types of things people might want. I understand that you might want to know about maybe jobs in this area, as well as a more of a robust definition. Um, so that's starting to get into kind of the first phase one of thinking like a content strategist who understands that really establishing yourself as an authority is job one for today's search engine optimization professionals with respect to content. Um, and it's not this, this is what commonly I get when I'm talking about this is, okay, well, you know, is this like, uh, you know, the word bat, you know, it's got a lot of different meanings. Nope. It's not that, you know, it's, uh, it's a completely different sentiment. So if your term, if your topic has multiple meanings, it's ambiguous meaning. Um, there's some really nerdy phrases for this. You can go, go, go look them up in the, in the natural language processing, uh, field. There's a lot of work that's being done by a lot of people, you know, like our team, uh, at market muse, but also, you know, some really amazing researchers in the field, really thinking critically about what does it mean to be about this thing? Well, I've first, I've got to get and, and know what type of this thing I'm actually looking up. Um, so again, this slice is a little bit more off of your search volume equation, right? So if something's ambiguous and it has fracture, how much true search volume am I actually fighting for? Um, and I'll add another level of, of, of specification about why this is the way to do things. Um, but let's just say I'm looking at bats and I think, oh, wow, I really need to be the number one performer. Well, it's not just about thinking about what is being serviced by the search engine result page. It's also thinking about, am I truly about the military definition of bat as well as the film? That makes absolutely no sense in most cases. Um, so we have a lot of search engine optimization professionals that are trying to build content packages around all of the ambiguous meanings because they think that that's going to tie them to success. This happens so rarely. It's, it's amazing. Uh, when I do see it happen, it's an aberration and it's where a site has massive authority on this topic and some, you know, search engine optimization professional got in and goes, Hey, maybe we should write a, uh, an article about this. I, I saw this on a, and I, I won't out, I won't out them, uh, on, on a client of mine. And someone sometime in the past, uh, wrote an article that basically listed a bunch of quotes, um, that were not relevant to their business and it was ranking and generating a lot of traffic. Um, and so Market Muse was giving them recommendations about that page. And they're like, oh, that, that page isn't important to my business. And I'm, I basically say to them, why do you have it there? Who gave you that great advice? Um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> do you really feel that that's representing your brand well and growing your authority on the core meaning of that term? Um, and again, you know, some steps that you can follow. It's to say, what, you know, don't necessarily use the groups that are off the shelf. Use the ones that you feel are, met, are, are important. I think that people who are looking for early stage awareness are valued at this much for me um, in these particular topics. Here's why, how much money I want to apply to my content efforts um, to support that. Here's some items that are, you know, I really, I need to tell the story that I have the best offering, the best product. So if someone's diving deep about this software package, I need for to represent myself as having the best feature. So I have to illustrate that I know everything about that feature or that benefit or that risk that someone might have during that purchase process. So building your own groups to classify your topics and classify your keywords in. I think that's a first step and really thinking about this. You know what else this is gonna do internally? It's gonna illustrate that you're not, you know, you're not like everyone else. You know, you're really considering the editorial team's uh, desires with their writing. You're considering the executive suite's desires and who they care about. You're considering the sales team and who they care about. Um, and you're saying, well, actually, this is the group that we really care about. And here's the content that we need to build to service those people's needs at these stages of the buy cycle. And this works even with e-commerce, with B2C. Um, no matter what, even if you're buying socks, there's still a buy cycle. 
Um, it may not be one that you 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 can really focus on, um, but there are all there's always a way to map it to the journey for someone to either become a member of your community, a uh, member of your publication, or to purchase uh, your products or services. Um, what that's going to lead yourself to get into is that the outcome of that mirror test, right? It's where am I not servicing the users? And is that the thing that's leading to me not do well? Um, do I have situations where I rank really well for a page and someone gave me the advice, well, man, you rank, you rank number one for that. Don't touch it, right? Terrible advice. <laughs> um, you know, if that page actually doesn't service the customer's needs, um, is that good advice? Um, is that the situation where I could be using that page for something else? I could be building support structure that does service the customer's needs. These are just one types, uh, some types of intent gaps um, that you'll see. But as simple as looking at the SERP and seeing maybe there's some stuff in there that as it isn't good is easy. Where maybe you have a page that isn't very good or isn't servicing the needs of the user. That's when it gets a little bit hard because you got to be self-aware. And you might have to confront somebody internally that wrote the page and say, hey, we need to adjust this. I had a great call with a client um, last week. Um, and they were talking about how when they find these, they will add modules to the page that they know may service the user's intent um, uh, of a particular type. And I'm like, that's beautiful. That's the type of stuff we're talking about. And you can get quick wins. Um, and you can also find situations where you can find a pattern in your historical content process that's always a mistake. So you can take all the topics and apply scalable content solutions. So let's say maybe I always wrote short form, um, short form one paragraph blurbs that defined defined the term that I was targeting. Um, and I, I know that I did that a thousand times. Well, I know I've got to go back and take a thousand steps. I know that's a large number um, to improve each one of those pages. <laughs> um, another here would be content gaps. Um, content gap, content auditing is very difficult. It's a it's a red herring as uh, in, in the world of, of people think that content inventories need to be done once a year um, and they think that they're extraordinarily hard. That's not exactly what I'm speaking about because, um, uh, you know, I like to make sure that this can be done at a page level or a small subgroup or at the site level to provide opportunities. But really thinking about what is missing from this page. And obviously, this is something that my business does, um, but it is something you need to be thinking about. Is this page, does this page actually comprehensive? Is it telling the story that I know what I'm talking about? And by, by saying that, I mean it includes concepts that a subject matter expert would have included if they covered this. So if you're covering the topic of content marketing strategy and you don't mention buyer personas and you don't mention target audience, well, you're not really an expert. You know, if you don't mention personas and you really, really knew about content marketing strategy. It's not just about writing the word content marketing strategy. That's not how the search engines work. You've got to be thinking about, it, does this page represent that I actually am an expert? Um, and that's when I mentioned, you know, areas of consolidation. That's where I'm, I'm trying to figure out where do I have scalable situations where I can improve pages? Where do I have new pages that I know that I need to build out and interconnect in order to weave that collection of content together? Um, and that's the you know that's the starting point that's really the getting out of the woods getting out of the keyword woods getting out of the you know the spreadsheets and starting to think like your customers um starting to think about what they're doing and starting to really you know hold up that mirror and say where who am i truly with my content uh am i getting away with bad content just because it ranks not cool it's not gonna last um, there's far too many people who are getting very good at this very quickly, especially if you're in a reasonably competitive space. You've got to put out those great pieces. You've got to engineer workflows that get users from content items to conversion pages or having modules on those pages that are going to convert them there and then. Um, <coughs> pardon me. Uh, and, and so the, the, the next thing I, I really think about is, is the, this, this journey effectively from going from keywords to topics, going from topics to thinking about intent is to say, what can I map my historical strategy to user intent? Can I map my current strategy to that? Am I misguided with what I think works? Or have I gotten advice that somehow might not work? And the most easy example for this is I go in, I use my audit, 
I look at all my pages that have traffic. I think that I need to eliminate all the ones that have no traffic. Still a practice people do. It freaks me out. That content could be wonderful. It could be servicing part of the buyer journey. Um, it could be contributing to the story that you are an authority. Um, so thinking critically about what those pages represent. And maybe they were orphaned out in left field on your site and they weren't even linked. Maybe you could have just improved your internal linking structure and that page would have contributed more to your authority. So it's not just about the content and the results and the rankings. Chasing rankings, chasing rankings for specific keywords and not thinking about does this page rank for hundreds of things? Only we're focusing on that one, what, that one particular term gets you in so many pieces of trouble. And one of them is you don't really understand your buyer journey. You don't understand whether you have content that meets those needs. And while I mentioned earlier um, that becoming a detective with the search engine result page is part of doing this well, it's also not the whole story. You really have to think about what would make sense. Would it make sense that you only had content about pricing? Because you think that that page, that when someone lands on a pricing page, will convert to the most sales. But think about that. Would a site that sells microphones only have information about microphone pricing? Absolutely not. It makes absolutely no sense. There's a very small niche of sites that would only have that information. And they're not going to rank for other stuff along that buyer journey. So be thinking about where, where do you have content across that journey? Are you comprehensive or are you not? The only people that can truly get away with those laser beams are ones sites that have aw awesome, massive amounts of authority. Not going to be the typical situation. If you're in that situation, it's awesome. And there's ways to take advantage of that too. Um, but maybe that's another story for another day. Um, and that, you know, you can really beat the heck out of your competitors if you find yourself in that spot where you can just write uh, content that hits a particular stage of the journey, always do well and not have to worry about infrastructure. But not all of us are going to have that luxury. I mentioned cluster a few times. Um, and that's really where I've got long form content that tells the story that I'm an expert. It branches off into pages that are you know covering extensively what it means to be about things. And you see those circles on the end. These are content that's contributing to this success. It might answer a particular uh, common prospect question. It might elaborate and get into more detail of something that was mentioned on its on the parent page. Um, really getting into the understanding, does this page support another page? It may then not need to get direct traffic. It may just have the value of supporting its parent um, and how much support content is needed um, to build out the, the whole story that I am the expert. These are tasks you have to do today to really compete with some of the larger, more successful publishers in your space if you're anywhere remotely competitive. I'll give you a great example of, of situations where, um, you know, not having cluster content. And actually, there's a, there's a great article. Um, by um, uh, Kevin Indig uh, that was recently published um, that you should look it up. And I know he's, he's doing a couple webinars um, and it's about internal linking. Um, but that's hard. It's hard to understand internal linking best practices. Here's an easy way of thinking about it. Do you have pages that only have one link to them and it's internal? Find them. Are they valuable or are they not? We call them one in ones, right? Somewhere, some reason, you've only got one way to get to this page. So what are you telling the search engines? You're telling them this isn't connected to anything. Um, it's not important. It might be, you might have to go six clicks away from your homepage to find it. Um, so why would you expect, if you're telling the story that this page isn't important, why would you expect for that to contribute to the value of your site? So finding those, you know, some one-on-ones or those orphan pages, finding ones that aren't built into the infrastructure of your site, the natural information architecture. Maybe it's because you're stuck to a particular content management system. Maybe it's because you, you know, just forgot about those pages. Um, try to figure out, do any of those things exist? And would you rather that page be part of a cluster of content or a collection of content that's contributing to your authority? Those are the first phases that get you to kind of grasp where 
you can have improvements with your site. Sometimes it doesn't even require doing any new content or updating existing content. Sometimes you will have to update existing content to make it mesh well with the collection of content. So adding a section, expanding it to be more robust, to cover more user intent targets, um, or to, uh, to have a section that will naturally connect to another page. Um, another cool example of this is bridge topic building. Um, so I'm really good on topic A. I've got a great cluster of content on A. I'm really good on topic C, but A and C, they don't really, they don't really connect too well. I've got 100 pages over here and 100 pages over there. Well, if I can figure out the connection, like, uh, you know, imagine, uh, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to space on the, uh, on the game show, but somebody else can fill that in the quotes where you connect two words together. Um, but the, uh, um, the, and what are those B topics? And they might not be perfectly aligned to your business, but if you were an authority on those bridge topics, it would connect the dots between A and C more simply, and it would have caused all boats to rise. Those are some really fun situations. That can be maybe you're launching a new brand. Maybe you're trying to uh, appeal to a different group that you never have before. You might have to start thinking about what are the concepts that tell the story that I should be about that C topic. I need to build that B topic to get there. <clears throat> if I've never written any content about the, um, you know, the marine industry, but I think that my, you know, my one page about CRM software for the marine industry is going to do well, I'm sorely mistaken. And it's about, I need to have content that tells the story that I actually understand that industry um, in order to bolster and build and enhance my credibility on that space. Um, so you can see there's a lot of different graphics. <laughs> it may not be this simple for you. It may be the situation where you have to connect the dots between a lot of different things in a lot of different situations. Um, so be critically thinking about your site Think about how it is structured. Do particular page types get abused? They don't get the type of integration because maybe it's politics. Maybe it's just the structure of your site or your CMS. That's all okay. We can fix all that, right? You can figure all that out. But be, by thinking about the fact that, hey, all of our stuff that relates to, you know, MRP software isn't in the same place. It's in 19 silos. I got to raise my hand. We got to figure something out here. You know, we got one hand over here and one hand. And we're not talking to each other with our content pool. If we were to make them work together, all boats are going to rise. We're going to be more of an authority on these things. We're going to have more pages ranking for dozens, hundreds, thousands of words, which is telling the story that we are semantically related to a lot of things. So, which is what you want. You want pages on your site that qualify to rank for dozens, hundreds, thousands of things. Because then you can tactically take next steps and say, hmm, there's a keyword in there that actually I, I could target with a explicit intent page, connect it to this one, and it's going to be even more successful than that page that's got a thousand stuff, a lot, a thousand words ranking for it. All of those types of tactical implementations of user intent profile are available today. And they're available. You can do them manually, they're painful. There's a number of solutions that will um, speed your journey up on that path. Um, but it all starts with step one. It's thinking about what you have today. It's thinking about what you want to do. And then, you know, figuring out, okay, what can, what can I get done in my, you know, in my current, um, you know, in my current practice. So just to uh, highlight and get into this from, you know, from a things to think about and takeaways, you know, um, user intent, is something that you need to understand specifically for your business model, for your target audience. It's not the same as what does something mean or disambiguation or ambiguous meaning. Um, it can be explicit or it can be very fractured. It can have a lot of different reasons why someone's searching for this thing. There is a Google SERP favored intent. So it's the thing that Google thinks is the best solution. Does that align with the way that you think? Do you think there's more pages that you need to create in order to tell the story that you deserve to be there in that favored intent, in that search engine result page? A lot of times people will only look at what's ranking and they won't think about what other stuff would need to be there for you to effectively qualify as an expert on that topic. Example there would be um, where 
you want to rank with a definition, but you've never written anything else on that topic. Odds are you're not going to rank well for that definition, for a what is type of query. Um, content mapping, mapping the existing content that you have to your customized um, description of the buyer journey. That's going to allow you to see where those gaps are. It's going to allow you to see maybe you had some tendencies in your historical strategy that weren't all that strong. Um, and then you can get into some of the more, you know, um, you know, the more exciting fields of understanding, uh, you know, does this search engine result page have, you know, special features on it? Um, am I going for, you know, the answer box? Am I, you know, so you're getting into those kind of next tier things um, after you master this and after you get that, um, you know, the, the situation where you understand where all your content sits, is it grouped together in a logical manner? Is it telling the story that you're an expert? Is it answering the questions that your users care about? You're putting your best foot forward. You're putting your brand's best foot forward. And that's what's going to yield results in the mid and long term. Um, and you're going to find a lot of quick wins and hits along the way. Um, so there's a couple things and references that I'll also mention uh, before we get into Q&A. Um, one of them is the Google Quality Raiders Guidelines. If you haven't ever read that, it's something you can download. It's a large PDF. It's about 250 pages. It looks at the way that human raiders at Google assess pages. And if you can apply any of those to your business, it can be a very powerful reference. I also mentioned Kevin Indig. Um, he's done some great work in this field, most recently about um, internal link structure. Um, and then Rob Bucci at um, now, well, Stat, Moz, whatever. He's done quite a bit of work on this as well. And they're doing some really great innovative things. So, and his BUCCI. Um, and then on link development with regard to, um, uh, there's some applications of this that relate to specifically internal, uh, sorry, inbound link development. Um, and that, uh, if you look at Roger Monty or uh, Martini Buster uh, from Webmaster World Forums, uh, I've been doing this for about 20 years. So I'm, I'm probably uh, uh, dating myself on, on some of these things, but he's done a lot of work on this too. So Kevin Indig, Rob Bucci, Roger Monty, and the Google Quality Raiders guidelines would all be great references to follow up to this presentation and start to put this into action today. Um, so again, I'll, I'm going to stop and take some questions. Um, and I uh, thank you so much. Again, if you haven't already, give St. Jude a pop. Uh, think about it. Um, is this something that you want to support? Share this um, uh, with your networks. Um, and, uh, and thanks again for the opportunity uh, from the 24 Hours of SEO group. Jeff, that was awesome, man. Yeah, Thank you so that was much. Dude. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Every time I hear you speak, uh, you get my gears turning, and and uh, you know, I I just uh, want to go out there and, and start building more topic clusters. <laughs> and I knew, I knew this would be one for Ben when I saw the topic. I yeah, like, right in his wheelhouse. <laughs> but but hey, man, we we do have a couple questions for you, so we'll, we'll jump right into that. Great. Right, um, yeah. Megan Mars. Um, Wants, and, and this is pretty much has to go around the own concept of uh, breaking your silo. Mm -hmm. um, so she asks, asks uh, how do you handle linking, link building for content clusters? Some people uh, seem to be very strict about only linking to other pages within the cluster, uh, but I've always felt that seems unnatural. Uh, and I would imagine with your inclusion of bridge content, that would require internal linking outside the cluster. What yeah. Uh, absolutely. And so you're speaking about explicitly internal linking, um, internal linking. Um, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's, there's going to be um, connections across the sites. Um, it's not just going to be within that one support structure. Um, because, I mean, you think about it, right? All topics have parents. You know, all keywords are topics. All topics have larger. It's a subset of something else. Um, so you, if you can logically do that, it's going to be you know, natural. You're also going to have internal source references that are going to be natural too. Um, you're also going to have connections to landing pages or other things that are going to be valuable. Um, I hate to call people out explicitly, but if you're <laughs> if you're looking at if you want to look at best practice on this, um, there are people that build up massive authority on topics just so that they can point out of their cluster at landing pages and try to get them to rank. So they'll build up massive authority with long form content intertwined and then they just smash power at these landing pages to see if that works and they'll try to do that at scale. So yeah, um, there's uh, there's the concept of um, 
I'm going to mess it. Eric Van Buskirk coined this phrase. Um, he loved that I mentioned it. A creep, <laughs> a, 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 a cluster creep. So if you've got a, a habit of always pointing um, to other topics that are unrelated, that's going to be weird. But if you can justify them logically, uh, editorially, totally okay. Um, and I think if, if you look at, uh, uh, and I, I, I said Kevin, Kevin Indig is going to have to give me a, 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 a prop medal today. I, I found the link that you referenced and I, I put it in the chat. Oh, yeah, so yeah. Yeah. If, you, if you look at that, you know, it'll support that. Um, it, it'll support that. And, and yeah, I mean, I always just, with anything linking related, especially even with inbound links, I always like to say, is it natural? I mean, natural, natural is your key. Can you make it look real natural? <laughs> um, you know, and that's some SEOs might go there, um, but really, is it natural? And if it's not, you've got to really question it. Um, right. And that's that's why you know an advertiser link in line is weird, right? That's why a um, uh, uh, you know something else. But but the other thing that I mean, it wasn't maybe not, it wasn't even Megan's question, but I'm going to answer it anyway, right? Because you know me, man. Um, <laughs> is uh, uh, external linking is is so important. If you're not thinking about external linking, um, that's another topic for another day. But sure you, need, is, you yeah. need to give me a, you need to give me a call. <laughs> um, we, we we have so many people are so afraid to externally link because historically people have told them not to. They've said it's it's going to hurt them. Um, externally linking strategically isn't linking to your competitors who are also going for your current keywords, or the keywords you're targeting. It's a linking appropriately to appropriate sources. It's also thinking about adjacencies. And what makes sense for you to point out, if you've got clusters that only link within themselves and don't link external, that's a negative signal. Right, and right. I can show you that, and it will kill you. If you see a competitor doing that. Have, on, have, have you isolated in your story. testing, um, have you isolated external linking as a variable by itself? And Absolutely. How, yeah, it, it's pretty powerful, huh? Oh, extraordinarily powerful. And the topics that you externally link to, Within that, strategically, um, strategically pushing to the right ones have much more of an impact than um, concepts that may not have semantic relatedness. Right, right. Just, so uh, what, what it boils down to is if you're looking at it from a user experience perspective, right. as long as it makes sense to help the user to link externally or internally, it's okay to break the silo as long as it makes sense to do, do so. Yeah, the one exception to that is don't be a knucklehead, right? Don't link to your competitor in your first page, your first sentence of your, of your article. Don't right. link to some, don't link to a page that's actually better than yours for servicing the same user intent. You know, we yeah. see this. Like if you're, people, <laughs> you're, you're writing the definition for what is CRM software, and then you got to link to Wikipedia. It's like Wikipedia says CRM software is, <laughs> is blah 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 blah. Well, don't do that. It's I mean, so there there, there are some exceptions of that silo. You don't want to break that. Um, uh, but yeah, it, it, it's don't tell tell the story that you've actually got the best page. Don't say somebody else does. Um, and if you if you write that part down, you'll get what I'm saying with the rest of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I've got a question. You know, you know. <laughs> I've got a question personally for you here, um, and I think it's something, especially affiliate SEO space when they're building their topic clusters, because the awareness about topic clusters is becoming more prevalent. More yeah. more people understand the concept, and they're trying to implement it. Mm -hmm. um, but when they build their topic clusters, they're basically looking at their competitors that have already done it already, and, and they're basically just matching that cluster. Um, mm -hmm. So if we're going to reverse engineer competitors, both with the topic cluster and the keyword map, what are we missing there? What are we losing by doing that? Ooh, that's such a great question. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, uh, I'll move my camera a little bit. Um, what pieces are missing in that equation? Yeah. Um, You've got to look at their historical publication uh, patterns. How long did it take them to build up their catalog of content? Um, what did they publish and when over time? Uh, what their frequency of uh, generating links with particular content types or individual content items? So their link velocity uh, for each of those pages and those page types. And you're effectively creating a history lesson for that competitive cohort what they did and what they saw along the way. Right. Now I see their end result. I had to compare that to mine. What's happening when I do this? What's my history been? So now when I look at that, I'm saying, 
okay, one strategy may be that I want to write equal to or better content than they have on everything. But I may all only want to write equal to or better content than the things they've done that works. Right. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Completely unfair. <Yeah. laughs> and it's, I mean, it's uh, it, that we, we, we have that as we, we deliver this as, as a service, as you know, right. and it's competitive cohort profiling. Um, and that is, it's, it's evil in its nature, <laughs> right? Um, but what does it yield? It yields beautiful things. It, it, it's to say that I can take what you did in a year um, and turn it into two, three, four months of effort. And I know when I come out the bottom of that, I'm going to have a better work product than you have. Sure. And, and, and that, that is something you can lather, rinse, and repeat for yourself and your brand. Um, and that's something that um, is is super tight. And that's uh, it does though require you understand maybe you're trying something that you can't do. You're punching above your weight. Sure. It's a topic you've never touched on, and you have to build more of a foundation before you even get into it. You can't just go writing about the iPhone tomorrow and right. expect that to work. It's not going to work. Um, so there is some there are some catches there, and, and understanding what those catches are is key. So. That's a great answer. I, I just wanted to seed that idea for everybody that uh, you can't always just turn out the same cluster just because a competitor is doing it. Uh, you got to work at some other factors. No, it All won't right. work. It won't work. Uh, most of the time, it does not work. When it does work, there's a series of data points that have to be met, and you have to be. It has to be a cohort, right? It has to be. It has to be equal to right. them in many ways. One of them is historical publishing patterns. So. Cool. Man. Well, we got a couple other questions here. Let's just get through it before the hour is up. Uh, Nick Rizzo asks, let's say you have one cl cluster fully developed and you have the option to go after three other clusters. How would you decide which cluster to go after um, after you already finished the first one? Um, that's a good question. Um, fully developed. Um, so it, it would depend on the answer to fully developed, what develop, fully developed means. Um, and Nick, it's a great question. Um, I would see what was my um, what was my path to get that done? Did I start with a pillar and then, or did I actually start long tail targeting and then I built out my pillar? I would want to know that before I answer this question. So I don't know. Sure. Um, but let's just say. You did it all at once, let's just say arbitrarily. Um, I would be looking at, for ease <coughs> for ease of success, I'd be looking at, do I have any historical success on those topics? That'd be step one. So even if it's not great, like I've got something to show for myself that I've got some rankings. I've got some topics that I've, I'm have i happy with the content. Um, that would be step, step one. I'd be looking at competitive cohort profiling up for two. I'd look to see how how long did it take for someone who I admire in the same target, um, and what did they do? What was their process, and how successful and quick was it? So, do I have any existing power? The mo, the momentum, right? Um, and then, what's the uh, competitive cohort look like? Um, and then, impact on my business, right? Do I have any historical reference of whatever my key performance indicator is that this is going to yield um, money? Reputation, <laughs> goal, whatever, goal, whatever your goal, goal is at the end of the day, points, you know, yeah. uh, 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 social media links, uh, you know, whatever it is that you are keen on. Do I have historical reference to that? Um, and is it going to be a meaningful enough of that? So that's where the commodity data of of volume comes in. But right, the the gotcha on that is make sure that you're counting the right volume, um, and make sure you're. Um, the most common mistake in people using volume is that the if they actually achieve the ranking for that term, they actually achieve the ranking for dozens more, hundreds more. The term pool multiplier on this phrase may be high, it may be low. Very few people know how to research that. Um, that's something to be thinking about, right? So if you go into it and in that you are, um, to get to it, to get to that topic's pinnacle, you're going to have thousands of other things. Are Is the collective of all that worthwhile? Um, that's the answer to the question of, of, of that. It's like, wh what do I replace my traditional volume measurement? Um, and that's, it's one is historical success, competitive profiling, and then 
my uh, uh, is it worth is it worth the, uh, the is the juice worth the squeeze? Yes, that's the phrase. There you go. That's a great answer, Jeff. And I just got one more question for, uh, for you, and then we'll let you go. Uh, Colin McDermott, he wants to know with uh, your access to data over at Market News, um, how, do, as far as the Medica update goes and uh, the concept of eat and uh, your money, your life, um, have you guys seen any changes that you've been able to track? And what recommendations do you have to build trust? Yeah, that's, and that was. I get um, a number of uh, groups that I participate in. Uh, um, there's, you know, obviously the one that Vin, Vincent, you and I are, are both in the Rodian community. There was a lot of discussion um, about this, and we've done extensive research of that particular update. Um, also, that update um, wasn't the only time those types of sites have seen major fluctuations. Um, and Q the QRG has a great uh walk through uh the google quality ratings by of why why your money or your life and of eat um how do you develop uh how do you develop this in a um quick way or a, a keen understanding it's when you, it, it's really about competitive analysis um it's who are the players in this space and um it am i able to get away with content at this particular level of quality um and then, you know, looking in the mirror and saying, am I okay with that right now? Am I okay that that's what I'm going to put out? Um, a great example of this is, and there's Nick, uh, a great example of this is in, in, in legal. Uh, we have a lot of legal clients. Uh, and in non-competitive spaces, they weren't impacted as much. Sure. Uh, and, and when it was competitive, it was. Um, so... But then it's also about, you know, do you really want to represent yourself with mid, mid frame? And uh, I don't think Nick's ever seen me without my beard. I, 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 I shaved. <laughs> I haven't. I, I was surprised. Man. <laughs> I know. I come completely uh, slim. I, I looked like Grizzly Adams last week. Um, I, my, I sent a picture to a, a, to a relative and, and, and she's like, who is that? And I'm like, that's, that's me. Uh, uh, yeah, I guess we haven't seen each other in a while. Um, so, yes, I clean him today. Uh, but yeah, the, the, um, the, the, the situation is that there are there were situations where content that was low quality, they were resting on the laurels of pages that really weren't great. Right. And or they engineered pay, site structures. They, they engineered site structures to try to work around historical pain. Um, if you look at the list and I, I don't want to dox anybody on this. If you look at the list of sites that were most heavily impacted and you look at their historical publishing tendencies, you can find the points when they actively tried to engineer their way out of historical low quality content. That to me was the guiding light to our research, which we were able to then program into our, into our technology to assess this. Um, it's we figured out that there were, there were things that happened that, you know, you hate to say it, People thought they got away with it, yeah, right? Yeah. And and uh, and and they didn't. There were people that were caught into caught in the the, the nets, though, unfairly. I um, mean, and, and I like to think that stuff gets, um, you know, uh, remediated over time. But I really don't have any personal experience with that. But there's also situations where, you know, people had their stuff hit with that update, and also the one that was two months prior, and they're like, "Yeah, I kind of suck." <laughs> Yeah, maybe I need to not sell this info product anymore, um, yeah. or or something else that, that that gets to do. So I think that to establish your um, to establish what you can get away with now is competitive landscape. To um, uh, if you're in a zone, a, a, your money or your life zone. If you're in a um, certainly, and I you know we have a lot of customers in big pharma, life sciences, um, you know, very you know large businesses. Don't mess around with governance. Um, regulatory compliance, um, you know, don't even ride the edge on that stuff, you know, play it straight. If you've got those things in your head and, and then, if you know, legal insurance, um, uh, a couple other field, like those types of zones, a little bit grayer area. Um, I think, <coughs> don't think that the same rules apply to you that apply to the site that's been around for 20 years that has a million pages of content 
that's a, a gap I've seen people think like, well, um, <laughs> no, 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 does it? I can too. I, you know? I, I really like the term you used, historical pain. Yeah. Uh, and, and I guess for the layman, that would just mean that if you don't have a history of high quality content, it's going to be hard to fake that. And I think a lot of us yep. call that domain authority, but it's really not. It's it's uh, a history of putting your money where your mouth is, really, and, and putting out uh, valuable content. Yeah, and and, and 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 you know, a few people got away. Few people got away with it in those and get away with it over time. That's okay too. It's going to happen. Um, but I felt really good about that and, and three or four of the other updates that were less um, published, um, that it's really going the way of the type of thing that, you know, people like Nick, see, I got to give him a vouch, right? People like <laughs> Nick, people like I have been talking about for over a decade and it's quality. Um, you know, when I was at my previous uh, company, we had a large editorial team in house, you know, large content contributors, and it was quality, quality, quality first. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, it may not feel that great today because it's hard, but it's really going to feel good tomorrow when, you know. You can bank on that content for two years from now or 10 yeah, years from now. Yeah, power power long. 13. I mean, my, yeah. my most, I mean, you know, in my previous network, my most powerful link that I acquired was from uh, 2000. And it's still sitting there. There I you won't go. Tell you what it is, but it, I mean, it's still <laughs> there, and it's still the most powerful one. Yeah, please don't tell us what it is. <laughs> no, you get you get get blown up. Um, but you know, it, it's it's not traditional, right? It's not the it's not the way that makes sense. It doesn't give you the immediate dopamine rush, and but that's got to be okay, and you got to make that case internally, which can be hard. So. Yeah, SEOs have to forego instant gratification. It's just part of the job. Exactly. Uh, but uh, cool. that, that was hey man, that was awesome, dude. And, and I would love to talk to you about this all day long. But uh, it's uh, Mr. Nick. Good Nick is up here, <laughs> coming at you from Philadelphia, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> we Garrett did that for the longest time. He sat in front of a green screen, and he was always uh, in front of a skyscraper or something crazy. <laughs> when, 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 in my internal, in our internal meetings, we use Zoom, and you can put. Uh, people will say something, and I have like fourteen different screens. So all of a sudden, they'll say, you know. Jungle, and then a jungle will appear. <laughs> uh, I'll let you stay too serious, right? <laughs> well, there you go, guys. That was Jeff from marketmuse.com. And uh, right. definitely, you guys put out some great content on the site, too. So I'll definitely check it out because uh, if you want to learn more about topic yeah. clusters, that's the place you want to you want to. Uh, there's some really that. good. Yeah, there's some really good articles. A lot of them are written from uh, Steven Jeske. He's our lead content strategist. Um, We've got some really great stuff. We do a lot of great webinars uh, as well. A uh, little plug. Um, got one coming up with news cred. It's going to be lights out next month. Um, and then uh, if anyone wants to email me questions, uh, Jeff at marketmuse.com, uh, please feel free. No matter how uh, fun or ridiculous they might be. <laughs> Thanks. Cool, man. Well, that Thanks was, so much. Uh, that was the, uh, that was the antidote to uh, all the crazy case studies going around that internal links don't work and domain authority <laughs> doesn't exist. So. Um, yeah. Hopefully, some of you guys that have read that and asked me questions about it over the last few months have been watching. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Nice and meta. See ya. <laughs> Bye, guys. Yeah. Thanks. See ya. Nick, what up, buddy? Hey, man. How, uh, How are you? Hey, doing? Can you hear me all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, the way this works is we're going to mute ourselves because if we don't, we're going to steal the screen from you while you're presenting. Um, so you can go ahead and do your presentation and then at the end we'll unmute and we'll go into a Q and A. Awesome. Um, the first thing we're going to do is, but, uh, is Kevin. Kevin. First, really quick, we got to, we got to hit people up for donations cause we haven't seen one for a bit other than Ben just threw 32 bucks in the pot. Yeah. Oh, you guys, uh, what are you guys up to? Ben? <laughs> What's that? What are you guys up to? Ben, ben, ben just got 6,500. Uh, 6, yeah. It's where? 6,500. 6, 6,500. Ah, oh, cheap bastards. All right. Well, you know, get all the big We already beat last years. year, so uh, I'm <laughs> thankful. But I definitely want to get over 10,000 uh, by tomorrow morning at the very least. Hopefully. Oh, yeah. Let's do it, guys. We've got people that, you know, you got to pay thousands to go see at conferences if they were all speaking on the same day. They're giving up their time to raise money. Um, it's a great cause. We've told you some stories. We've told you about some of the great work they're doing. Um, I know it would mean a lot to all these speakers that have given up their time, especially Nick, who's back. 
second year running. Um, last year supported us despite being in the middle of um, some kind of crazy merger and acquisition hell. So uh, come on, yeah, he's back time. again for year two, big supporter again this year. Give him some support to just jump on, even if you can only afford five, 10 bucks, jump on, make a donation, motivate Nick, and let's, uh, let's enjoy the presentation. Cool. Uh, cool. I'm muting myself right now so I can go promote your, your uh, presentation. So uh, I'll let you guys have at it. All right. So um, I'm going to do something really different, um, and I'm going to do a presentation that I've never done before in any capacity. Um, and it's just my mind has been probably like, oh, shit, it's March tomorrow. So like two and a half months, I've, my, I've, my head's been really deep in like the business side um, of everything that we do and really thinking more strategically about like the, the aspects of building and growing and, and sustaining a business. Um, it's what led to the idea for a new product that I'm working on. Um, that's really more of a passion project than anything else. But uh, because it's like so front of mind, uh, that is what I wanted to talk about today. Um, so that is what I'm going to be. So let me know you're able to see my screen. Yes. Yeah, we're all good, buddy. All right, cool. Um, so yeah, so this is going to be um, sort of a step-by-step -step breakdown um, on how to scale uh, some existing form of business. So either a side hustle, a freelance business, or a small agency. You know, something in the ten to twenty thousand dollar a month range, ideally, is where you'd be at right now, and how to get that sort of to the the point um, to the hundred thousand dollar per month revenue point where um, there's really opportunities to dial in efficiency, delegate the work get your time back and like start to really enjoy life um, a lot more, start to build more of the life you want and, and feel less like you're riding a, a, you know, a dumpster fire on a roller coaster. Um, but first, um, just a quick story. Uh, so I want to rewind back to 2007. Um, this was my first agency. Um, I'm not in this picture because I'm taking this picture, but these are the three guys that I founded it with. Um, this was in a house that we rented. None of our houses were this nice back then. Um, but this was a, a house that we had rented for a weekend to try to, you know, get all the, the work knocked out. Um, and that agency was called Atomni. Um, and you can see, uh, I, I included an extremely embarrassing sketch from that I found from one of like my notebooks at the time on like when I was trying to come up with ideas for what our first web page might look like. Um, and then there was actually one of that, 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 that's an actual one of the banners at the top there. Um, that was our website and that was our phone number at the time. Um, and that was one of the slides that went into our slider. Um, so I was able to actually dig this up too. This is kind of fun. Um, this is what our website actually looked like back then. Um, pretty big mess uh, overall. Um, web design has certainly changed a lot in the past 12 years. Um, but we were fortunate enough to actually somehow land clients back then. Um, and I loved my, uh, my sneaky trick for anybody who's really into SEO, you'll get it that though the, uh, the anchors that I have up in the main navigation are actually links that I had in the header file down to those service detail pages, um, which did allow us to rank for when it was you know a much easier time to rank for a bunch of keywords back in the day, like you know SEO companies, Philadelphia, and, and you know user experience design, which didn't really exist back then as a term. But um, but this was the this was our site, um, and so you know if you fast forward to today, uh, I'm not going to make you deal with this whole thing um but i just you know it's a kind of a joke video so i'm going to show it so if you take that for my first agency and fast forward all the way to today and you look at you know just a couple quick screen caps of the amazing team i get to work with and you know part of our beautiful space here at least in our philadelphia office um it's like a, it's a whole different world um how it's all come um and you know where we were versus where we are now uh, again i'm not going to subject you guys to the whole thing um there we go and this is our new site that we just launched into last week. So just a small shout out to my team. I had nothing to do with this, um, so I can't take any credit. Uh, I'm just really proud of everybody that we're able to get this done because um, like all agencies, our website is the worst one out of everyone that we work on um, because all of our time goes into you know trying to make sure we can deliver for our clients. Um, so a quick clarification on what this, what this is and this isn't. So what this presentation is not going to be is, and, and the whole point of sort of this, this you know, latest brainchild that I've put together is I'm not going to be teaching anybody, you know, a new professional skill, you know, that clients will pay you for this. This is not a, this is how you start a business. This is not, 
you know, uh, this is how you find something that like, this is how you create your first product, or this is how you do market research to find out, you know, a service that people will pay you for. Um, that's all like just basic hustling. That's like entrepreneur, ism 101 um so like i can't teach you how to hustle and get your first contracts um you know if you had a like in point three is it further for clarification sort of how to figure out your own shit and get the ball moving this is way more about you've gotten a little bit of traction you put in the time and energy you're feeling exhausted you don't have a framework for like how to take it from where you are to where you want to get it this is that framework this is like this is specifically on how to scale um the quick obligatory about me slide um, so this new um, like little pet project I'm running uh, is is called 7F Agency. Um, currently, the founder and CEO from the future. I'm the co-founder of a digital asset investment company called NK Tech Ventures. I'm a partner at Traffic Think Tank with Ian Howes and Matt Barbie. And in the past, I've built and sold. So that first agency uh, back in the day at Tommy, we ended up actually building a, a CMS uh, that we called uh, Molecule. Um, which is at the time sort of now it seems like funny foreshadowing that I've got an agency called From the Future and I built a um, uh, CMS back in the day called Molecule because it feels like there's a connection there even though there's probably not. But it was like a super thin, lightweight CMS built on CodeIgniter. Um, but Dietz and Watson ended up buying that co the company from us just because of that piece of software, not because we were a good agency or we had any of our shit together. Um, then went on to build a Japanese consumer review website that me in a very small team considering um, we were able to scale to a few million visits per month in organic traffic before selling it 18 months later. Um, then I sold a shitty blog that I built and a, a lead gen business, uh, an SEO lead gen business that I used the blog to build, um, sold the, the lead gen business first to an agency in San Diego and then sold the, the blog afterwards, sold countless domains, dozens of lead gen websites. And of course I have sold my soul to Google. Um, so, the, the, the point of what I want to sort of get into today and run through um, is this, this spot that um, folks who get a freelance or side hustle type business, you know, to five, ten thousand dollars a month and, and decide to make the jump full time and, and are able to hustle and grind and get that, you know, ten thousand dollar, fifteen, twenty thousand dollar a month uh, reoccurring revenue in, in client contracts. Um, they sort of end up in this pool, uh, the agency owner pool, I like to call it, where they're just treading water. Um, and, and the reason they're treading water is because they've got these three core issues that they don't really have an idea on how to figure out. And, and those are sales resources and profitability, um, all of which you need to, to not only sustain, but to build a baseline and a foundation for growth. And the, the most common issues when I talk to agency owners, which I do every single day, because there's 300 or so of them in traffic think tank that I get direct access to, and I get to talk to and work with, um, which is like help what helped me realize like, why I'm so passionate about working with other agency owners because it, it's this, there's like a sadism to it and I almost feel guilty enough that I just want to help help folks um, is that there, when it comes to sales, they don't really have a plan. Um, like there's not really any predictability to where the next sale is coming from. Um, if they get leads in the door, they have some way to generate new leads, even if it's just, you know, cold outreach emails and, and LinkedIn pitches, they don't have a process for how to nurture those leads along through, you know, to, to a close. Um, they don't have any sales management skills. They don't understand what it is to, to build a pipeline, uh, manage that pipeline, uh, have strategies to move stuff from a warm, you know, a warm lead to a warm qualified lead to a pitched lead to a qualified pitched and priced lead uh, to a closed sale. Um, that the skills that come with actually selling, so not just lead gen, but you know how to qualify that lead and then pitch them and then close them, um, and then you know ultimately it's sort of at the very top of the funnel. Um, most people are are sort of lost on um, how to generate leads in the first place, which is why you see all of these this continuous stream of these new LinkedIn pitches that everybody watching watching this gets, and you kind of wish you could reach through LinkedIn and squeeze people by the neck and sometimes rip their heads off because of how annoying all of the LinkedIn pitches are for you. Like I will, you know, are you, are you looking to generate more leads for your agency? We have a proven framework for blah, 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 bullshit, bullshit, bullshit on how to generate leads for LinkedIn. And it's, I've tested four or five of them over the past two years. I think one we, um, and I'm not gonna call them out, but they're very famous, but it's not my, it's not my business to ruin their business. But um, we spent 40 grand with them, four grand a month for 10 months, didn't generate a single lead, not one fucking lead. Um, because we sell a premium service and they don't understand our business. So they don't know how to sell our business. Like you are always going to be the best fit to generate leads for your business. Don't outsource your lead gen, build systems for lead gen, um, which moves me on to resources. So 
getting a, like the initial traction for a team, I think is the hardest part. I think getting to like that point where you have enough revenue and you have enough demand and sort of management that you can get to five employees, I think is, is the hardest part. Most small agency owners, consultants, freelance grind experts are, you know, managing dis disparate groups of contractors and remote employees. They don't have any documentation. There, there's no training for those folks. Um, they don't understand the separation of duties and like how certain contractors should be specialized in certain areas. Uh, they don't, and they're lacking just general systems for accountability um, to, to understand like what is the utilization rate of their resources. Um, and then the last part is like business management 101. And this is something that um, if I could like go talk to, you know, the agency owner, for, you know, V1 of myself in 2007, um, I would probably smack myself across the face and, and say, you know, like go spend the little money that you have and hire an accountant, like find an accountant that understands small business or understands the agency business model. And like, even if you're like, if you're you hire an accounting coach, if you need it, like, there's so much money lost, um, squandered by agency owners because they don't understand like the, the structures that are built to like help them hold on to more of their money. Um, I interrupt you for a minute, Nick. I absolutely agree. With you. This stuff is so crucial, and we've wasted over like the last eight years. I don't know how much time and money because, like, I know basic accounting, but working with someone that truly understands this stuff, the amount of money. You know, it might seem scary at first to go hire an accountant that you're paying a good chunk of your initial agency's money to. Well worth it. And understanding the stuff that it looks like Nick's going to talk about. Super important stuff. Yeah, it's it's wild though. Like like how much like we put off we put off getting like hiring a professional accountant. Like we used H and R Block for like for for FTF back when it was IFTF in 2014 when it was like a when it was like a a just a tax shelter for like me personally and like my and my master key yeah. research revenue like i used an h&r block consultant that i found out later like cost me tens of thousands of dollars in additional taxes and was just an idiot yeah. um like it and like it and it took like i took a couple like i had to jump through a few hoops i fell victim in 2015 to a really slick marketing campaign from a guy who has a company called startup cpa it wasn't until we started, like I talked, I like I met with and talked to like a more, you know, experienced accountant for like a much bigger company that I ran into at, a, at an event somewhere and started asking him some questions to realize that like my guy was also kind of an idiot. Um, like it took a couple tries to really find somebody that knows what the hell they're talking about. Um, but it is night and day. Um, between that as like step one and like the next step being like hiring a bookkeeper, like even a part-time five hour a week bookkeeper to get you set up on QuickBooks and to like consolidate like all of your, like your expenditures each week. Um, you know, really understanding um, how that works. Uh, like they just from the accounting and then outside of accounting, um, there's, there's these other two pieces, which is like, one is like having arbitrary pricing models. Um, so like, I can't tell you how many times I talk to, to agency owners or I talk to independent consultants and they tell me their prices and I'm like, like, okay, cool. If that's your price, like what's that based on? Oh, that's just the market price rate based on what? That's what I heard, you know, Joe Schmo was billing. Okay. But like, you don't know what Joe Schmo Schmo's cost structures are. You don't know what his resource structures are. Like you don't know what his lifestyle is. Like prices should never just be made up. Like, yeah, like you're going to have a range for any industry. But like your prices should always be based on a minimum gross and net profit margin based on like what your cost structure is or will be in the next six to 12 months. Um, and which leads me sort of into like another thing that most first time founders and especially agency owners do is they don't take advantage of the fact that like an LLC is a fantastic pass through entity until you get to a point where you want to pay yourself a salary. And then a lot of people think they have to make the jump to being an S corp and don't realize like you can set your, like you can, you can elect to be taxed as an S corp and still remain being yeah. an LLC. And the yeah. reason you want to be an LLC still is not just for the protection, but because LLCs can be owned by other LLCs, whereas S corps cannot be, be owned by other LLCs. So like you limit your recapitalization uh, potential by like either starting or, or starting or sticking with the wrong legal entity. Cool. Moving on. So um, these are the pools of, of crap that you're drowning in. And then I would say these are, you know, these are the three biggest problems that are driving that, that drowning. Um, and those buckets are, you know, uh, agency owners inability to manage their priorities, their time and their profit. Um, the general issues with priority management is that, you know, everything is important. Their hair is on fire. And if everything is important, you just say nothing is. And that, that's a reoccurring theme. 
um, that you'll see again here, but they don't, they're, they're lacking a process for priority identification. Um, they don't have any systems for accountability for holding themselves to priorities, let alone their, their resources or employees. Um, and there's just a general lack of focus on what the big initiatives actually are. Um, there seems to never be enough time. This especially is the case if it's, if it's just you and like two or three freelancers on Upwork or like you and like one or two local contractors who might even be in your same country. And then you've got like a handful of contractors that you're trying to juggle or VAs. You're working 60 hours a week or more. There's no concept of time management there. And, and you don't have any system for managing your time. Like there's, there's no, there's nothing standing in the way of, of people um, whether it's your clients or your employees uh, or, or new, chasing down new sales leads, taking up your time and eating as much of your time as they want to. Um, and then profit always seems to be um, the, last, um, the last element of, of any new business or, or young business that gets attention. Um, and, it, and the reason it gets so neglected is because nobody tracks it. Um, and, and nobody tracks because nobody wants to. It's, it's not fun to track profit and, and to realize like you're, you have money coming in and you're able to pay yourself and just enough to keep, keep the lights on. You know, um, that you, you can pay your rent and you can pay your utilities and you, you have enough to like get, well, you can, most people on here aren't going to understand what a Philly special is, but it's a PBR and a shot of Jack Daniels. Um, but like, you know, they're $5 pretty much at any dive bar in Philadelphia, but you, you may have just enough to get yourself the Philly special that you need every Friday night. Um, but you're not, you're not making any money. Um, and the reason you're you're in a you know a profit break you're in a break even or even a potentially a profit loss situation where you're living on credit is you're not passing through eligible expenses. Um, your prices are too low. You're not including soft costs and variable costs in your consideration for your prices, and you're not tracking like the actual performance and resource utilization of your your, your team members. So the solution is actually really easy. Um, it's implementing a systems model. Um, very simple concept, very hard to execute without guidance. Um, but every single common agency problem, you know, can be fixed with, um, with, with a system design, by putting a system in place um, to address and, and refine and, and ultimately fix um, these problems within the management structure of your agency. Um, how do you implement a, a systems model? Um, and the answer is, is painfully simple as well. It's just like eating an elephant, um, you know, one bite at a time. Um, so you have to start someplace. And, and this is the first piece of the, the framework. And this is a very simplified version of a framework. I'm taking 12, 12 months of training and I'm condensing it down into what will probably be a 40 minute presentation. Um, so stick with me that this is a little oversimplified, but the concepts are, are the bedrock of, of everything you need to be focusing on. Um, so time, it all starts with time management. If you don't have time to be working on the right things that are gonna move the ball along for your agency or your small company, it doesn't matter what, you know, without the time, you're not gonna get shit done. Um, so you need to, to put something in place that can be your gatekeeper. Um, and the best thing to do to start with there is to be your calendar. Um, use your calendar as a roadmap, make that roadmap intentional each and every week, block out time. Um, so, so you have, so, so all of the time is accounted for. There's a place for everything and everything is in its place. Um, once you have created time and allocated that time to your priorities, you, 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 or in order to allocate the time to your priorities, you need to understand what those priorities are. Um, the way to do that is to list out the tasks and activities that you should be working on um, and focus on the concept. And, and I'm going to get back to this a little bit later, but focus on the concept of, of your one thing. What is the one thing you need to be doing every day? Uh, learning how to delegate um, is wildly difficult. Uh, everybody talks about it. Uh, it's stupid hard to do. Um, it gets easier again if, you, if there's a process behind it. If, if you have a process to use on, on to to support how to delegate, de the actual uh, activity of delegating become much easier. Um, to start doing that, you want to group your finite tasks together. Finite means that there's a start and a finish. It's a task that you can actually check off and say yes, that task is done. Uh, like sending out invoices, for example, um, or creating invoices so they can be reviewed, so then they can be sent out. Like right that right there, that's three finite tasks. Um, but starting to think about tasks in, in finite chunks and then grouping them together. Um, once you've got your time freed up, you know what your priorities are and you've delegated out the things that you shouldn't be working on so you can focus on your priorities, then you have to work on crafting your offer. Um, your, I, a, an initial offer should be a high value offer, a trust offer as I like to call it, um, and you're gonna need to start testing it. Um, the first two or three you create, maybe the first five you create, they probably will fail. You'll sell one or two, but you're not gonna build a business on them. It doesn't mean they're wrong. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't continue to try to, to sell those offers. It just means they need refinement and you may need additional offers. 
Um, and the way that you're going to get to test those offers is by starting to build sustainable sources of, of fuel for those offers or, or a, an engine that will generate leads for you on a daily, weekly or a monthly, weekly and daily basis. So diving into each of these first. So again, here's, here's the first, here's our first five sprint items on the framework. We're going to dive into the first one. So again, time management, you need a gatekeeper. It's the only way it's ever going to work. Fortune 1000 companies have executive assistants. You don't have probably the 50, 60, 80, hundred thousand dollars you're going to need to hire a qualified executive assistant. That's not going to take a tremendous amount of time uh, for you to train around your business and how you want to operate your schedule and your time. So you can use your calendar. But in order to use your calendar, it needs to be intentional and you need to do it every week. You need to build a habit around it. Plan your entire week. Put that shit in your calendar and start to wrap your mind around the very simple phrase that you tell to every single person in your life, your partners, your spouse, your employees, everybody. If it's not in your calendar, it doesn't exist. Honor that. Respect that. Make other people honor and respect it too. You'd be amazed how much of a difference it makes. Delegation. First part about delegating is understanding that you're doing shit right now that you shouldn't be. Every single thing you do every single day has value. Sometimes that value is a lot. Sometimes it's worth hundreds of thousands of dollars for an hour. Sometimes it's, it's very little. Um, invoicing, to come back to that example, is a great example. Creating an invoice is a $10, $15 an hour task. Reviewing those invoices should be you to start, but eventually that can be handed off probably pretty quickly. Sending out those invoices is a $5 an hour task. You're probably doing all three of them right now. Um, and that's taking time your time away from focusing on much higher value uh, operations because you're doing work that you shouldn't be. Um, value by definition has a price and you need to start paying other people to do the low value activities. The easiest way to do that again is to map out what's finite and measurable so you can put a price tag on it. Um, coming back to the idea of prioritization. So you need to focus on your one thing. Um, there are activities that you are doing every day as a business owner, as an agency owner, that only you can do. Um, it'd be, and, and the way to think about that is it would be way too expensive for you to get somebody else that can execute them at the level that you can. This, this, this may be talking to clients. This might be building proposals, um, pitching, having pitch calls with clients, client management, or probably more so than anything, um, the strategy, like creating the strategy that you're selling to your clients is something that if you had to go hire somebody else out to, to hire somebody else to do that, that was going to execute it at the same level that you are, it would be wildly expensive and it would destroy your margins. So that's what you need to be focusing on doing. Just focusing on the high value, like the high value tasks and activities and getting all the other crap that you shouldn't be doing off your plate. Um, but you need to have the, those buckets, those priority buckets created and they need to be clear, uh, clearly defined if you're going to, to start the process of handing off that work and delegating the work that's not your priority. Um, this is, is a, an abstract idea and it, it's, it's hard to try to, to fit this in because um, I spent an entire month on this um, in the program. So it's hard to try to talk through this in just a few minutes, but um, designing your offer. Um, and the best way to figure out what an offer is, um, is starting first with agitation. Uh, like what creates the most agitation for your customers? It doesn't have to be that there's, like your solution and your offer are two different things. Um, when, it, when it really comes down to it. A solution is more long-term, it's a partnership, it's an engagement. Your offer is not your engagement. It's not how it's not your hourly price, it's not your, your minimum retainer. Your offer is packaged like a product. Um, it's low cost, but it's very high value. It sets a very clear expectation. It creates a roadmap that in and of itself um, create, creates clarity and offers value, but it's not, it's not the execution of those roadmap items. It's just the, the roadmap of themselves. It's the design of what that roadmap is. And it needs to scratch the itch to, to, to create trust, which is why I like to call it a trust offer, but create trust and fulfill that, that sort of um, smoke and mirrors feeling that a lot of customers have that you're probably, uh, you know, that a lot of customers or potential clients get from a lot of the other consultants or agencies that they're talking to. Uh, and you can use that as your um, basis for separation. It's what makes you different. Um, you're, again, figuring out what that offer is is going to take some time. So like a, a good example is for us, um, when we were purely a technical SEO agency, so before uh, our two acquisitions last January, um, one of our um, offers that we ran a couple um, cold outreach campaigns around was offering a, um, a free site crawl. At first, we offered a free site audit. Um, it was We were offering the same thing, we were calling it something different. People's expectations for what an audit was were way higher because an audit means something different than a crawl. So like we learned very quickly after doing a few phone calls that like, we had screwed up our offer by by one word. 
when we replaced the word audit with the word crawl, people suddenly the, the perception of value was much, much higher. We were offering to do a free crawl for any of the websites that we reached out to up to 100,000 pages. And then we would, we would diagnose the top five or six things wrong with those sites on a half an hour phone call. And that was all free. And, and you know, there, there's no lower cost than free. Um, so if you can do a free offer, it's great. You may not be able to do a free offer at, at, at first. Um, you know, one thing that we had, we had also done as a separate test was to offer a, you know, a thousand dollar audit um, for sites up to a hundred thousand pages that worked reasonably well. It didn't work as well as a free offer. No paid offer will ever work as well as a free offer. Um, but that offer, again, it needs to, it needs to create trust. It needs to display value and it needs to give a roadmap. The beautiful part about showing people a site crawl and talking them through a bunch of dashboards that we're showing them on a screen share from deep crawl is we can very clearly show them all the shit on their site that's messed up. And we can talk about why, it's affecting them poorly and what they can do to fix it. We're not fixing it, but we're just telling them what's wrong and we're telling them how to fix it. Um, you'd be amazed at what that does for generating, uh, you know, uh, requests for proposals. Um, this is again, it, this, I spent like two months on this. Um, so it's really hard to try to talk through this, but the idea is I hope I can, I hope I can at least get through the idea. Um, and that is the idea of building a growth engine. Um, this is often misconceived. This term has become somewhat ubiquitous within just the startup marketing SaaS agency world, which is cool because I love the idea of a growth engine. It's, I think it's an accurate reflection, um, but it's not a single thing. It's not, the problem I think is people hear growth engine and they think of a singular thing. They think of an engine like an engine from a car. It's this one thing and you need one engine and that engine will, will run your car for as long as you, um, you put gas in it and oil it and all that other shit. And while that's true for a car, you're running a business, it's not a car. So it's not a single thing you build one time. Um, building a true growth engine is an endless process, uh, and that process is of addition. You're constantly building new cogs, and you're putting those cogs in place um, all over the internet, and you're you're putting a little bit of time uh, into them to test them, to spin those those the flywheel, you know, spin those cogs, cre create lead flywheels. The ones that start to work, put more attention, make them as big as you can. But the idea is that they're sustainable and that they're self-sustaining more than anything. Once you get them up and running, leave them be, go on and, and build another one and then build another one and then build another one. A big part of what I do when I dive into this in the program is I actually show all the different lead uh, growth engine components um, that I've built for my agency. And I, I break down like all of the specific data and I show all the leads that each one sends every single month, week and day. Um, and and it, 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 I, feel like, I think it really helps to, to paint a complete picture of the, the why and the how. But it's, again, I just don't have time to get into like that whole thing um, right now. Um, so once you've got that first, those first five pieces, um, knocked out and again, this is a gross oversimplification because I didn't include sales in here, like the actual process, like creating a sales process, because it, it's a whole one of these in and of itself, like sales process, uh, you know, it can be broken down into a five step, um, linear, linear vector, if you will, um, just on its own. So this is also oversimplified, but, um, I'll come back to sales a little bit, but but this is again just picking up where we left off from the last piece. Um, so your process design. Um, people get like hives when they hear that word. Um, you know, do you have processes? Do you have documentation? Like it makes your eyes glaze over. You might feel cramps in your stomach or constipation. Like everybody hates and loathes the idea of of doing what is what is maybe only exciting to tax accountants. Um, but it's the only way you're ever going to be able to be effective. And so you have to start somewhere. And what, what I've found is that it's not hard to start building, you know, building process documentation and designing your processes. If you break them down into tiny little bite sized chunks, and that's best done with checklists, like starting to think through what the exact things are that you do when you are creating a deliverable, not a strategy, but the deliverable that helps, you know, explain that strategy and the execution process around that strategy to your clients. Um, starting by breaking that down into a checklist and then making smaller checklists from those checklists. So those can be, those can be easily handed off um, to specialist resources, which I'll come back to a little bit um, more a little bit later. Um, when it comes to, to finding your team, um, first and foremost, every single time I've built a company at all seven sets, all seven of the companies that I currently own and operate, it's always an operations person. It's the first person you have to find, find somebody that you can pay, 30 to $50 an hour, 20 hours a week, and hand off all of the operations of, of your company on, to them. So you can just focus on strategy and creating uh, you know, world-class deliverables and, and really being the brand and sales advocate for the company. Once you get that operations person, then, then you and that person can focus on um, building your 
processes around specialization. And the reason you want to have that specialization from re- your initial re- contract resources is it allows you to measure and, and refine and report on efficiency. Um, the only way you're going to be able to get efficient team members is if you have an agile style of management. I'm going to give you like a specific trick um, that I use over and over and over again in this deck in just a few minutes. Um, but implementing a simple resource tracking system, um, one that we've just started using internally because uh, we've had we've tried a hundred different systems for time tracking and they've all failed miserably because time track everybody fucking hates time tracking because it's miserable. Um, but you need to have it. It is it is wildly important the level of visibility that it gives you in your performance. Um, we just started using one called Clockify. Um, totally free. They have some paid options, but you don't need them. Uh, the free version it has a uh, Chrome extension. It integrates directly with Google Calendar. Uh, it's it's awesome. Um, and the management reporting level that you get on the admin side is incredible. Um, then, uh, you know, as you're able to manage um, your team in an agile sense, um, to to focus on building more efficiency by specializing your resources to support your processes, you can put more of your time and energy as the strategic. Uh, focus person within your company on again refining your offer. You're not going to get it right the first time. Uh, you have to work on changing the features, the language, the timeline. You know, but, you know sometimes um, one other thing that just anecdotally that we've gotten wrong was we used to take two weeks to get back one of our one of our offer, like to get one of our offers delivered, and we thought that was okay because we were offering it for free. And at that point, there had been so much distance created in our prospects' mind that we had to remind them who we were and why they were talking to us and why we deserved their time in the first place. So cutting that down, like putting the time in to figure out, like, how can we make this offer smaller and more manageable? What other pieces can we automate? What pieces can we offload to more specialized, bite-sized resources so we can get this offer turned around in, in five days or less, uh, drastically increase the, the effectiveness rate of that individual offer? And then lastly, um, and this is, again, this is, I'm, I'm glossing over, you know, probably with the, one of the most important concepts for any agency. And that is if you aren't able to retain your clients, you can't grow. If all you're doing is replacing revenue every one month, three months, six months, 12 months, whenever your contracts are up or God forbid, whenever you're, you know, if you're getting fired, um, based on, you know, the exercising of termination clauses before your contracts are fulfilled, you're constantly having to replace that revenue just to, to meet, make ends meet and just to maintain the same level of revenue. Um, you, there, there's no possibility of you growing. Um, so you know, starting to build systems for leveraging uh, automation um, for client touch. One of my favorite ones is um, taking an email. Um, like if you if you have a newsletter um, that you that you use, uh, it can be simple. It can be plain text, and it can be three links to things you read. Um, and if you have one of your four dollar an hour resources, put that together um, for you on a, you know, a MailChimp list on a, a, using MailChimp where you can have a free account as a new young agency. If you have un- less than 2000 subscribers in there, you only put your clients on there. It'll be free for likely your first 12 months of using it. Um, if you're only using it, if you want to count just for clients, um, you can have them send this out and then hook up an automation where two days later, after that gets sent out, you automatically reply to everybody. Um, either everybody that didn't open it or everybody on the list, the whole effing thing. Um, and in that, you have it uh, just say, uh, you know, hey, first name, uh, just wanted to check in and see how you're doing. How, how's, every, you know, how's everything going? And then, it, you know, uh, let me know. Thanks, Nick. Uh, and that's all it is. And it looks like you personally went in and you forwarded that email back to them and you wrote that, even though you didn't. Um, it looks and feels personal. 99% of people are going to think that you actually took the time to do that. It's just, and that works well in the beginning, um, or that works well when you get to, I should say that works well when you get to, to larger scale from a client perspective. But in the beginning, when you're, if you've got 50 or less, realistically 20, 20 or less clients, you should be talking to every one of your customers every single month. Um, nothing is going to create a higher percentage of retention um, than actually getting on the phone um, with your folks uh, and, and building that relationship and maintaining that report. Uh, so building building your process. I'm going to drill into each of these now. Um, so it, it's it's not this is not a new concept, but it's really hard to make things simple. So the the best way to do that is um, is for each service you provide, each activity that that goes into those services, run through it and do it yourself. Write down each of the steps. Be meticulous. Um, I encourage OCD here. Um, the way to make this painful one time but but very painless going forward um, is by putting the time and energy you would into actually building the service delivering the service with your clients into creating the, these how-to checklists um, and then go through and shoot a screencast um, it'll take you you know anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes probably 
Um, just to, and it's just you talking over what you're doing on the screen. That's all it needs to be. You don't need software. You don't need anything formal uh, to make this happen. This can be very simple and 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 rough and tactical. Um, and you'd be amazed at how well it works. Um, when you as you're building out your first team, um, you won't. You will likely not need a team of probably more than ten to fifteen people, depending on what kind of agency it is, um, to get you to the million dollar mark. Um, I know that sounds crazy, but but that's really about all it takes um, if you manage it right. Um, but you need to make sure that you are mapping that team structure out the right way. Um, so like I said, underneath you, you want to find an operations manager, first and foremost. This is somebody you may want to offer equity to. Um, you know, If you offer them equity, you may be able to get away with paying them slightly less per hour, uh, and that cash flow is going to be critical for you in the beginning. If you're willing to or can afford to pay them higher, a higher wage per hour, maybe hold on to some of that equity. Um, the other person is like likely a somebody who's going to be a client lead. Um, you may not be able to have this person right out of the gate. You may need to be that person as well. Um, but in, in a perfect world, uh, at least in my experiences, you'll you'll have a partner, and so you guys can divide and conquer. You can have somebody who is the client lead, who is the client champion. Uh, they're essentially the client strategist for the company. Um, they're the person who builds the rapport and maintains the relationship with all of your clients, while you are the head of your brand, the face of your brand, and, and running sales. Um, for those top two sort of critical positions, ideally they're local. Um, my one hard rule, at least for myself and my companies, is that they must be in the same time zone. Um, that's why uh, our other office is in Miami. Uh, it doesn't matter that they're you know over a three hour flight away, they're in the same time zone, so we're able to get the same amount of work done at the same time, same business hours. It just makes things a lot easy, easier. Um, the next layer uh, of resources within your agency uh, should be focused on just your deliverables. Um, so again, you're creating the strategy. Your strategy is going to stipulate a deliverable of some kind. Uh, that, that, that's going to be a document, a spreadsheet, um, a video uh, uh, design. Um, I mean, it, it, it really depends on, on what you are and what you're doing. Um, it could be the installation of the, uh, the office furniture that, you, that your agency sells uh, in a high-end custom commercial consulting firm business. I don't, I don't know, but like, but there, there's going to be a, 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 a level where there, you, you need resources that are just focused on the creation and delivery of those deliverables themselves. Um, they're going to have to pay them. Uh, you can pay them less obviously than your operations person and your partner. Um, they're going to require the most training. That's where uh, you can start. That, that's not where you want to start with your uh, process design and documentation. That would be the second level um, because it's, they're, they're going to be more intensive, um, but they should be contractors to start. Um, that lets you uh, not have to worry about the whole additional levels of taxation. Uh, so maintain them as 1099s makes things a lot easier. Um, ideally, you want a mix of these people uh, either at a, an hourly rate focus um, or you're able to negotiate a flat rate ideally. Um, then the very bottom role, uh, these are the people that you're going to be creating your process design and documentation for first. They require the least amount of training. These are usually processes that take that, that in an in individual uh, capacity can take anywhere from 10 minutes to 30 minutes each to complete. This could be something as simple as finding an email address, um, creating invoices, sending out those invoices, um, uh, reconciling uh, payroll. Um, if you get to a point where you've got permissions all set up in something like FreshBooks or, or Harvest, um, but these are going to be the lowest cost per hour and they're essentially just supporting uh, in supporting roles. The more specialization you have, the easier it is to find these people, the less, you'll, the less that you need to pay them um, and the more replaceable that they become, uh, which is all really important because at that level in the organization, you're going to have very high turnover. Um, here is one of my favorite productivity hacks. Um, this was introduced to me in 2009 uh, when I was building Factor Media. Um, and it scales beautifully and it scales entirely through an entire organization. You will get to a point where this won't make sense anymore um, uh, or, or you may not want to do this anymore, um, but this will always make sense uh, to some level of the organization um, because there is no point where, where any company, even at thousands of people, gets too big that this doesn't scale. Um, if your company is, is created in a way where there's in, there is a delineation of, of departments. Um, so I call it a three by three. Uh, and what it is, is every single person that you're paying um, contractor, um, uh, you know, external resource, VA, your partner, whoever it is, every single person you're paying should be creating one of these emails every single day that they're working. It should be sent as the absolute last thing that they do for the day. So you want to instruct them, and this is this is something that it's hard for people to do. It takes a little bit of course correction, but you'll have you'll like you may notice, especially if you you know begin to have folks who come in and work for you, and they're in your office. So you're at a, a, a uh, you rented a small office, or you have. Um, 
uh, co-working space membership, something like that. Um, you may notice that people may, like open up this draft email and they're, they're taking notes on it all day long. And that's wrong. That's not what it's meant to be because um, it should be a sort of a mental reflection um, from that person on what they did for the day. And the three, it's, a, it's called a three by three because it's, it's three topics and each topic has up to three bullets. What those are, oh, for, before I, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, other reason that it's really important, this is the last thing that they do and, and that you should make sure that they understand that they should never take more than five minutes is so you know when they stopped working. Um, you know when they finished for the day. Um, so you have a relative sense of, of when they worked till or when you know when their last hours um, uh, that they're logging for bi as billable hours should should be uh, ending. Um, but they're gonna write the three things they're gonna they're gonna include in the email are gonna be what are their three biggest accomplishments for the day, um, the three most important questions they have or up to the three most important questions they have, and then up to the three biggest roadblocks that are standing in their way um, from accomplishing from any additional accomplishments. Um, these get sent to the person uh, that these report to. So if you've got um, an operations manager, um, everybody who's on the operation, all the resources on the operations side, they're gonna write this um, all to the operations manager and they're gonna all send it to the operations manager. Um, if you've got a partner who is the client lead, uh, anybody who's underneath them on the side, who's underneath them uh, on their side of the business, they're working on deliverables or they're in support roles that they, where they're sending data or information or they're doing formatting for the people who are responsible for doing and delivering the, the deliverables, they all get sent, um, those, the people underneath the deliverable people send these emails to the deliverable people. The deliverable people each aggregate any people that work underneath them that they manage uh, and again, they distill them down into a three by three list. Those go to the client lead. Um, the client lead then takes all of the, the them and distills them down into the three by three list. The operations person distills them down to a three by three list. And then you get one only from the people who report into you. Um, so in terms of a tree structure, this scales all the way out. You'll get to a point where it will become overwhelming because the you know inherent 10, 10 plus employees suddenly getting things distilled down to three things in each area becomes a task in and of itself that ruins the efficiency of this. Um, but up until that point, it, it works beautifully. Um, and it will work all the way to the million dollar revenue mark, I promise. Um, so remi refining your offer and your product. Um, so like I was saying, this is a, a process of continuous creation um, and then getting client feedback. Um, so ideally, you'll have multiple entry points um, for offers for clients to choose from. That's gonna be based on your growth engine. Um, but once you have growth, a growth engine that's sort of up and running, even if it's only dripping in a few new uh, leads that you're not directly sourcing yourself each month, you want to have those uh, growth engine sources mapped directly to a specific offer. Those growth engines themselves should start to push and generate requests for specific offers that you're out there. Um, if you're seeing that you're getting traffic to your, your growth engine components, you're getting clicks through them, but you're not seeing any sort of conversion on the offers, you're not getting any requests for those offers, start first by changing the, the pricing. Start uh, if you're, after changing the pricing, work on changing the messaging. Um, and if it's not the messaging or the pricing, it may simply be something that nobody wants. Um, again, there's a rubric for how to go about creating and, and, and refining your product um, offer um, and how to align those offers with the individual growth engine components. Um, I go into this uh, again for like an entire month uh, with the program. So this is probably the most oversimplified slide in this whole thing. Um, cause there's no way I'm going to teach any of you guys, uh, how to sell <laughs> in, in a few minutes. Um, but, uh, you know, generating leads is simply not enough. Even if you get really good at generating leads, you need a process for selling and for closing. Um, but the bare basics, the bare minimum, the things you need right away out of the gate before you close your first contract is, is, is really need a process for discovery. Um, this is a series of questions to, to make sure that you're getting what's most important to your client, what their biggest pain points are, um, out of them. So you can, you can craft your pitch deck and customize a, a, a pitch deck. Um, high impact pitch deck is only 20% customizable. Um, again, that's a big topic to get into on another day, but for the, the, the pieces of your pitch deck that you're customizing, they should be customized to specifically support the components of the discovery information that you acquired during that discovery call or piece of the process. Um, your pitch, uh, you know, part of selling these days includes transparent pricing. I'm a very big advocate advocate for this. Um, if you don't believe me, go check out the latest post on nickubanks.com. Uh, and then lastly, um, where a lot of uh, consultants uh, and agency owners run into friction or create unnecessary friction is in the contract and SMW process. Uh, it's 2019, people are signing contracts often from their phones. Um, you need a contract process that is uh, an SOW and sometimes potentially an MSA or master services agreement. You need one that it protects you, holds you so uh, completely, you know, um, 
uh, insulates you from liability for changes to Google's algorithm if you're an SEO person, but really in any industry, there needs to be limitations that liability. They need to be created in a way that is spelled out that, that really does protect you from, from shit going horribly wrong and your life being taken away by a lawsuit, um, but also makes uh, the signing and execution of that contract as painless as possible um, for your, your clients. Um, and then lastly, so retaining clients, just to go through this again, um, your clients must always feel important. Um, treat them like they're important. Um, so they feel important uh, until you have, I'm saying again, 50 plus, but I mean, uh, that, that may get, that may seem overwhelming. I would say, you know, up until at least your first 20 clients, speak to every client every month, you personally, the business owner, ask them probing questions. Um, if you don't know what a probing question is, do a little bit of Googling, but you, there's ways to ask questions where you'll get more information than you ask for, all of which will be helpful. Um, but invest in their opinions and in their happiness. Um, your clients are the ones writing you checks. They're keeping you in business. They're growing your business. Um, their happiness is literally your happiness. Um, I'd love to help you. If you want the help, um, you can go to that website right there for more information. Um, the program will be launching in the middle of next month. And so I'd like to open it up for questions. Awesome stuff, buddy. Awesome, yeah. A lot of good stuff there that I think uh, people don't know. I certainly learned the hard way about a lot of this stuff, and <laughs> it's going to save you a lot of money and a lot of time if you uh, at least look into this stuff if you're not, you know, using Nick's uh, training. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of um, couple of points in the, uh, that we've been trying to figure out how to implement, so now we'll just uh, steal Nick's uh, implementation. <laughs> if you're in the United States and you're making decent money and you're still operating as an LLC and not being taxed as an S corporation, you need to go talk to an account. Yeah. 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 Or just, or, or file. It's like a 1042 form, whatever it is. Yeah. Just change your tax. Yeah. Line. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I did. And like, yeah, big, yeah. lots of money. Not, not those dodgy ones that uh, Nick mentioned earlier in his presentation. Also, I mean, <laughs> if you're in, if you're in an agency ones. business and you have clients and you are, and you have more than one car and you're paying for, for one of your two cars with uh, post-tax dollars, or you're paying for your cell phone bill with post-tax dollars, or your home internet and cable bill, or 100% of your rent or mortgage. Like it just goes on and on and on. Like yeah. all these things are pre-tax expenses. And if you're paying for them with post-tax yeah. dollars, you're lighting money on fire. Hey, hey, Nick, I, I know a lot of uh, agency owners at this level have a lot of trouble kind of letting go of control, you know, because they've done everything uh, themselves for so long. Um, what on your team building uh, display that you had up? that first level of uh, your operations manager and, and client lead, um, where are you going to find that that person or, or those people and how long are you evaluating them before you actually pull the trigger and say, that's my guy? So um, I have, um, I'm gonna fall victim to exactly what you're, what you're saying. Um, I'm a perfect example of somebody who was sort of afraid to let go of control. So what I've done is I've, I've always stuck within my network. Um, uh, First and foremost, I'll look within my personal network. Um, but then when my personal network doesn't work, I'll, I'll extend out to my professional network. Usually I'll start locally first. I've also leveraged the YEC um, for this as well for another company. Um, but finding people who have the, I look for traits more than, um, more than experience. A uh, perfect example is the current CFO of FTF right now um, was a uh, recovering account, tax accountant from PwC. Uh, he fucking hated being an accountant, um, but in order to become an account, like a certified public, in order to become a CPA, you need to be meticulous and you need to be ruthless about deadlines. Those are the pre like prerequisites for being an accountant, and those are exactly what I want in a CFO. Um, he's now the CFO. He was at, before he was our CFO. He was our COO. Before he was our CFO, our COO. He was our director of operations, and before that, he was a, my man operations manager. Uh, he was yeah. the first employee that I ever hired back when IFTF was IFTF in twenty you know in twenty fifteen when I had an, just enough money to pay somebody. Um, the year that he got brought on, so like IFTF, the company did 80 grand in revenue in 2014. Um, I brought him on in the beginning of 2015 and we did 400 grand. Again, this was like all side hustle. And then, uh, that's 14, 15, 2016, we did 800 grand. And then, uh, 2017, um, was the first year we broke a million. Uh, I think we did like 1.6 and that's like, it was the end of 2017 that I actually left uh traffic safety store i was like well shit like 
this million yeah, dollar, yeah. you know, a million dollar business just sitting over here. I should probably could do something about it. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so you're a fan of promoting internally and having them work their way up the ranks a little bit too, rather than mm -hmm. uh, an outside mm -hmm. hire. Because I agree with that too, because you build the trust up over time, and you know that this guy knows everything down the, the down the chain as far as operationally. What's um, fascinating is very few of the folks that work here now at the agency now that were outside hires are in the role that they got hired for. Right. A lot of times they come in and they're like, ooh, I know I got hired to do this, but I see this thing over here that I think I'd, I would be much better at. Can I go do that instead? Um, and I'm a really big fan of uh, the uh, top grading principle around redeployment. So if somebody like if somebody's not happy in getting fulfillment out of a job and they they they're they're essentially they're they're creating a B player jacket right. themselves, but they have a potential to be redeployed into a new role and become an A player, um, I'm gonna take that opportunity. Uh, how, how do you handle that transition if, if you know there's not a spot open for them in a different department or if they're gonna leave a void from you know yep. where they're leaving from? We're literally doing this right now. So um one of the people the person who came in to run our client strategy team. Um, came in and was like, "Hey, like I, I know that like we're we're looking to hire, make an HR hire. I would actually really like to do that. I'd like to be that role." So we laid it out. It's like, "Well, like you're not worth losing. So let's put a plan in place, like and say, like, all right, over six months, you're going to transition out of your current role. Like, so we're, like we know that we're going to have to hire somebody to replace you, but we're not going to have to go find a new person to fill this open role that we had for an right. HR person." So we're going to transition you slowly while you, you bring on and train your replacement. Cool. Um, and I think we're about four months, three or four months into it, and it's going really well so far. So that plan kind of takes the hecticness out of that that change and allows the person to straddle both roles until there's a clear cut replacement, and also until you know that they're the right fit for the new role. Yeah, and the plan like involves like peeling off bits of their like their old job responsibility as as those get sort of absorbed by the their replacement like each month. So like literally each week, like a little bit more comes off and it just nice, sort of nice. whittles away until it's all gone. Yeah, I, I'm doing a lot of this over at Word Agent, so I've definitely skipped a lot of these steps. So I'm spending 2019 uh, retroactively implementing them uh, <laughs> to make sure that our internal infrastructure is in the right place for future growth. But uh, it's awesome that you're doing this, man. I, I think you're gonna have a lot of good uh, adoption of, of seven seven figure agency, right? That's that's the name of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's a corny oh. name. I couldn't I couldn't think of uh, I, I couldn't think it was the first name that popped into my head. And then when I got that that two letter domain, I was like, well, I guess this is it now. There you go, yeah. man. It's awesome. Couple of, couple of couple of quick questions um, that are on topic before any time for the off topic ones. Um, Andrew Ansley asks, uh, Nick, are you one of those employers that evaluates uh, Myers-Briggs type personality tests prior to hiring or does that not matter to you? I promote higher people and I can't seem to really figure out who would be a good fit, struggling to make this process area easier and curious if you have any tips for hiring remotely. Um, we have not, so our remote employee base is very small. Um, it's like a handful of total people. Um, and our remote employees are extremely specialized. Like, like we have, we have one guy that I think only does three things. Like he does our GA audit, our GSC and GTM audits. And he does, uh, like more advanced, uh, um, analytics implementations for like e-commerce tracking and like goal and event tracking and stuff like that. But like, that's all he does. Um, just cause I feel like one thing that I have learned, um, like trial by fire is that, uh, and this, this seems to hold up the more entrepreneurs I talk to is your team either needs to be completely remote or not at all. Um, cause sort of the half and half 70, 30, 60, 40 models just don't really seem to hold up. Um, at least nobody's figured out, I think how to make it work yet myself included. Um, on the Myers Briggs front, um, I love the idea behind it. Um, and initially for my first handful of employees, I did go through the top grading process. Um, for each of them, which I still believe in. I've just, I've gotten, I'll be honest, I've gotten like, I don't know, sort of sloppy on that front where I, I don't pay, I don't go through like the six hour interview process of top grading like we used to. Um, we hire almost entirely based on culture fit. Um, we've hired a few people before. Um, so like there's, of everybody we've hired, I think we've only got, I think there's maybe eight or 10 people that have been hired over the past five years of the company's existence that aren't here anymore. And every time we've lost somebody, um, whether we had to let them go or they left on their own accord to take, you know, to pursue another opportunity, um, it it was always that like they were not 
the right fit for the culture. And it was always me or the, the department head or the person who was making the decision on that hire sort of went against some of the red flags that were there at first. Um, and it, it always ends up coming out to bite us back, bite us in the ass in the end. So um, we definitely don't hire based on a traditional model. Um, I also don't like success for this agency for me is a finite number of clients. And in order to support that finite number of clients, there's going to be, I'm only going to need a finite number of resources. Um, like I don't like the, I'm not on the like grow to infinity train. Um, I'm on the like get to this, like this specific client count, start a waiting list, engineer for efficiency and, and maximize profit margins and like live a fucking kick ass life where you're still making a few million dollars a year. Let's do, uh, let's do the last question here. Um, there is one in the chat um, from the Hobster, and he's just asked if you would answer it in text. He was going to email, but if you've got a minute to answer on YouTube, um, that would be cool. Um, is it not in the group chat? I don't see it. It's, it's in the group chat, just uh, up a little in, in on the YouTube chat from the Hobster. There's one more on topic one, though, for the, uh, for the live. Uh, Program answer. Um, how does the program work? Um, assuming it's remote, um, what level of agency owners will you be working with, and just what sort of general requirements are you looking for for people to work with you on the program? Oh, cool. Um, so the uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a rolling twelve month program. It'll launch. It'll open March eighteenth, close March twentieth. The first month is it, it ends in March. It's a sprint, um, just to sort of prep for everything. Um, so month two will kick off April first. Um, the eight level of agency owners is I think the I don't think it's going to be a great fit for anybody who's not making, who's not already at like ten thousand dollars a month um, in revenue. Whether you're a freelancer or a consultant, or you're you know, you're calling you're calling your business an agency, whatever that means to you, um, I think it's going to be hard um, for anybody who's not at least at that level to take advantage of putting some of the systems in place. Um, but anywhere between ten grand a month and eighty grand a month, um, I think there's there's significant value to be had. Um, I even have talked to a handful of guys who are already doing, you know, over a million dollars a year with their agency, but they, they're struggling with some of the specific types of things that I cover, um, in there. So, um, yeah, there's, there's an email coming this week with, to the, to the list. If you're on the waiting list, there's an email coming with exactly what to expect and what it looks like. So, um, I'm hoping to answer a bunch more of these questions, um, outside of just the vague landing page that's up there now. Cool. Awesome. I, think that's, uh, I think that's uh, and that's everything um, except that one offline question. So thank you, Nick. Awesome, guys. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Well, thanks for coming on. Two years in a row. A lot of good stuff there, and uh, um, we haven't had any donations in an hour, everybody. So if you're new, I'll post the link quick to the donation page. Uh, whatever you can certainly helps. Uh, in a couple minutes here, we're going to be stopping the feed for just a minute and restart Hangouts, and then we'll be back. So don't go anywhere. Uh, yeah. Oh, Nick hopped off. Well, thanks again, Nick. I meant to say bye. <laughs> <laughs> he probably thought that uh, was you saying bye. You gave him a good send off. <laughs> um, should I guess now's a good time to stop this, huh? Yeah, I think you just click not live and then click live again, and it'll make a new file on it. I just stop the broadcast and start it again. Yeah, so I, yeah. I, I planned an event for another one. I guess we can try it. Well, it should cut the event off when you turn it off, and then start a new six hours when you turn it back on, right? Or, or not? Yeah, but when I, when I launched the Hangout. You know, you have a unique ID that's tied to everything that's set up on YouTube. Um, oh, so we should hang up then, you think? I, I, I don't want to risk it, so. Okay, okay. I'd yeah, hate to have six hours not get recorded. So. Um, yeah, 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 okay. Everybody leave quick. <laughs>